me on, okay? Here we are, right? All right, so I did that right. Am I right? All right, so thank you, Bob. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Hunt, president of the Board of Trustees for the Riverside Unified School District on my fellow trustees' behalf and that of Dr. Hansen and the 4,000 RUSD employees, uh, I welcome you to the Board of Education's meeting of March the 4th, 2001. Uh, just quickly add that this is the first meeting since March 13th, 2020 that the board has been able to meet together and instead of virtually, and we're very excited about that. And I do want to thank the staff for pulling this together in such a quick time, and we have these new electronic uh, uh, devices to help us, but we're learning them, so uh, have some patience with us. But we're very excited to be back together, and it's, it's the goal, of course, of all of us uh, in this community. If you'd like to view this meeting in Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found at our website, www.riversideunified, one word, riversideunified.org. We are broadcasting in closed captions today, so those watching the meeting live stream can follow live transcription of the closed captioning through your link on YouTube. The meeting will be held in person, again, as I said, in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, the former Palm Elementary, and is open to the public. Uh, the state high guidelines for safety and, and health will be enforced at the meeting, as you can see from evidence of the mask we're wearing still, and to ensure proper, appropriate social distancing. There will be limited seating in the boardroom and face coverings are required. As always, this meeting will be broadcast live and uh, on our USD board meetings YouTube channel. Easy to go in there and just, just uh, search for it. If you are here in person and would like to speak on an item not on the agenda uh, during our public comment period, or an item on the agenda, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you. Um, the board also encourages members of the public out there watching to join and participate in the meeting either uh, electronically by entering the Zoom meeting, which is on that link we talked about, and those details are on the agenda and can be found on the district website. Your voice and your insights and concern are important to this, this community, to this, this uh, district, to this Board of Trustees, and we encourage you. And now I'd like to introduce Assistant Superintendent Sergio San Martin to provide this message in Spanish. Assistant Superintendent. Thank you, President Hunt. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta de Educación el 4 de marzo del 2021. Si gustan ver esta reunión en español, Sigan el enlace incluido dentro del orden del día, el cual puede encontrar en nuestro sitio de línea en www.riversideunified.org. Hoy también estamos transmitiendo con subtítulos para quienes están viendo la transmisión en vivo. Pueden seguir los subtítulos en vivo por medio del enlace de YouTube. Esta reunión se llevará a cabo en persona en la sala de la Junta de Educación en la Escuela de Adultos de Riverside, que estará abierta al público. La Junta respetará las órdenes de la salud y seguridad del Estado durante la, la reunión. Para mantener la distancia social apropiada, habrá asientos limitados en la sala de la Junta de Educación. El cubrebocas será requerido también. Y como siempre, la reunión de la Junta de Educación será transmitida en vivo en el canal de YouTube como indicado. Le recomendamos a los miembros del público que se una a la reunión persona o electrónicamente. Los miembros del público pueden encontrar la información para cómo presentar sus comentarios públicos en el orden del día de la Junta de Educación. Su voz y sus perspectivas son importantes. Muchas gracias. Back to you, Sam. Thank you. Closed session agenda is before you. Members of the public will have the opportunity to address the Board of Education on closed session matters and prior to their, our adjournment to closed session. Uh, Mr. Christian Frosto uh, handles all this for us. So Mr. Frosto, I'm gonna give it over to you. Are there any requests submitted so far, public comment on closed session items? Be muted, Ms. Frosto, at least I can't hear you. 
So I'll try again. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to provide public comment on one of the items listed on the agenda for closed session only, please enter the queue now by using the raise hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for closed session items listed on the agenda. And Mr. Hunt, Board President Hunt, we'll give that just a moment. Give it a couple of minutes, Ms. Rossi. Okay. There are, there are five items on the agenda tonight. There do not appear to be any uh, requests for public comment on a closed session item this evening. Also then at this time, the, the board will adjourn to a closed session and be returning at 5.30. Thank you, please join us then. USD family. My name is Ken Mueller and I am the Director of Maintenance Operations and Transportation for the Riverside Unified School District. Safety continues to be the number one factor in all the decisions that we make and has resulted in many of the changes you will see in this video. As students enter their classroom, they will see all desks supplied with shields and facing in the same direction. Each room has been supplied with disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer. Antimicrobial soap is also stationed at every sink. Correspondent signage has been put in place promoting healthy hygiene habits. Our custodial teams will use electrostatic technology for disinfecting. This will increase efficiency and will be performed daily by our night custodial staff. Cleaning and disinfecting will include all desks and shields. Emphasis will be given on sanitizing high touch areas multiple times a day. Staff and student restrooms will be cleaned daily by our night custodial crews per CDC guidelines. Restrooms will also be cleaned and spot checked for stock and for cleanliness throughout the day by our daytime custodians. COVID related signage has been installed on each campus to remind people of proper hygiene practices as well as safety measures that have been put in place such as wearing of masks, paths of travel, and social distancing. All HVAC units in our USD are regularly serviced. This ensures proper operation and optimum ventilation. All of our HVAC systems start up at least 30 minutes prior to any occupants entering the room. This ensures that the entire space is well ventilated. Our cafeteria staff has been engaged in training covering federal, state, and local health regulations and procedures. All of our meals are pre-packaged for safety. Staff preparation stations have been reorganized to meet social distancing requirements. Meal service areas have been updated with floor markers, signage, and have been reorganized to encourage physical distancing through increased spacing, small groups, and limited mixing between groups when possible. School sites have staggered meal times to allow for cleaning between meal services and to serve students in smaller groups. We have implemented a new touchless point of sale system to assist us with maintaining social distancing and touchless service. The team at Central Kitchen has been delivering disposable aprons, masks, face shields, and gloves to all schools. Thank you for entrusting us to feed your children. To maximize social distancing, we will only have one bus in the loading and unloading zone at a time. When the bus arrives, it will come to a stop no closer than 12 feet from the nearest student. We have a regimented disinfection program for the bus interior with a heightened focus on high touch area wipe down, adhering to all CDC guidelines. All bus riders will be required to wear face coverings during their entire bus journey. Loading the bus from back to front in a zigzag pattern clearly outlined with easy to read signage throughout the bus. And subsequently unloading front to back will minimize any cross paths travel and close contact by students. Bus windows will also be down as much as possible to increase circulation within the bus. 
I know we have all made every effort to keep our community safe. Ms. Brown deserves to be the Teacher of the Year because of the positive impact that she has um, on our students and our staff and everyone across the board. If there's one thing Kisa has that stands out above all the many other qualities that we know a good teacher should have or must have are her bonds and relationships that she forms with her students when they walk on campus. She builds on a strong rapport with learners as she teaches a rigorous academics and builds on positive character traits. Students who leave University Heights Middle School go on to high school and go on to college. They always come back to uni and they come and see Miss Brown. Every year we have a number of students who come through the front office because they need to talk to Miss Brown about where they're going to college or they need to talk to her about what they accomplished when they're in college. She's been a huge part of so many students' journeys um, influencing them in the most positive manner possible. Growing up with older siblings, I already knew so many of the teachers that they liked, they didn't like, and one of them in particular was Miss Brown. And she was such a big impact on everybody, and I really wanted her, so I joined Abbott, which was her profession. And she, I finally got to have her eighth grade and it was such an amazing experience. Ms. Brown has done a lot for me. She's given me great opportunities and has, has given me more confidence. She's taught me to keep my goals in check, to stay focused, and that right now, you have to look at the bigger picture. Ms. Brown has shown me the importance of college and how it will affect the rest of my life. She has taught me that these years of my life are very important to where I will end up in life and what kind of college I will be accepted to. Ms. Brown has uh, taught both my children the importance of note taking and organizational skills to prepare them for college. Ms. Brown also helped refine my leadership skills and helped me grow as a person. She is kind, she is caring, she helps students who are struggling academically, and she encourages students to invest in themselves and their future by cultivating a work ethic and pride necessary to be successful. She taught me how to be more organized and how to deal with life beyond high school. She has taught me how to keep going for my goals and never to give up. Ms. Brown always taught me to finish my assignments, help me with all my grades and made sure everything was done. She's really helped me um, keep up my grades. She built excellent relationships with parents. She's an outstanding educator, both on our campus and throughout the district. 13 years, we've seen uh, a lot of kids go through her, her school, through her classes, and they've been awesome. She's helped them in many ways. Over the past 14 years, Ms. Brown has taught three of my children, two which have graduated from college now. Mrs. Brown has been a great mentor to all four of my children. Mrs. Brown is more than a teacher. She's part of our family. Ms. Brown has not only been a teacher from my past, but a mentor and a role model. She has guided me through school and life. She has been there for me through a numerous amount of events, and I can only be grateful for her staying in my life. The kids would bring stuff home with, with them to help us to become better parents. And uh, Ms. Brown has always been awesome. You can't take that away from her. When I think of Kisa, I think of the words again of Rita Pearson when she said, Every kid deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, and one who understands the power of connection and insists they become the best they can possibly be. She's always trying to make her students better people, which is what she's done for me. She likes to make sure someone's okay, and she knows her students very well. She gets to know her students, so when something's wrong, she knows what's up. When I first started, it was readily apparent that all of the staff and students on campus um, felt like she was a positive leader. She had excellent relationships. She says being an individual that is always willing to give support and words of encouragement to uplift myself and others. She's a very positive person. Whenever a kid is sad in our class, she, you know, she's always joking around to try and, you know, help us. She has always been there for them, giving them extra help when they need it. Um, 
lifting their spirits. She's always there to, you know, keep you up whenever you're down. She cares about uh, a lot of other people and she goes out of her way to be a better person and to make other people better people. You can see the value of the relationships that she has nurtured as a teacher in the faces, in the reflects, in the faces of those students who come back and visit her. Ms. Brown deserves this award because she's a very caring and determined teacher and she cares about the well-being of the students. Ms. Brown deserves this award because she has done so much for students and helped them in so many ways. Kisa Brown's commitment to her students and her relationships that she builds even outside of the classroom are deserving of that. I want to say thank you, Ms. Brown, for all you've done for my children and for all the children of University Heights Middle School. I would thank her for getting me in check in eighth grade so I can grow and be a better person in the future. Congratulations, Kisa. Job well done. Congratulations, Kisa. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown, for being named RUSD's Middle School Teacher of the Year. From the Molina family to Ms. Brown. Congratulations. We love you. There's no one I think is more deserving. We always stay in touch, and it's been such an amazing thing to keep such a great teacher, a great mentor around because we all need one like her. Hello, RUSD students. Hola a todos. We have missed you so much. We are excited with the possibility of reopening our schools to in-person instruction. Estamos muy contentos con la posibilidad de abrir nuestras escuelas para instrucción en persona. We're so happy to have you back and we cannot wait to see you. Here at Riverside Unified School District. Lo hemos extrañado y esperamos darle la bienvenido pronto. In this video, you're going to see some very important things that you need to know before you return to campus. Please pay close attention to these helpful safety tips. Por favor de poner atención a estas sugerencias de seguridad para el bienestar de todos. Coming to school is going to look a little different. What we mean is that you and your parents need to have your mask on when you come to our campuses. Depending on your grade level, you are going to have different drop-offs and pick-up areas. Your times will be staggered as well throughout each one of those gates. Please take a look at the schedules provided by your individual schools. When you arrive here in the morning, we'll have the noon supervisors here ready to help you out of your cars. And they're going to direct you to some spaces for you to stand and wait until we're ready to take your temperature. For all our bus riders, our bus drivers are so excited to have you back. We want to show you exactly what to expect when we reopen our schools for in-person. As you'll see, only one bus will arrive in the loading zone at a time. All students and the driver will be required to wear face coverings during the entire ride. To make sure students are spread out, they will be loaded onto the bus from the back to the front, and we will unload from the front to the back. You will also notice that all the windows will be open as much as possible. Kinder and preschool have new drop-off procedures. We'll be meeting you at the gate. A staff member will be taking the student's temperature. We'll be handing you some sanitizer for your hands, and a staff member will be walking you directly to our classroom. Entering our campus, you're going to see a fancy little machine standing there to welcome you. What that is, is a thermo scanner. It takes your temperature quick and easy so you can get right to class. Every campus will have their own path of travel. Be sure to follow the signs and floor markers to ensure proper social distancing. We want to assure all of our families that in our classrooms, all students are going to be maintaining six feet of distance. As you can see, our classrooms look a little different. 
you'll see that our desks are spaced apart and there are protective shields on them. Also, our teachers have a protective shield with them. That way we can keep everyone safe and socially distanced. I would like to tell my students that are in the dual language immersion program that things are going to be just a little different this year. Instead of having two teachers, one for Spanish and one for English, you're going to have one teacher that is doing both Spanish and English. Uh, quiero decir a las familias de nuestro programa de doble inmersión que va a ser un cambio este año en que en vez de tener dos maestros, uno para inglés y uno para español, van a tener la misma maestra para inglés y español. Hey kiddos, as you get prepared for your smart start to come back on campus, remember we're not sharing supplies. So if something happens and you need a sharpened pencil and you don't have an extra, just raise your hand and your teacher will make sure you get one. We've prepared for everyone to come back to school and be safe and healthy. From our special needs students to our preschoolers all the way up to our sixth graders, we have plans in place to keep all of our students safe. Washing your hands for 20 seconds is another way we can keep safe and healthy at school. One way to do that is you can say your ABCs from beginning to end. All of the staff here at school have exactly what you need to be safe throughout your day. So if you break your mask, just look for an adult and they'll be able to help you get a replacement. Lunches are gonna look different depending on what school you're at. You might be eating inside, you might be eating outside, but you're gonna be at six feet of distance, still spending time with your friends and being safe. We have different facilities and that's okay. Look at what we're doing here. We're gonna use our awesome quad and we're going to do lunch on the quad every day that it's not a rainy day. But guess what? We know when it's time to eat, you can't eat through your mask and we don't expect you to lift it through every bite. So your teachers are gonna teach you the proper way to take those off and then you're gonna put them right next to you so that as soon as you're done eating and you've wiped your face, you can go ahead and put your mask back on. Grab and go meals will be available on and off campus. Please make sure to check the schedule. We know how much you enjoy playing at recess time with basketballs and tether balls and swings and we're not gonna be able to do that right now. But we will have some fun games for you to do like Simon says and dancing and other activities. We really want to thank our families for all the support you have offered during this time of distance learning. Queremos agradecer a nuestras familias por todo su apoyo durante este, este tiempo de aprendizaje de distancia. Parents, we want you to know that we have missed you too and we value the support that you bring to our campus. However, during this time to make sure that we do have that safe start, we are still not having volunteers on campus. So no campus visitations, but not to worry. If you need anything, just give us a call. When students are exiting campus, they will be dismissed in small groups of students by class to ensure that students are socially distanced and safe as they exit campus. When you are picking up your students, we please ask of you to stay in the designated areas so we can maintain safe distance and we will make sure that your students safely arrive to where you are. Cuando los estamos pidiendo, por favor, que cuando están esperando a sus hijos que se queden en el área designada para que podamos mantener la seguridad de sus hijos y vamos a asegurar que lleguen a, con ustedes con seguridad. Many schools have before and after school programs. All those programs will continue. However, they will remain virtual for the remaining of phase two and phase three. We recognize that our special day class students have unique learning needs in regards to the way they access curriculum and instruction and the needs they have for socialization. We hope that modifications to their schedule will meet the needs of all of our families in the RUSD community. For additional details, please visit our webpage at riversideunified.org. We want to thank everyone for watching and making sure that we have a safe, smart start. Until we're back together again, stay safe and healthy, and we can't wait to see you back at school soon. We can't wait to have you guys on campus. We are looking forward to seeing all your faces. Hasta que podemos ver a todos ustedes otra vez, que se queden seguros y saludables. Remember, wash your hands and wear your mask, and we will keep you safe. RUSD Families, Nutrition Services invites you to apply for the 2020-2021 meal program. All families are encouraged to apply beginning July 1st, 2020.
your student qualified for the meal program last school year, your household will need to reapply. If you did not qualify last school year and circumstances have changed, we encourage you to apply before the new school year resumes. If you qualify for the meal program, you may also qualify for programs such as utility assistance, SAT fee waivers, and college application fee waivers. For more information, visit riversideunified.org and don't forget to reapply or apply beginning July 1st, 2020. Principal Reller deserves this award because he is beyond dedicated to the success of his students. He's the most dedicated, positive person that I've ever met. You can just talk to him, he's really kind. His two favorite lines are, kindness is the key to cool, and have a gatorific day. Please remember, kindness is the key to cool. All of our announcements that he sends, phone calls home, it always ends with, have a Gatorific day. And have a Gatorific day. He's awesome. Gary Reller is so beloved by his family and community. In fact, there was a quote I heard about him being the rock of our school. He is the leader of our school, and it shows that every single day when he's out in front of our school greeting parents. He takes time out of his day to go and greet his kids, not only as they walk in the gates in the morning, but throughout the day as he circulates during lunch and in the classrooms. He greets everybody with a smile. He has the best intentions. He wants the best for our students, and I think that is the purest form of a leader. Gary Reller also practices shared leadership in which he involves his teachers and his staff in decision making on his campus and he authentically focuses on the things that are necessary for success for his kids. He supports leaders on campus and I feel empowered to have a say or a voice to help shape policy and procedures. Gary Reller is so positive. He's very polished and he's just very focused on what he's doing and doing it well. So pretty much a role model for all of us. It is a lot of fun working with Mr. Reller. His sense of humor, his work ethic, his energy, it inspires me to work harder too. I've had a great experience being the PTA president. He's been super welcoming and always supportive of everything we want to do to help the kids. Mr. Reller is the most engaging principal I've ever met, not only from leading his staff, but with interacting with the kids because he truly cares. The kids and the parents in the community find him readily available. He's a fun principal and he's a principal that you can go to and talk to anytime. He is always very active in what the students are doing. He's always out here at lunch talking to the students. He always has a smile on his face. He's always so happy and positive. Just really fun. He's just a great person. Gary is one of those principals that is always there. You'll see him at almost every single activity, whether it be History Day, Science Olympiad, basketball tournaments, volleyball tournaments, track and field meets. Whenever there's events that students are taking part of, such as um, sports games and different events for like dance and color guard, he's always there to support us. And no matter what time of day it is, he'll be there on the spot. He always wants to be involved in everything. He's just so supportive to us. I can't think of anyone else who deserves it more. I can tell you he's done a lot for this school. If you notice, our front of our school has been a major improvement. He spearheaded that so that we can have this entrance and the mural behind us so that our school would stand out a little more. Congratulations, Mr. Well. You're an awesome principal. Thank you for taking part in being a part of our school life. Congratulations, Mr. Reller. 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 I'm really proud of you. Congratulations, Mr. Reller. Congratulations, Mr. Reller. Congratulations, Gary. Well deserved.
Tonight I will be playing Edna Turnblad in the musical Hairspray for the RUSD Honors Musical. When I heard about Hairspray auditions, I found out when it was right away. My teacher made an announcement that Hairspray had auditioned and I really wanted to be a part of it. It's a really good musical and it talks about change in a different era coming up and I really think that's cool for younger people and older people to watch. The Honors Musical pulls students from all across our district, from all of our high schools. They're coming here to perform live at the Fox in this very amazing professional historic venue. I play Tracy in Hairspray. I play Siwi J. Stubbs. He's like a cool cat. I'm playing a Mission Street kid, and her name is Lorraine. I play the flute. I'm doing sound. I'm the uh, percussionist. I am Shelly, the nicest kid in town. I am a sound technician. What I do is costumes. I do costumes. I play keyboard in the pit. I'm house right spot. We have students on all aspects of production. They are on stage. They are backstage working with Live Nation stage crew. They are down in the pit working with professional musicians. Playing alongside these professionals and having the chance to talk to them and get a little bit of input from them has been really beneficial in regards to showing them what a career would look like. I have experience doing tech, but this is just way different because this is like an, an actual theater. It's not a school theater. I'm actually pursuing directing instead of acting as a career. And this production has really showed me like the more intricate parts of putting on a, a stage show. It's an amazing opportunity to work with all the schools and all the kids and to have master workshops with people that already starred on Broadway that could help us with dancing and singing and acting and it's, it's a great way to open the door. I'm Michelle Grotness and I'm the director of Hairspray. The students that we find in the Honors Musical come from all of the high schools around the Riverside Unified School District. Students will uh, meet with us two to three times a week for about four months and here we are and we're ready to go. It's a really music heavy show so I've taught all of the vocal music to the cast, all of the leads, all of the ensemble. We're excited to have students from every high school this year. It's very important that we host these district-wide opportunities for kids. One of the things that we don't do enough of is involve kids from many different genres of art across the district cooperating together and having fun and this is one way we can do that. It was awesome to have that experience with the kids from all the different schools. Getting together, it's really amazing. It's like a family. To me, it is. Working with, uh, with different people from other schools is like really cool. Like It creates basically like a family. You get to meet these new students that have more experience than you, less experience. You get to help them out, and they help you out. It's the best. We're hearing that some of the students in past years are now going to each other's shows at their other schools, they're keeping in touch. Um, so this really intensive experience is something that, that perhaps is launching a lifetime of, of a network for these students. This is my first time doing this. I've been a tech at my school for a few years and I figured I might need a change and I might want to try something in a facility that's more different than the one I'm more used to. It's so fun. It's like a new experience because this theater is completely different from like high school theaters. It's great. We have room to move <laughs> for one. It's just much more professional and it feels more like real. It's the Fox Theater. I mean, there's more of everything. We have to work with the cast, all the tech, all the sound, and the music is totally different. The music pit for the Hairspray Orchestra consists of a mixture of professionals that we brought in from the surrounding communities, as well as a mix of high school students. We wound up with an exciting group of 16 students this year on saxophones, on trumpets, on percussion, drum set, everything in between, keyboards, and it's a fun, exciting mix of students overall. It's been an honor to play with professionals, and they've taught me a lot. I've never played with professionals. This is my first year doing this, and I tend to do it all next year and the year after that. This is our third time ever producing this event. I started three years ago with Such Sweet Sorrow, and last year is the chorus line, and here I am for the third time around. This is my second year, and I hope to do it for two more years. This is my second year doing the Honors Musical. First year, I was an actor, second, I'm tech. This is my first time doing the Honors Musical. This is my second time doing the Honors Musical. This is my third and final RUSD Honors Musical. 
I've been here since the beginning, and this is my last one, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. This is all to put together a show for what we're anticipating to be over 3,000 people. We have 1,500 middle and high school students coming to see the production for the matinee, and then in the evening we'll have a community show for another sold-out house. We're working very closely with Live Nation, which is a nationwide theater management company that really helps to foster our students in the technical components. Uh, we're partnering with the Riverside Fox Foundation, who has helped to support some of our programs. We're working with colleges and universities who are coming to see some of our best students in action and talk to them about future opportunities as they move forward and pursue the arts as a career or even in college. The practice you'll get is what's going to make you good. I would recommend doing the show, both as an actor and as a tech, you get to meet new people, new directors, and stuff like that. And students as well. Please, come audition. It's one of the funnest things I've done, for theater especially. You should really go through with it, because it's amazing getting an opportunity to do it at this theater. The minute the curtain opens, you hear the people clapping, you just automatically get this chill, you get teary-eyed. It's. It's a great experience, it's a great feeling. It is totally worth it. I will definitely want to do it again. It's really fun. <laughs>my children's first language is English. Um, they actually learned Spanish in the DLI program, and then I just supported everything at home once they were involved in the program. And mommy was in Spanish class. Did you help mommy? Sí, pues mi mamá preguntó que que están en español clase y ellos y ella necesita ayudar con una clase y ellos ayudó y ellos sacaron y ellos sacaron cien por ciento. They have the same curriculum as the other students do. In the primary grades, it's heavy in the Spanish, and they get English language development in English. In the upper grades, they have a 50-50 model, half of the day in Spanish and the other half in English. What do you like to learn in school? Me gusta aprend aprender matemáticas. ¿Qué te gusta aprender en la escuela? M my favorite subject of school is writing because I can learn things that are bilingual. Los padres pueden solicitar una aplicación para el programa de inmersión de lenguaje dual tan pronto como en Jardín de Niños o hasta primer grado. At Fremont Elementary School, our DLI program is expanding. It's currently in kindergarten, first, and second grade, and next year it will move on to third. Longfellow is proud to offer dual language immersion. We're also a STEM school. We emphasize hands-on STEM activities for a portion of the day. We begin in kindergarten, which means that our students can apply the year before, which would be a preschool or transitional kindergarten age, to enter our school to begin in kindergarten. Jefferson Elementary School offers a dual language immersion program, kindergarten through fifth grade, and next year we will add sixth grade. They participate in all regular school activities, field trips, special events, assemblies, just like everyone else. Spanish is interwoven into everything that we do here at Mountain View. Our assemblies are in both languages. Our morning announcements are in both languages. Our students are speaking in both languages. ¿Cuántos años tienen? I have, I am seven years old. ¿Cuántos años tienes? Yo tengo siete años. How old are you? I'm seven years old. And where do you use what you've learned? Um, mi mamá preguntó dónde yo están um, hablando español. Están ayudando a mi abuela y mi abuelo se habló en español. ¿Qué te gusta aprender en la escuela? I like learning English because I like 
pantalla, solicite la aplicación en riversideunified.org. ¿Usted le quiere decir algo a sus maestros? I would like to say that thanks for teaching me how to be bilingual. Would you like to thank your teacher? Sí. Gracias por enseñarme. Gracias por enseñarme español. ¿Qué quieres decir a tu maestra? I want to say, Ms. Arana and Ms. Sierra, thank you to teaching me in English and Spanish. Is there anyone you'd like to thank? La pregunta era si hay alguien que quieres decir gracias. Yo quiero decir gracias a todas mis maestras de DLA. Yo quiero decir gracias a mis papás por ponerme en el programa de DLA. Is there anything you want to tell your teacher? Gracias por enseñarme. Gracias por enseñarme español. ¿Qué quieres decirle a tu maestra? I would, uh, I would like to say to my teacher that thank you for teaching me in third grade. Yo quiero decir a mi maestra, yo gracias por haciendo español a yo. And I want to say thank you to my mom for taking me to a Spanish class, like learn more Spanish. Yo quiero decir gracias a mi mamá porque traje a, a ella a español clase y ayudar a, a que yo se pueda ayudar a ella. Yay! Good job, baby girl. Yeah, thank you to class. USD students. Welcome our USD students. Greetings students and families. Hi students. We miss you guys and can't wait to see you back on campus. It's been very strange on campus here over the last few months. It's the strangest feeling to be here without you. It's just not the same without our students at schools and our USD is excited to welcome them back. It's been a long time since we shared the campus together. One of the beauties of the secondary campus is the energy, enthusiasm and pride that you bring with you every day. This year within RUSD is going to be a transformative year, and this has been a learning process for all of us. We're working hard to make sure that we make things safe and ready to go once we get the green light to go ahead. When you come back to your schools, you'll notice that things look different. A lot of effort has gone into preparing so that when you get here, the school is a safe and healthy place for you to learn and meet up with friends again. When you arrive to school, you'll pass through a thermal scanner to detect your temperature. The thermal camera will register your heat to see that it's not over 100.4 degrees. These thermal scanners give us the ability to scan the temperatures of large groups of people at a time. Screenings will take place indoors to ensure accuracy and promote social distancing. It's a singular area that you know you can funnel the students through. Any other entrances will have handheld thermal scanners. Masks are required to be worn by everyone while you're on the property and not just within the gates. If you do not have a face mask, we will be more than happy to provide one to you. Arrival on campus will look slightly different for all of us. If you happen to drive to school, you'll still be able to park in a student parking lot. When you're back on campus, you may wonder, how are we going to stay socially distanced if we're all back at the same time? Our USD has planned for that, and we come back to school in a hybrid model. As a result of the program choices provided, when we return to in-person instruction, we'll have roughly a quarter of our students on campus. We realize each campus is different, so each site will identify their paths of travel to best meet the needs of their campus community. Listen to what your administrators and teachers say about path of travel at your particular school. This is going to help us to maintain that six feet of distance between one another, both on the pathways to class and to lunch and beyond, as well as in the classroom. Following the pathways is going to be very important to keep us all socially distanced, safe and healthy. Each of our classrooms are gonna be a little bit different, but there are gonna be some consistencies across the board. First, you'll notice that the desks are going to be separated between four and six feet apart, and they'll be facing the front of the classroom. Every student workspace will be outfitted with a plastic shield that will separate you from your classmates. Those sneeze guards will allow for safe interactions between students and staff. The teacher will also have a plexiglass shield that he or she can use while moving about the classroom. 
It's going to be very important that you use the hand sanitizer that is there for you. And at the beginning and end of each period, you will use some wipes to clean your plexiglass shield. That ensures that it is a safe space for you when you arrive, and it's a safe space for those students who come after you. We recognize lunch is one of your favorite times of the day. However, you'll still need to social distance with your friends. Lunches will be served every day and they will be grab and go style. You can eat anywhere outdoors, such as our picnic tables, in the grass. And we do ask that you maintain your social distance of six feet between you and your peers during lunch. For those of you who will be learning in the virtual program, our grab and go lunch schedule for you to pick up meals on campus will remain the same throughout the year, but please be sure to check our schedules to ensure of any changes that we may have when we start in person. Please be sure that you're bringing your water bottle with you to campus. We're used to drinking fountains. However, now we'll be using water filling stations. At every school, you'll see that there are water bottle filling stations. Within these stations, students are able to have cold water that's filtered. When we come back to school, the restrooms will continue to be cleaned and sanitized every evening to ensure that they meet our standards for cleanliness and safety for our students. As a general rule of thumb, we ask that we stagger the number of students inside restrooms at any one time. So there should only be the same number of students inside of restrooms as there are sinks. To ensure that we adhere to the California Department of Education guidelines for performing arts, many of our secondary schools will have our performing arts classes outdoors. Managements will actually have covers on the ends of the instruments in order to keep the breath vapors from spreading out beyond the instrument. And choir students will be separated enough safely so that their air vapors do not become a problem. If due to weather concerns, class cannot be held outside, the choir and band classes will have some alternative curriculum to cover in order to make sure that they have a proper education in that particular endeavor. Performance and showcase opportunities will continue to be virtual and pre-recorded until the time comes when we are able to gather in person. PE will look different as well. Although you may not dress out, your teachers will still be providing engaging lessons aligned to the state standards. Our school board allowed for conditioning for certain athletic teams and performing arts groups. During conditioning, athletes come onto campus wearing their masks and bringing their own water. They check in at a table to get their temperature checked and ensure that they're not ill coming onto campus. They then move on to the practice field, at which time they are able to remove their masks and to begin conditioning at a high level. As we get updates from the California Department of Health, we will be sure to inform students and families of the different guidelines that we have for youth sports and competition. This information will be shared via our district website, social media, and other school site platforms. Because each school site is different, dismissal procedures may not look the same from site to site. However, all students will be expected to continue to use the one-way path of travel to leave their schools at the end of each day. Your school site will communicate with parents about the dismissal procedures at the school. Keep up the great work. Continue to persevere. We know that these last few months have been a challenge for both teachers and for students in distance learning. It's been a difficult road, and we understand that. It's something we've just never done before, and many are thinking that this is a really, really down time for us. But we also believe that this can be our finest hour in demonstrating how we can overcome these obstacles. And teachers themselves are learning so many new things that they're going to carry forward. We're so proud of each and every one of you, and we cannot wait to see you soon. We are all in this together. The staff has worked to make sure that our classes are clean, that they're safe for all our students to return. And I am extremely thankful to see their faces walk through the halls. I'm excited to see their smile through their eyes. We are excited to see our teachers go back in their classroom. We are so proud of each and every one of you, and we know that the best is yet to come. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of our community. I know, yeah, don't forget to wear your mask. Hi, I'm Crystal Hart from the Department of Innovation and Learner Engagement, and today we're gonna look at some free online tutoring opportunities for students fifth through 12th grade. Do you ever feel like you get stuck at home and you don't know who to ask? 
Wish you had someone to help you? RUSD now offers Paper, a free online tutoring service for all 5th through 12th grade students. Paper gives you access to live tutors via chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You have unlimited sessions and their tutors can help you with any academic subject. First, you'll need to log in to your Clever portal and then click on the Paper tutoring icon. Paper is super easy to use. You will open up to a dashboard, click on the content area you would like help with, or you can type in your question. Paper even has an essay review feature. Once you're connected with a tutor, a live person will start a chat with you. The first time that you use Paper, you will need to sign a code of conduct. Your code of conduct includes classroom etiquette, essay review guidelines, internet safety, and academic integrity. After you cite the code of conduct, you will begin a chat with your tutor. Tutors do not give answers, but they will help guide you to the correct answer. You will be able to use a whiteboard to show your work and have a conversation with the tutor. Once you've solved your first question, they are there to help you if you need help with another question. If you'd like more information about Paper, the free online tutoring resource, visit bit.ly forward slash RUSD FAM20. That's bit.ly forward slash RUSD FAM20 for more details and more videos to help you. Welcome to University Heights Middle School. I'm Katie Grimble. I'm the principal here at uni. Today I'm going to share five things I love about our school. First is the variety of clubs and activities that we have. While we have traditional sports like soccer, volleyball, basketball, we also have a variety of things that are unique to us. Things like sister STEM interest program, Club 3.0, Girl Talk, Mariachi, Ballet Folklorico, Robotics, Makerspace, 3D printing, Woodshop, and coding as well. The next thing I love about our school is that we're a personalized learning school. What that means is that each student has a learner profile where they identify their strengths and the ways that they learn best as a student. The teachers then use this to help them develop personalized learning plans, which are used to tailor instruction and activities to the needs of each student as an individual. Next up is our family resource room. We have a dedicated space for parent trainings, activities to come in and utilize computers, printers, or just assistance for parents needing to apply for programs or access community resources. One of the things unique to our family resource room is that we have a food pantry and community closet available for families in need as well. Another thing I love about uni is our AVID school-wide program. We have a school-wide focus on college and career readiness, including high academic expectations in all core classes. Students are reading and writing no matter the subject area. And finally, we have a comprehensive social-emotional learning program, including restorative practices along with social skills instruction in all classes to make sure that our students are successful not only academically, but also socially. School culture is really important to me. So if the teachers are happy, the students are happy. If the students are happy, they have positive relationships with people on campus, then they're more likely to learn and put forth the effort that we need for them to be successful academically. At University Heights, we believe that all decisions should put students first. We prioritize culture and community in all of our decision making. What that means to us is that anytime we are making decisions, deciding between two options, prioritizing programs, spending money, those are the things that we use to decide what we're going to do. So as a staff, we come together and say which one of these furthers our core values, and that's how we decide what we're going to do next. The goal of our school is to provide each student with challenging and rigorous curriculum appropriate to their academic level. We believe every child can achieve academic success. With parents and teachers working together toward the same goal, every child will succeed. Through teamwork, open communication, and a dedication to continuous improvement, we can make this school a place where students delight and enjoy learning.
Riverside Unified partners with over 20 local farmers. They deliver fresh produce to our central kitchen, and we deliver it to all of our sites daily. Here at the Central Kitchen, we get a nice variety of produce that we get in. We have multiple farmers that we use within Riverside. We use not just oranges, but whatever fruits or produce that is available during season. So we also get lettuce, grapes, fresh strawberries from farmers that are local, melons, peaches, nectarines. I work for our USD as the food hub coordinator. I work with local farmers and helping them decide what to grow for the district and what varieties of produce and when we need it. We introduced the Farm to School program in 2005 to try to teach our students lifelong healthy eating habits. It is easy and quick to apply online by visiting riversideunified.org and apply online through the meal program application. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my journey into science. Imagine a scientist. What does a scientist look like to you? A lab coat, yes. Glassware, mixing chemicals in a lab, yes. And the big glasses, sometimes sort of falling or taped. But how many of you guys maybe thought of something different? Like a field biologist like Jane Goodall? or the two astronauts who just did the first ever female spacewalk, Christina Cook and Jessica Muir. But how many of you guys actually pictured yourselves? Not everyone usually does, and this is something that educators often are trying to sort out, is why, why don't we picture ourselves in this role? Why don't we ever see ourselves as a scientist? When you ask a male or a female your interest in STEM after graduation, half of the guys are gonna say, yeah, STEM is something I'm really interested in, but a fraction of women are actually joining in that same interest. And this sort of then trickles down into the actual workforce. When I actually graduated high school, I was one of those statistics. I did not identify as a scientist. I had no interest in science. I just didn't know what to do with a science degree. Inspire Her Mind is a conference that gets girls thinking about actually careers in science. They get to see some of the cool applications of science. They get to see women working in these areas. We know there's not as many women in the STEM workforce as there are men. So we're really trying to be proactive and be able to get girls involved and really show them that this is an opportunity for them. I did not expect this. I'm gonna be honest, I first came here because I wanted to get extra credit, and then it turned out to be more than that. I wasn't really expecting all of these like different interactive activities that we got to do. The one where you have to like inspect the cells of the plants and everything. We saw like stomata and how it's on the back of the leaf, and we just learned more of like what we're learning in biology, so it's cool to see it just like not in the classroom. We learned from like people who were specialized in their field, so they were like really passionate about it, and then so we got to learn just like straight from them, and it was really fun. I don't really like science that much, but my friend convinced me, and it's nothing like what I expected. It's way funner. It's like a broad spectrum of different things that you can do. In one of the activities, we kind of learned about how different types of lines can make dresses appear differently. We had to draw like lines on the dresses to make appearances either look longer or shorter or thinner or thicker. When I went to college, you have to take classes that are beyond your major, right? And so I took one that was global environmental problems. And in that class, I was just blown away and I realized this is where I want to make a difference. I now have a lab that gets to look at these environmental issues and I absolutely love my job. It took a long time to figure out that this is what I wanted, but I am so happy where I'm at. I really liked it because it was more focused on us because we were able to individually analyze what we wanted, not what anybody else wanted us to learn. We took a personality quiz and that quiz was honestly like my favorite part. We were able to find out like the specific um, topics that we were interested in. Mine was advisor because I want to be in the medical field, I want to be an RN. I got a maker and I thought that was really cool because ever since I was little I would always love working with my hands and I still do. This is a really great opportunity for girls to get that hands-on experience and to open their eyes. I decided to come on a whim. I thought we were just gonna get like hour-long lectures or, and everything, but instead we got to have like these fun experiences. I expected to see men in lab coats. I also expected people to just tell about their jobs and then how we could help our city, but instead I learned about how those small careers add up to um, help the, the whole world. 
We're really focusing on getting girls excited and engaged in STEM fields and potential STEM careers. My expectations when we came here was that we would go into a lecture hall, they would lecture us, and then we would leave. I didn't expect it to be as hands-on and as innovative and interactive as it was, and I think that that's the reason why I enjoyed it as much as I did. It's part of their everyday lives, and helping them understand that and appreciate that is, is also part of this endeavor. My favorite thing was seeing the batteries and the wire thing move around. Oh, I saw that amazing little robot. Did you guys? Yeah. yeah. The way they were coded had them follow a pathway, and in that pathway were certain color codes, and those color codes would dictate what the robot did. It was so little, and it was so cute, <laughs> and the fact that I could literally just drop like a bunch of colors and it would make the robot do different things. It was really, really like impressive and I really like that. I'm a wildlife biologist by training. I get to work with animals, habitats and the environment. We learned about the California condor and we found causes of death among condors and why they almost went extinct. And how due to like conservation by people that are in the STEM field, they were able to multiply and now they're uh, growing species again. The program provides an opportunity for our students, young ladies, to look into STEM as a possibility and also leadership. There is definitely a gap out in the workforce, so what are we doing? We're bringing our girls in and we're helping build the confidence around those two specific areas. I'm actually really looking forward to coming back and seeing what other activities that they have for us. I heard them say that leadership was going to be the focus of the second conference. I'm definitely really interested in that and I think it's really important for women to realize that leadership is an important skill to have. And it's definitely something that's really related to STEM because STEM is leading the field in so many industries nowadays. I'm also looking forward to coming back and learning more about the small careers that can build up to help everybody around. I think it's really important to expose them to the vast array of careers and how a scientific background can help you succeed at anything you choose to do. We have very special things to be distributed to all of our students today. In your sixth period, we will be distributing LA Clippers backpacks courtesy of Kawhi Leonard and the LA Clippers. There are backpacks for every student. Happy holidays from the Clippers and Kawhi Leonard. Martin Luther King High School is very, very appreciative of the Clippers organization and for Kawhi Leonard himself for providing the backpacks for all of our students, not only here at campus, but also throughout the district, considering the fact that he did play for us for a couple years. And it's a great gesture and very much shows his quality of character and commitment to our area. really like to thank Mr. Leonard. He's done an incredibly generous thing and helped the holidays of all of our RUSD students by giving them backpacks. It's an incredibly kind and thoughtful gesture on his part and we are so grateful. bringing up your community that you grew up in, handing everybody out to the backpack, because you know, some people, some people really can't afford to get backpacks and such. I know that from experience, and like having a free backpack definitely means a lot. Thank you. We just wanted to say thank you so much to Kawhi. These backpacks are awesome. We love them. Hey man, thanks for the free backpacks. Thank, thank you, Kawhi. Kawhi. Thank you, Kawhi. I'm glad you went to our school. It makes me really happy to know you walk the same hallways. Thank you, Kawhi. Bro, we got the new heat, bro. There you go. We love you, Kawhi. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Los Angeles Clippers Foundation and two-time NBA world champion Kawhi Leonard. We are especially proud of Mr. Kawhi Leonard for being a graduate of King High School at Riverside Unified School District. He is an inspiration to students throughout the world. 
and we know that his contributions and his character of what he does to help communities off the court is what makes him truly an inspiration for all of us. So thank you again, Kawhi Leonard and the Los Angeles Clippers Foundation. them with a nutritious meal, authentic foods that they will enjoy all year long. I'm hoping all the effort that we put into our meals are enjoyed by the students. Can I get the orange chicken? Chicken sandwich. Teriyaki rice. Chicken chow mein. Can I get some nachos? Nachos. I'm gonna get everything on them. Cheeseburger, chicken sandwich, spicy chicken sandwich, pizza. Beanie cheese burrito. I had tacos today with um, beans. We get fresh produce delivered twice a week that we use on our salads and our tacos. We have a vegetarian wrap with no meat. We serve tortas and burritos, chicken chili verde. We have our barbecue served every day with hamburgers, hot dogs, and crispy chicken sandwiches. You can apply for the meal program online by visiting riversideunified.org. So apply as soon as possible. Here at the Central Kitchen, we get a nice variety of produce that we get in from like uh, fruits and vegetables. We have some oranges behind us that we are wedging. We use not just oranges, but whatever fruits or produce that is available during season. Some people ask when we package the food. So our fresh fruits and vegetables are packaged on the same day, every day. They're never done multiple days in the past, but they're done the day of. Our sandwiches are also done on the same day as well. So when we are doing the sandwiches on the after school program, we make those sandwiches fresh day of. I'm at one of our local farms. We purchase citrus, lettuce, tomatoes, pepper, avocado, pears, apples, cucumbers, and many, many more. In addition to purchasing from our farmers, we brought some activities for the kids to connect the cafeteria with our farm. We have gardening activities, classes in planting to encourage our students to eat nutritious meals. My name is Matt Cash and I have the privilege of serving our community as the principal at Fremont Elementary School. Here are five things that I absolutely love about Fremont. The first thing I love is our dual language immersion program, or DLI for short. All of Fremont's DLI teachers have a bilingual credential. In our DLI classrooms, students are taught in both English and in Spanish. And by the end of their sixth grade year, our students have the opportunity to grow into students that are biliterate bilingual and bicultural. Next, Fremont is a no excuses university school, or NEU for short. That means that we adhere to the belief that every single child deserves the opportunity to be educated in a way that prepares them for college and career. Fremont is also an avid elementary school. That means that our teachers and staff are trained in the most up-to-date techniques to keep our students engaged in content and in the classroom. NEU and AVID go hand in hand. NEU provides us the systems we need to prepare our kids for college and career, and AVID provides us the strategies, real time, on the ground, that we use inside the classroom to accomplish that. If you ever have the opportunity to walk around Fremont Elementary School, you will see a college presence here on campus. We have banners, pennants, and flags from a variety of colleges around the country hanging in our hallways and in our library. That means that from day one of a student attending our school, we instill the belief that if they want to, they can go to college and pursue the career that they were made for. Fremont Elementary has an amazing show choir. Our show choir is so dynamic that they've been invited to perform at places like the Festival of Lights, at City Hall for the Mayor and City Council, and even here in our community for local holiday shows. If you ever have a chance to catch one of their shows, you should. Here at Fremont, we are all about partnerships. That includes partnerships with local universities like UCR, the University of California, Riverside. They have a program for volunteers called AmeriCorps, where they come onto campus and college students tutor 
our elementary students in math, language arts, and other subject areas. Each of these college students work with individuals each day to ensure that our students not only know that they can do their best, but they're also given a mentor that they can aspire to be. Lastly, we pride ourselves on meaningful interventions. That means that data management is a high priority. We know who our kids are, we know their strengths and their challenges, and we design instruction that meets those needs and takes them from where they are to where they need to be in order to be successful. One of our core values is student engagement. We create opportunities for our students to meet their current needs and challenge them to become their best. Fremont Elementary School is unique. Opened in 1917, Fremont is one of the most storied elementary schools here in our city. Our school has been in the La Placida community for more than 100 years. That means we serve generation after generation of learners who have come through our doors. Fremont provides art classes, community service projects, band, show choir, social and emotional services, parent training, community activities, after school enrichment, and so much more. We're excited for the programs we bring to the La Placida community, and we're happy to serve our families. So with that we say, welcome to Fremont. We are encouraging all households to apply and reapply for the meal program by visiting riversideunified.org. I think the food here is an upgrade. Teriyaki chicken, chow mein, rice, and it's always good food. It's good. It's actually real food. They cook it fresh. We come in every morning and we bake our cookies fresh. It's always really good. The food here is a huge step up. I think it's good. It's pretty good. My favorite thing to eat is a cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. I had a burger. It was really good. I got pizza. Our pizzas are baked in the oven. We have pepperoni and cheese. We get fresh produce delivered twice a week. Strawberries, peaches, apples, oranges, plums, pears. My favorite lunch is the deli specials where they have the chicken tenders. I like the lasagna. You just got a lot of things here. You can apply for the meal program online by visiting riversideunified.org. So apply as soon as possible. I'm Jody Gonzalez, the principal at John W. North High School, and I'd like to introduce you to Julian Taylor, John W. North Senior. Hi, Julian. Hello, Hello. Um, I'm Julian Taylor. I am a current senior. Um, my first year being in leadership and vice president of BSU, and I will be attending Cal State Dominguez for film and media. So I have three questions for you, Julian, today. So we'll go ahead and get started. The first question I have for you is, what is a positive experience you can share about distance learning? Um, I feel that throughout this time, distance learning has been in the midst of um, many obstacles and disadvantages for the jobs, lives, and roles for all teachers, staff, students, and parents. Um, I made sure to include students because I feel that students have just as much of a job as teachers do for us to all grow collectively and to continue to advance um, our schooling and our approach to make our community better. Despite many ideas and stereotypes of um, my peers and the ideal teenager to be very antisocial and reserved to themselves, I think I've noticed a trend of a lot of my community and peers of younger people continuing to grow and defy that barrier almost by always being open to meeting new people, introducing themselves to friends so they feel they're welcomed by all and to help grow with one another in one happy environment as well as with the teachers who are also there to help kids learn. So I think that in us as students and teachers um, truly valuing the idea of being able to go to school every day somewhere else other than home to enjoy the outside world. Right? What is the biggest challenge in distance learning, Julian? Um, so for this, I made sure I have a clear thought. Um, 
it did take a lot of time to think about men answering and what I truly want to say. And I feel that the biggest challenges of distance learning is being forced to understand that life isn't fair. I don't think it's hard to see that many students in a vast majority of circumstances have declined in their academic enthusiasm, involvement, as well as their appreciation for learning in different ways. Many times I've heard the term, you got to get over it in order to help motivate students to get their work done at a steadily pace we almost barely could maintain during in-person school. During in-person school, sorry. With that, I do not have a problem with, with teachers setting high standards for students that you know and feel are very well capable of doing the work. However, I challenge the concept and expectation of completing mounds of assignments to gain no physical understanding of what is being taught, to lack the physical interactions and involvement used to help people understand what they're learning, and even the effort it takes to continue to listen to a lesson that you have no understanding of. In regards to teachers, I also very well feel that they feel obligated to give these mounds of assignments to their students because they feel that is the only way they'll be able to get more practice to their students and to make sure that they meet their own standard. I've acknowledged the fact that this life is not currently normal and should be approached in a way that is more beneficial for us all, that limits the stress and responsibility to check off everything on your to-do list. Um, and just to debrief that in a way, I just feel that a lot of us feel that we have to force ourselves to do something. I feel like that idea of being forced to do something limits our want. I feel like that's a decrease in the enthusiasm I was referring to, leading to a, a, a communication gap between the teachers and staff, which leads to a decline in a lot of things that we will do and not be able to do throughout school. So. And what are you hopeful about for the future? What I'm hopeful for is just simply a help, a happier and healthier life. Um, I desire to, for me and my peers, to continue to grow emotionally, mentally, and physically, to help maintain a consistent routine with themselves, to feel content with the contributions they make to society and life as a whole. In regards to distance learning, I also hope there's a way for teachers and staff to be understood by one another collectively and are able to work together to get the best out of one another, to not only increase the graduating rate, but the enthusiasm to actually pursue something after receiving a diploma as well. Learning is only as important as you let it be. Not being able to be understood is a big limit on your learning ability. I am hopeful more people are able to reflect and establish a sense of individual out, individuality and to contribute what they have always wanted and not to contribute what they feel that they only have to. Thank you, Julian. You're welcome. And I would like to say thank you to Ms. Porter and Ms. Tamayo and to Ms. Gonzalez for letting me share. Um, that means a lot. Thank you. Hello, this is Dale Moore, principal of the Riverside STEM Academy. And I'm here today with one of our students, Sitali uh, Sanchez. And she has been actually with the Riverside STEM Academy for, since the sixth grade. So she's been with us for a lot of years. She's a 10th grader this year. And so she spent three years in our middle school and she's now in her second year of the Riverside STEM High School. And so she agreed to join me for, for a few questions. And so we can see how, how she's doing and it's kind of representative of other students also. So Seat Lolly, what is uh, a positive experience that you can share about distance learning? Um, the thing that's positive about distance learning is um, being able to not be as distracted while doing classes and um, basically being comfortable in my home environment right now. Um, my desk area is comfortable. I'm in my room most of the time. So I feel like I'm very comfortable and it helps me to learn better um, than say sometimes at school when it can get noisy or loud. Yeah, that is good. It is comfortable to be at home also. So a follow up question to that. So in this, in this virtual environment, what is the biggest challenge that you've had in distance learning? Um, one of the biggest challenges that I've had in distance learning is being around my family all the time. Um, 
it can get kind of distracting. I have a younger sister. Sometimes she'll come in and ask me for help, and I'm doing homework or an assignment. And I ha we got a puppy for Christmas too, and so um, she's getting trained and all that. And it's, it can be distracting sometimes, definitely. Yeah, with the other family members around, we got a, pu a puppy recently also. And when I'm at home, it is very distracting to have a puppy and other other things around. So. So we'll be looking forward to getting back and and uh, with with those distractions not being there. So what are your what are you hopeful about for the future? Um, one thing I'm hopeful for is going back to school maybe two to three um, days a week maybe next year if case rates get low enough and doing so safely so that our case rates can go even lower. We can possibly go back to school without any restrictions and all five days a week. Yeah, be good as be good to see your friends again and yeah. to be back in that environment again. And we're all looking forward, all the, all the staff at Riverside STEM Academy has been very quiet around here without us being around. So we're looking forward to all of you getting back too. So see Lolly, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me and talk a little bit. I'm glad you're doing so well. And again, we look forward to seeing you and your friends back here, hopefully real soon. Thank you. I'm the principal at Raincross, and this um, I have a, a student with that we're interviewing today, Melissa Huerta. Hi, Melissa. You ready Hi, for some me. questions? Yes, I am. All right. Here's our first question. What is a positive experience you can share about distance learning? A positive experience that I can share is that the teachers are really helpful and they help me with whatever I need and they show a lot of effort into their work. And they just want the best for us. Show it. So that was my dog. Oops. Do you have an example? An example would be that one day I was struggling with where to go, like for an app that I had to log on to and then Miss Lamy was helping me and she took the time out of her day to help me. Cool. All right, my second question is, what is the biggest challenge in distance learning that you've had to face? Um, I think the biggest challenge that I had to face was probably not being able to interact with people in person and not, have, not getting to have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. Yeah, so are you looking forward to having face-to-face -face conversations? Yes. Or are you person. used to this now? I am used to it, but I would like for things to go back to in-person because I feel like it just helped me a lot better with school. Great. All right. My third question is, what are you hopeful about for the future? Um, I hope that, like I said, that we could go back to in-person, and I also hope that I could get into college, a good college, and just be successful in life. And yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure, uh, my, my feeling is that you're probably gonna be successful in life. And I know that you've also actually done a huge amount of work since, uh, since we've been in COVID. Can yeah. you say something about how you managed to get all that work done since we started in COVID? Yeah, um, well, a lot of help is my mom because my mom is really on me about my grades. So uh -huh. she like motivates me, like she'll do whatever she has to do in order for me to like pass, like either like she'll like bribe me or she'll take stuff away if I like, she's really on me and strict about my grades. So what'd she take away? My phone. <laughs> it's always my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so is she uh, excited about you going to college also? Yeah, she is. Is she telling you what to do? No, no, she doesn't tell me what to do, but like, it's like up to me, but she just wants me to get done what I have to do and what I have to like do to be successful and stuff. So um, one other question. So I know that uh, that your first year in school, in high school was kind of difficult, but I know that you've made up a huge amount yes. um, and you may even be graduating early um are you thinking yeah. about that yeah i am thinking about it i was trying to 
like that's why I'm trying to like get all of my ninth grade because ninth grade it was like kind of bad for me so I have to like make up all of my classes and that's one thing that I regret because I wasn't on it myself all right Melissa I thank you for talking with us so much uh you have one more semester and uh yeah. and I hope that we're able to get you back into school if um I mean, I don't want to see anybody face to face. I like just <laughs> being as far away from, except for you heard my dog. I love my dog. But uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for talking with me. And um, I'll let you get back to your homework and I'll let you get back to your mom bugging you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, bye. Have a good day. All right. You know, just as we all right, uh, colleagues, Brent and uh, Micah and Angela, if if you want me to call on you for a question, hit your microphone and your picture comes up. Here. T minus. Richard Prince really controls these meetings. You guys realize that? Oh, he, he told me to wait until the, the when the whole thing comes open. There we go. Good afternoon. Welcome, neighbors and RUSD Nation. I'm Tom Hunt president of the RUSD Board of Education on behalf of my colleagues and my fellow trustees and that of Superintendent Dr. David Hansen and the 4,000 plus RUSD employees involved and dedicated in this, this district, I welcome you to the Board of Education meeting of March 4th, 2021. I will say we are meeting in person and, and uh, this is the first time the board has met in, uh, in person in 356 days, our last meeting together the COVID restrictions was March 13th, 2020, where probably the most difficult vote this Board of Education has taken in the 140 years of this district to close the schools because of COVID occurred. Now we've made full circle and we're coming back and exciting news tonight. If you'd like to view this meeting in our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, www.riversideunified.org www.riversideunified.org. We are broadcasting closed captions today, so those watching the meeting live stream, you can follow live transcription on the closed captioning through our YouTube 
channel link. The meeting will be held in person, as I mentioned, very exciting, here in the boardroom at the uh, Old Palm School, now the Riverside Adult School, and it's open to the public. State health, the in, uh, state health and safety guidelines will be enforced in the meeting, as you can see by my Ramona mask here. To ensure appropriate social distancing, colleagues are spread out, uh, there will be limited seating in the boardroom, uh, and there's a limited overflow meeting room to television monitors uh, available in the main room, plus capacity, as always, uh, dictates that. The meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meeting YouTube channel, as noted. If you are here in person and would like to speak on an item not on the agenda during public comment or an item on the agenda, uh, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you. Your Board of Education encourages members of the public to join and participate in the meeting either in person or electronically by entering the Zoom meeting and those de details are on the agenda and can be found on the district website. Your voice, insights, your concerns, your suggestions are important and valued by your Board of Trustees and Dr. Hanson. All right, moving forward now, exciting. The month of uh, March has many wonderful things in it, and uh, part of it is we, are, we will be acknowledging and celebrating uh, Women's History Month, which honors and celebrates the struggles and achievements of the American women through the history of the United States. It's only been 101 years since women in this country were allowed to vote, women's suffrage. And since then, we've had the, ER, the Equal Rights Amendment that is still waiting approval by the states and Congress. Now finally have a vice president that's a woman. Women are, are achieving and moving up. We have a woman soon as our district superintendent. But uh, there's still much to do, and as a father of daughters, I will be celebrating this month, and I welcome you to do as well. We also celebrate the birthday of a great American leader by his example, Cesar Chavez. We honor this Mexican-American hero, farm worker, labor leader, social justice activist, and, and uh, example for all of us interested in advancing our country on his birthday, March 31st. The work of Cesar Chavez, what he stood for, is embodied in the work we do here at RUSD. Last year, the Board of Education, under Dr. Hansen's leadership, and that of Dr. Jackie Perez, acted upon our district value of equity by creating the division and Assistant Superintendent for equity, accessibility, and community engagement. We recognize our urgency to act and put forth for our purpose, guarantee that every student in your district is provided with what they individually require to learn, to succeed, to fulfill their academic, social, and life achievement. We are committed to our community, your community, to our neighbors, our students, and the RUSD family. So we do this work together. And Cesar Chavez didn't do the work alone either. We also recognize the work and contributions of Ms. Dolores Horta, an activist who worked side by side with him and co-founded the United Farm Workers, another great accomplishment by a, a woman dedicated to making a difference in this country. At 90 years old, Dolores Huerta continues to advocate for those who are less fortunate. May I just take a side, I'm wearing my pin tonight that I was received uh, as being a part of and a small part of the, uh, the memorial statue in downtown Riverside at University of Maine, established in 2013, honoring Cesar Chavez. And if you'll go look at it, I'll be encouraged. Behind it are six, behind his, his figure are six farm workers that are in the field working. And uh, it reminds you can't do it alone, we're all in this together. He was leading, but he was leading by example. So, um, he's an American hero, as I said, when members of the American United Farm Workers were frustrated with the lack of progress, to, and, and there was talks about violence and, and uh, demonstrations. By example, Cesar Chavez chose to go on hunger strikes to draw attention to the stagnation of the movement and show his fellow members that violence to bring about change is not the answer. Thankfully, the press began to cover this and the peaceful protests that he exampled in these hunger strikes began to get national news and even attract important people throughout and influential people, including 
U.S. Senator Bobby Kennedy. And when his inclusion came in, it brought national attention to the United Farm Workers and whose children, many of you attend our schools. Um, and uh, it's an exciting time. We're very proud. We're going to hear a little bit more about uh, Mr. Chavez and his, his influence and our, his legacy to our district and here in a little bit. But at this time, I'd also like to welcome our newest uh, student board member, Micah Daly White from Ramona High School, who is beginning his term with us tonight, and he will be serving on the board uh, with us through May. Last year, Micah obtained a 4.0 GPA as a result of completing three AP courses along with two dual enrollment. That means he was also at a college courses. As a RUSD student board member, I know that Mike is looking forward to collaborating with us and bringing the voice of the RUSD student to this dais. Welcome, Mike. And Mike, I, I, I'm, I, your mom and dad would be upset if I didn't. I understand you have a, you've chosen your, your next school, your college. That is indeed correct, Mr. Hunt. And before I say anything else, uh, good evening. To the esteemed members of the board, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here and entrusting me with this position. I hope to be a strong voice for the students. I am looking forward to the rest of this meeting tonight, and that is correct. I have been accepted and admitted into Kalamazoo College, located in Michigan. In Michigan, and Kalamazoo. What, what's their mascot? Kalamazoo? Their mascot is the Hornets. Oh, it's all right. Well, and I mentioned to you it snows in Michigan. You know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm now going to report on closed session action the board just came out of. I'd like to report that based on resolution number, excuse me just one moment, resolution number 2020 backslash 21-54, that the Board of Education approved at their December 15th meeting, all criteria was met, and the board is pleased to confirm final implementation of the Supplemental Early Retirement Plan, or known as the SERP, for its employees. Uh, the board also took action in closed session with a new unanimous vote to appoint uh, Pam Lazan as our interim chief business officer. And I'd like to ask Dr. David Hansen to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Lazan for us. And I'll go back to the SERP after that. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, please. Thank you, President Hunt, and good evening, members of the board. I would like to uh, introduce sitting to my left uh, Mrs. Pam Lazan. She comes to Riverside Unified School District with over 35 years of experience. 27 of those years spent in the business office as chief business officer for the Yerupa Unified School District. Since 2010, uh, Pam has served as a district consultant providing fiscal and accounting assistance to districts in the areas of budget development, monitoring and reporting uh, their accounting, department, the purchasing, the payroll, the benefits, the facilities, maintenance and transportation, and on and on. And her expertise also includes preparing financial reports for submissions to the school board, as well as the county school board and the state of officers. We're very grateful to have Pam join us. As our interim, you know that Mrs. Mace Kish this week started as the new superintendent in Beaumont. And so Pam will serve as our interim chief business officer for the months of March, April, May, and June. So welcome to RUSD, Pam. At the microphone, I'll let you do it. Well, I'd just like to thank um, everyone for asking me to come, and I am excited to be here and support the district for the next four months. Thank you so much. We're very pleased to have you. Just back to the SERP a moment, just to announce the early retirement plan is, is done to uh, oh offset any projected budget deficits that might come from lack of funding from the state. We know that's going to be challenging. Um, and But with it, we, we do have a lot of wonderful people, veterans, teachers, and, and administrators, and uh, classified workers that will be riding off in the sunset of retirement. But I'm confident in those that follow to fill their, uh, their places. Uh, there are too many great names that are to be mentioned, but I'm going to take privilege just to mention one to talk about the kind of folks we have. Sherry Ober's a teacher at Liberty. I believe it's first grade. Is that right? Thank you. And uh, I've attended her classrooms many times. She, like many, many, most of all of our teachers, is a dedicated individual to 
profession of teaching and advancing young people's minds. I, uh, I've always been impressed with Cherry and I miss her. And she's been someone not afraid to talk to a board member and, and politely set them in the right direction. But we wish all of you that are taking the SERP to a, a wonderful retirement and, and uh, hopefully fond memories of your time here at Riverside Unified School District. So now I'd like to welcome um, or announce the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag to be provided by video and led by a sixth grade student, uh, Juan Nia Rillis from William Howard Taft Elementary School. And we'll be led in the Pledge of Allegiance and after that, board member Micah Daly White will share some information about this young lady. You ready for that, that video, Mr. Prince? And we'll all stand in advance for, on her behalf. Hi, my name is Janina Barillas and I'm going to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would you let us know more about this young lady? Gladly. Giannina Barillas is an exemplary sixth grade student who her teachers are thrilled to have in class every day. She is extremely well organized, which helps her in all academic areas. When working with others, she shows excellent leadership skills and listens very well to others. Yanina also shows human kindness, compassion to others, and is always willing to compromise. Yanina has an incredible voice to her writing. Her personality and creativity comes out very easily in short, constructive responses, as well as in longer essays. Taft Elementary School is happy for the opportunity to recognize Giannina's excellence in this manner. Cannot wait to see what life has in store for her. I, uh, we appreciate and also commend your uh, letting us come into your home tonight and, and, uh, and leading us in this and continue your, your, your performance and, and work as a student dedicated. Well, speaking of performances, you know, there seems to be a belief out there that education is not moving forward, but I want to show you it is, particularly in the arts. Tonight's student performance uh, for the arts uh, will be provided by video and will feature the students of Ramona High School's Mariachi uh, in celebration of the Cesar Chavez Day under the direction of, of Mr. Brian Gallagher. Mr. Gallagher, take it away. This program for two years, it started three years ago, it's called Mariachi de Ignacia de Ramona. We started with absolutely nothing and slowly we got, we got the money, we got the funding, we got the support and we were able to evolve and make it into what it is today. I'm in the marching band, the concert band, the jazz band, the orchestra and the mariachi. I'm holding a guitarone. It's uh, basically the base of the mariachi band. Students need a reason to go to school every day and, and in the crazy world that we live in, this helps balance them out and it helps them find that creative side. It helps them think about you know, being something bigger than, than what they are, and it just gives them that outlet to perform, create, and, and entertain. It's helped me through a lot, grow in confidence, uh, connect with a bunch of people. I really like music and my mariachi program because it's helped me de-stress through the years, and I just like entertaining a lot of people.
you for being involved. Thank you for honoring this great American. Now we're going to move on to our high school student reports. Usually, uh, this will be a little different tonight. This is a special committee that Dr. Hansen and, and these uh, students formed. Uh, the students met in one of three committees that were formed. One was design, second was research and development, and third was implementation and publicity. And this is about their classes. The design committee collaborated with our district graphic designers in-house to create yard signs, masks, and banners specific to their schools. The research and development team discussed drive-through graduation as an alternative to the in-person ceremony, what other incentives, and keepsakes for graduate for a citywide appreciation via the billboards and campus marquees and our community in general. The implementation of publicity team discussed the timing of the distribution of a senior regalia. So I will now uh, call on these names and bring them forward to give us a report. Lexi Blair from John W. North High School, Ethan Cortez from Riverside Polytechnic High School, Savannah Wad from uh, Ramona High School, and Alexander, good to see you again, Alexander Crum from Riverside STEM Academy. Young people. Thank you so much. No, I missed um, that. Good evening, President Hunt. My name is Lexi Blair, and I am, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Prince, I don't think we have it up here. I can hear the young lady's voice. I can't, do we have them on film or just a, a call in? I apologize, your president doesn't know. All right, there we go. Nope, here we go. I apologize. No, no, no. Are we okay? Thank you. Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Dr. Hansen, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Lexi Blair, and I am happy to be representing the illustrious John Wesley North High School this evening. Lexi, Tonight, I'm just going to interrupt you quickly. I apologize. I just want to make sure we're on, you're on the screen. So, Mr. Prince, thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you. Please do it again. We're good now? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay. Yes, miss, I am. All right, let's try that again. Let's try it again. Um, I am happy to be representing the illustrious John Wesley North High School this evening. Tonight, I will be reporting along with the board representatives from Polly, Ramona, and the STEM Academy on behalf of the Riverside Unified School District Senior Committee. The committee was established to provide suggestions for the district's end of year plans for the class of 2021. Key senior leaders from each high school gathered together to discuss end of year senior activities and recognitions. Our goal was to collect ideas and feedback from fellow seniors at each high school and develop a set of recommendations to report out to the school board. This committee is made up of senior student board representatives and senior class presidents from each RUSD high school and the three student board members. Student representatives meet each week starting in late January through the end of February. And if we can now move on to the next slide, I will be handing it off to Mr. Ethan Cortez. Thank you. Ethan, go ahead and unmute. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Right. Thank you, Board of Trustees, Dr. Hansen and Dr. Lewis for giving us the opportunity to serve on the senior committee and allowing us to provide input on the RUSD class of 2021's end of the year activities and recognitions. We also thank the board for your time this evening to allow us to share out the outcomes of our committee. In our initial meetings, we brainstormed ideas of what RUSD seniors would be interested in for recognition and graduation. This input was taken from each school's own representatives and senior class presidents on behalf of their school's senior population. Afterwards, we utilized the student input in, in combination with weekly checks of county health requirements and guidelines in order to make the following recommendations pre presented by Savannah to benefit the senior class. Next slide, please. Good evening, um, board president, Mr. Hunt, superintendent, Dr. Hansen, and the esteemed members of the board. My name is Savannah Wald, and I'm representing Ramona High School and the Senior Student Committee. In our senior committee discussions, we have proposed various ways to incentivize our seniors during this time. Similarly to last year, we proposed distributing class of 2021 yard signs to every senior designed specifically for each school site. These designs were shown on the first slide of, the of this presentation. Additionally, we would like to provide each student with a senior swag bag with a district-wide class of 2021 graduation t-shirt and other items such as socks, lanyards, stickers, pins, and of course, hand sanitizer. 
Um, we have allotted the week of May 3rd for the distribution of the, these items and uh, for the cap and gowns. In order to recognize each of our district's top 10 class rank seniors, bad Victorians and solid Victorians, we plan on providing these students with an additional top 10 yard sign and give each of these vowels and cells a school personalized balloon pillar. As for graduation, all RUSD drive through graduations have been approved to proceed between the dates of May 20th to May 28th. We propose increasing last year's maximum number of cars from one car to two to three cars per graduating senior. This would allow for students to have more support from their loved ones and also take into consideration um, those seniors with a separated or larger sized families. For individuals who are unable to attend, we would like to have each graduation site live streamed um, on an online platform such as Facebook Live or YouTube Live. In ordinance of the COVID-19 guidelines, masks will be mandatory throughout the entire commencement. As at the start of graduation, each student um, at each school will receive an RUSD class of 2021 mask to wear during graduation. Additionally, we would like there to be a step and repeat picture opportunity available for all students after they walk across the stage. The, this, which will be done by a professional photographer. And that is all I have for, to, for you today. Um, you may move on to the next slide for Alex. Good evening, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and esteemed members of the board. I'm gladly returning on behalf of Riverside STEM Academy to deliver my report. During February, I was invited to join the senior committee along with my fellow school board representatives to work towards providing input and designing events for this year's seniors. During the time spent in this committee, we brainstormed a variety of ideas depending on the circumstances we found ourselves in for the coming months. We put an emphasis on ideas that were safe for the current and prior conditions of the COVID situation, but we stayed hopeful that the conditions would continue to improve. Assuming the situation doesn't improve enough for health guidelines to loosen, we have made plans for drive-through graduations. However, if it is deemed safe enough for the loosening of health guidelines and public gatherings are permitted, we would be more than happy to reconvene this committee and adjust or create new plans. Again, we would like to thank the Board of Trustees and District for providing us with this opportunity to give our input in the planning of events for this year's graduating seniors. We look forward to what the following months will bring. Thank you for your time. Understanding this is your district. I do have, if you would, uh, do I have any questions from the board for the young people? Hey. Okay, no, I guess not at this time. That was my mistake. Uh, but we do thank you. It is your district taking ownership. These are difficult times that all of us can remember our high school graduations. And this is completely different, but you're making it as more personal as, as you possibly can for you and, and your fellow members of the great class of 2021. Now at this time, I am very pleased to uh, bring forward this presentation we have here tonight. It's an honor. Uh, I want to remind everyone that your Board of Education here at RUSD uh, back in October, which is National Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, proclaimed and, and adopted March 31st, which is the man's birthday, as Cesar E. Chavez Day of Service and Learning. We encourage student participation as well as that of our staff and uh, public in school community service that will be reflective and honoring the life and work of this great American man. I'm very excited tonight and pleased to, in a moment, to rec uh, introduce you to Assistant Superintendent Dr. Jackie Perez, who is uh, Assistant Superintendent for uh, Equity, Accessibility, and uh, Community Engagement. She will introduce our speaker. The Honorable Jorge Hernandez, a Superior Court Judge from the County of Riverside, and a former, I don't know if anybody's ever a former graduate of North, they're, they're always a, a North Husky, a former John W. North High School graduate who will speak on the contributions of Cesar E. Chavez as we celebrate him this month. Dr. Perez, please. Thank you, President Hunt. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the Honorable Jorge C. Hernandez. A former teacher of Chicano Studies and a father of four, Jorge Hernandez is a Superior Court Judge for the County of Riverside. Growing up with economic and social hardship, Jorge turned his adversity into opportunity, but it required the resilience, dedication, and hunger for achievement that was nurtured by his desire to succeed. Jorge is a graduate of North High School. He earned a bachelor's degree from UC Riverside and then is a Juris Doctor from UC Hastings College of the Law. After working as a public defender, he became a sole practitioner before being appointed by former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger 
in 2008 as a Superior Court judge. A dedicated supporter of the Riverside Art Museum and now the Chief Marine Center for Chicano Art and Culture, Judge Hernandez is the founder of the Pachuco Ball, held every August to support programs and services of the museum. The host of the musical program, Radio Aztlan, on KUCR 88.3 FM, Jorge is a lowrider enthusiast, collects Chicano art, and has a vast collection of early Chicano mu movement music. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Jorge C. Hernandez. Thank you, folks. I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to address uh, this illustrious board this evening. Shout out to all the teachers and all the counselors. Uh, I'll tell you that if it wasn't for very specific individuals at John Wesley North High School, I probably would not be where I'm at today. Those include Georgian Renee, who was the uh, Dean of Students, Georgian um, not, I'm sorry, Georgian Not, who was the Dean of Students, Georgian Renee, who was a counselor, and Mr. Anderson, who was also a counselor. I credit those individuals for uh, my success today because they had belief in me, they prompted me, they pushed me, they pulled me. They did whatever was necessary in order to uh, uh, force me to do the things that come naturally to other communities, but don't come naturally to uh, ours. Um, when President Biden was, uh, sworn in office. Shortly thereafter, there was a picture of a bust of Cesar Chavez that was prominently displayed uh, in the Oval Office, right behind the Oval Desk, amidst all the pictures of uh, President Biden's family. And Twitter, Facebook, Instagram was just delighted in a buzz with that, uh, that picture. And those of us who are the followers of Chavez and those of us who are the followers of history were specifically uh, uh, delighted because we knew, we knew that the times were changing and that finally we were receiving the recognition uh, for our contributions to society, not only of Chavez, but of all the other communities who have made our uh, society and our country uh, what it was. In the not so distant past, there was another occupant of that office who when was governor of the state of California refused to recognize the existence of the United Farm Workers and refused to acknowledge Cesar Chavez as its leader. Not so long ago when the political forces of Washington DC aligned themselves in favor of the growers and the Pentagon, Department of Defense and Department of Agriculture bought tons and tons and tons of grapes from California grape growers and then threw those grapes into the ocean. So we were excited to see that bust. We were excited to receive uh, that uh, recognition. Cesar was born in Yuma, Arizona on March 30th, 1927. His early years were spent on his uh, grandfather's farm. His grandfather and family lost that farm during the Great Depression and the family was forced into the migrant worker stream. Chavez saw firsthand the horrible living conditions of the workers. People lived in shanties and shacks. People used their vehicles as lean-tos. People cooked outside. He also saw that they had long work hours, 14-hour days, 16-hour days, with no overtime. That did not get rectified in California until two years ago. Saw horrible wages. The workers were paid piecemeal, which meant that they got paid a certain amount per box of whatever it was they were picking. State law required that piecemeal payments were supposed to equal the hourly prevailing wage, but that was never the case. So it took an entire family together working collectively in order to make enough money for that family to survive. Also saw that there were no toilets in the fields, no running water in the fields. We take those things for granted. When we go to work, we take for granted that we have the use of toilets and running water but not so for the workers in the field. He also saw that people were exposed to toxins and pesticides. One of the most deadly pesticides to all living organisms was DDT, and DDT was used exclusively in the fields. He also saw that those that complained were easily gotten rid of and prevented from working at other farms. Cesar Chavez dropped out of school in eighth grade 
imagine that dropping out of school in eighth grade if you ever heard him talk or you ever read his writings you would be amazed that this gentleman only had an eighth grade education because his writings and his manner of speech reflected a greater uh, education but most of his education was self-taught he joined the navy at age 19 the Navy at that time in 1946 was segregated along color lines and uh, Chavez was uh, rewarded for not only his services but his contributions to society by having a U.S. naval ship named after him on May 5th of 2012. He shortly uh, in 1948 when he left the Navy he returned back to the fields to attempt to organize, joined the community service organization under Fred Ross Sr. And it was there that he honed his uh, organizing skills. He left them in 1962, along with Dolores Huerta. They moved back to Delano, California, and they attempted to organize, and they started the fledgling union called the National Farm Workers Association. And it was in that same year, 1962, that they launched the UFW Eagle as being the uh, uh, logo for the United Farm Workers. That eagle, is probably the most widely recognized logo on the entire planet. The NFWA merged with the Filipino Agricultural Workers Committee, AWOC, and then became the United Farm Workers of America. In September of 1965, CESAR and the UFW began the longest running strike and boycott in U.S. history culminating in collective bargaining agreements in 1970. It was Cesar's strength of character and humility that allowed him to bring together different people in order to get behind his cause. He was able to bring different clergy from different denominations, Catholics, Baptists, Protestants, Jewish denominations, brought them together in order to support his union. Students from across America came to join the union and they crossed racial lines. Black, white, brown people came to support. There was just a, a mass of people who came to California from all over in order to join Cesar Chavez's plight against the growers. And it was because of that that Cesar was able to garner support worldwide. There were grapes thrown in the ocean in France there were boycott supporters in Germany, in different uh, countries. So typically my discussion on CESA usually lasts about three class periods. I don't have that luxury today. So what I want to do is just give you a, a listing of all the accomplishments of the United Farm Workers. The first genuine collective bargaining agreement between farm workers and the growers in the history of the continental United States beginning with the contract signed with Shindley Vineyards in 1966. They had the first union contracts requiring rest periods, toilets in the fields, clean drinking water, hand washing facilities, protective clothing against pesticide exposure, banning pesticide spraying while workers are in the field, outlawing DDT and other dangerous pesticides, lengthening pesticides re-entry periods beyond state and federal standards and requiring the testing of farm workers on a regular basis to monitor pesticide exposure. They had the first union contracts eliminating farm labor contractors and guaranteeing farm workers seniority rights and job security. Established the first comprehensive union health benefit plan for farm workers and their family through the Robert F. Kennedy Medical Plan had the first and only functioning pension plan for retired farm workers called the Juan de la Cruz Pension Plan, the first functioning credit union for farm workers, the first union contracts regulating safety and sanitary conditions in farm labor camps, banning discrimination in employment and sexual harassment of women workers, the first union contract providing for profit sharing and parental leave, abolishing the infamous short handle hole that crippled generations of farm workers and extending to farm workers state coverage under unemployment, disability, and workers' compensation, as well as amnesty right for immigrants and public assistance for farm workers. 
it's clear to me looking back on the life of Sesta Chavez that he made so many changes that not only benefited the workers in the field, but those of us outside of the field. Think for a minute the use of DDT and how that was toxic to every living animal and how DDT does not necessarily wash off of the grapes, the fruits and the vegetables that we eat. We were safeguarded by uh, his action. And he is truly an American hero, American born. His character, his strength, his humility, his willingness to help others, his willingness to put his life on the line, his willingness to dedicate himself to those least liked and least served of our community, serve as a beacon of hope for all of us, definitely serves as a beacon of hope to all the students. Mr. Hunt in his opening remarks said that we want to be and have the character and the qualities of Sessa. Well, I think the teachers have that quality because those teachers under harsh conditions, harsh because of COVID, harsh because of underfunding, harsh because of large classrooms are striving each and every day to, to educate and to make education a wonder for these students to open their eyes to education, to get them to learn, to get them to believe in themselves, to get them to understand history and how we fit in all of that. We should strive to be like SESTA in our everyday life, not only our teachers, but our students and our leaders. And it's only then that we can kind of solve this divide that's in our country, because there is a big, gigantic divide. Racism did not end in the 30s, the 40s. It's still there. It's still alive. I just read an article that in Oklahoma, there was a fist fight because an all-Black high school were racially taunted by the opposite team. That should not be happening in 2021. That should not be happening in modern day. That should not be happening in an age of enlightenment. But I think as educators, if we teach children about Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and all those individuals that came before us, who fought for us, who died for us, who put their lives on the line and talk about those character traits that they have that we should emulate, I think if we do that, our world would be a much better place for our children, children, because as parents, that is our hope and our desire for our world to be better for them today than it was for us yesterday. So I hope that uh, that's what we continue as our mission. That's what we uh, continue as our goal. And I applaud this uh, uh, school board for its efforts and attempts to keep up with the changes. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. And anytime you need anything from me, all you have to do is ask, and I am at your uh, pleasure and at your service. Thank you. Judge Hernandez, North graduate, thank you very much for those inspiring words. It certainly is high praise indeed. Anything you, that someone would do to be tied to the work and the legacy of Cesar Chavez, and thank you for uh, tying our, our teachers and their commitment, as well as all of our staff on, the, on campuses and in the district office uh, to, to his. Thank you. Um, thank, uh, you're, it's inspiring what you said, and, and the work of, of that started by Cesar Chavez continues. You're right, the hands have changed. Uh, ha times are changing, but as you pointed out, it's, it's clearly we are responsible for moving those hands forward, because they won't do it by themselves, even in this wonderful country. So. We, uh, we want you to know we'll continue to honor uh, his memory and build on that. Dr. Hansen and, and his team, his academic planners, will share a list of resources for the staff to use during this month in our classrooms and schools to where we can learn more about Cesar Savez. And I'm going to add after schools our staff as well. It's important that, the, that we as staff, from the board to everyone else, uh, recognize and understand and embrace the humility and the character and the self-sacrifice of this man to make changes that advance our, our society and this district. So uh, Dr. Hansen, we're looking forward to that. And and thank you again, Judge. And I know North High School is very proud of you. I don't know if you saw Dale Kinnear sitting up here, our newest trustee. Yeah, I'll let him say something because I know he'd like to, just because he, he can't miss a chance to praise a Husky. <laughs> thank you, Judge, for uh, uh, all you do for our community. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to see you. You've uh, uh, been a, a huge supporter of education uh, in our community, 
and a huge supporter of, uh, of John W. North High School. We're proud of you. Thank you. And now I'll move on to, uh, at this time, to ask uh, Ms. Frosto, can you please open the queue for our next agenda item, F1, the 2021 Riverside Unified School District's priorities from the board workshop meeting on January 30th, 2021. Ms. Frosto? Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for item F1. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on agenda item F1, the 2021 Riverside Unified School District priorities from the board workshop meeting on January 30th, you may now enter the queue by using the raise hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item F1. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frosto, appreciate that. So now we'll move to uh, that F1 and the, uh, we'll provide the report first. The, the board's gonna report on their, our retreat and uh, we have a list of these. I'm, I'm gonna start and I'm asking my, my fellow, obviously my fellow trustees who lead uh, to provide the next. So I'll read the first one, it's opening priorities. It begins like this, almost a year ago, we began using the term unprecedented times to describe our lives and this district's life during the pandemic of COVID. Today, we are moving from an unprecedented time to preparing for a safe return to, to gradual in-person classes on our campuses. Throughout the year, this Board of Education has listened to all family, staff, neighbors, and our community. We hear you about this situation. On January 30th, as I mentioned, our board held its annual workshop with all, all priorities focused and tied to pandemic and, and how we move forward as a district under these this new times. During our conversation, we agreed that, that the priorities have a unique backdrop because of our current situation. I think you'll be pleased and we wanna hear your feedback at the time. This backdrop, of course, includes a clear and informed response to COVID's impact on our students, our faculty, our, our employees, and the entire system, our community. We will also maintain focus on and expand effective communication. Nothing more important than, than relating to you, our public reserve. Strategic and stable funding, you'll be very assured of that, and everything through a lens of equity and equality and, and respect that this board, the last 140 years, has, has demonstrated. We wanna work with all our, our folks, the PTA, the PTOs, all of our groups and our community. So at this time, I'll, I'll go to the next uh, priority, Mrs. Allaby. At the center of our opening priorities is just that, open, open, open. It is important that we safely open our campuses. This way, students may experience in person the joys of being back on school campuses, including the rich experience of learning in a classroom with the staff who are looking forward to seeing them. We know that we have all experienced loss and some level of trauma during this pandemic. So it becomes so important that we embrace flexibility in our daily schedule and our daily expectations. Mr. Kinnear. Be united is a great theme. A unified school district, unified schools and unified employees, students who are united, united in celebration of our successes and our mission to improve. Be united truly is a great theme. Our opening priorities also include the well-being of all of our students and our employees. As many students and staff transition from distance learning and remote working to being in person, we will have social and emotional wellness opportunities in place for everyone. Coupled with that is the opening priority of student learning. With great focus and purpose, we will identify where our students are in their learning and implement learning recovery strategies when they're required. We have confidence in our staff, students, and their families. Next slide, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. A key component to the richness of Riverside is our outreach and partnerships. 
we want to continue our work with our current partners and identify new partners to enhance our family outreach and engagement. engagement. This includes our parent groups, our nonprofit community, our businesses, our faith-based communities and church community. They have provided an extraordinary amount of in-kind volunteer and, and different types of donations. And these contributions and partnerships have not only been vital to helping us open schools, but helping our students get through the experience while they haven't been, while they've been remotely learning. So th this is the pride of RUSD. Opening schools is truly a community effort and we lean on everyone and the power of our community. We are stronger together. And I turn it over to my colleague, Trustee Lee. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, and while our priorities are definitely on bringing our students and our staff back to campus, we're not losing sight of our, our goal and our original mission that we've been working on over the last several years. Um, so we, as, as we focus on, on our reopening, we will continue uh, on our efforts to provide high quality teaching, learning environment for all students. Continue on preparing all students to be college, career, and world ready upon their graduation from one of our school sites. And last, uh, we be, continue to work on fully engaging students parents, uh, families, and the community in support of short and long-term educational outcomes. So it is through these uh, opening priorities that we will ride the wave of change into a new normal in which the only thing unprecedented is the high levels of student achievement, the well-being, and well-being and, the st and staff engagement and success. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Colleagues, thank you, colleagues. I'm it's an honor to serve with you and the community. We, we'd like your input on these and uh, they are not goals. They are necessities. Achieving them. Uh, now, I, uh, Ms. Frostel, do we have any uh, uh, public comments on F1? Yes, President Hunt. Oh, I'm sorry. The hand just went down. No, we do not. We do not. All right. Well, th thank you. Then we'll, we'll move on to our next item, which is the superintendents comments and COVID update. And uh, at this time, I'm pleased to call upon our district superintendent, Dr. David Hansen. Dr. Hansen. Good evening uh, once again, and welcome to everyone joining us for tonight's Board of Education meeting. The board this evening is gonna hear several reports, but two main reports are first, the return to in-person report, including phase two for elementary and secondary requirements. The second board report is um, uh, uh, worth mentioning this evening is the board also here and discuss this evening the program choice selection update for next school year, the 2021-2022 school year. And I'm certainly grateful to all of the RSD staff and team members who prepared for tonight's presentation. So those are two reports I'd like to just highlight in my comments. Another area is the 19th Annual Empowering Young Women Conference is a collaborative effort of the Adrian Dell and Carmen Roberts Foundation and various community stakeholders to bring forth just some fantastic guest speakers. This is a free virtual conference and it begins this Saturday through March the 27th. It goes from 11.30 to 12.30 for young women ages 12 through 21. And as I mentioned, it's several consecutive Saturdays that people can join. And so I'd encourage you to participate and be involved if you can. And finally, on March the 10th, the Riverside Council PTA will be hosting their virtual reflections awards ceremony beginning at six o'clock PM. And this event recognizes the student artists from across the district and their creativity. Before we finish, uh, uh, the superintendent's report, I'd like to invite Assistant Superintendent Tim Walker to come forward and to give the COVID-19 update that uh, we have been doing at every board meeting for the last several months. So Mr. Tim Walker. Can we pull up the slides, please? Thank you, Dr. Hansen, President Hunt, members of the board. Hope tonight finds you in good health and spirits. Happy to give you an overview of where we are and the return to school requirements. Um, if you look at the uh, slide that's up before you, uh, the PK-6 return to school requirements included a three-week window that opened and it began uh, back in early February, from February 23rd to March 16th. That has been met. 
communications to families went out on the 24th of February. Then we had Riverside County Public Health approving our COVID safety plan on March the 2nd, and the elementary certificate of staff returned on March the 2nd as well. We are now looking for phase two hybrid to begin on March the 9th. Our requirement on the left was a rate, just a case rate for COVID-19 cases in the Riverside County of less than 25. We are currently at 11.3, um, so we're down really well compared to last time we had a conversation. Next slide, please. In comparison, if we look at the requirements for the 712 return to school requirement, we have on the left an adjusted case rate needed of seven or less, we're at 11.3. A positivity rate of eight or less, and we're at 5.8, so we've met that metric. And a health equity metric of 8% or less, we're at 6.1, we've met that metric. So we're waiting for the adjusted case rate to come down below seven. If you look on the right, the Riverside County Health approved our safety plan, so that is a check. Communications to families about when uh, we could potentially open is a check. We're waiting for that number to get below seven so that we can have our three week window open. We hope and anticipate it to be on March the 9th. Then secondary certificate of staff would return. We anticipate that to be March the 16th. And then students would return to phase three hybrid and we anticipate that to be the 29th. These are anticipations, they are not uh, actual at this point in time. Next slide, please. And this is a, a timeline of return to campus um, going across a, a more global perspective. In January of 14th, the California State K-12 school guidance was released. Step one was to create the safety plan. That began on January the 15th. Step two was to submit the safety plan. That occurred on February the 1st, 2021. And step three was for the plan to be approved. And again, that occurred on March the 2nd. That concludes my presentation at this time. Thank you, Mr. Walk, for that. And let me just say, as I conclude the report, I'm very excited that uh, our elementary kids are gonna be coming back this next week, the week of March the 8th. They'll be here on Tuesday the 9th. So grateful to the, all, the, all, all the elementary teachers that returned this week. They returned this last Monday and they're getting things ready and worked out any personal child care situation, things such as that. So we're ready to go. We are prepared. We are safe and we are ready. And as I've mentioned before to our secondary staff members, get ready. The numbers are such that you are right on the heels. And as you heard from Mr. Walker this evening, it's very likely that all the secondary teachers will be back in the classrooms teaching virtually in a week. And then, of course, we have spring break here in a couple of weeks. And that's uh, when you see that we're uh, anticipating that all of our secondary students will return after spring break on that March the 29th. So the numbers are going the right direction. We're grateful for our county leaders that are monitoring them and helping us and just really looking forward to having all of our kids back in person, pre-K through 12 here in the next couple of weeks. That concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, and, and for your staff for their help. Um, I'm gonna ask you to take a privilege to not include my comments coming up, but you have a, you would add in your comments about the special recognition that one of your cabinet members just received and uh, deserves noting. Thank you, President Hunt, because he's uh, certainly well-deserving of this, but Mr. Uh, Tim Walker, who just gave that report, we just received notification, had a chance to celebrate yesterday. Our county superintendent, Dr. Edwin Gomez, uh, held a special meeting for Tim. His wife, Ellen, was there. His three triplets were there. And Tim Walker has been named as Riverside County Certificated Administrator of the Year. Certainly proud of him, well-deserved, not just this year, but every year he's been in education for a few decades. And I suspect from day one, Tim has always worked as hard as he does now has been the polar star and consistent and diligent in what he does. I know superintendent, I've just thoroughly enjoyed from my first day here. Uh, the original cabinet just consists of Tim. He's seen me as a new superintendent grow over the last seven years and has worked closely with me. And so it's certainly wonderful to have him by my side the entire time. And now what this means is he's eligible now to compete for state 
Employee of the Year, Certificate in Management and Employee of the Year. So we're, again, congratulations for Tim. So maybe the few of us are in this room, we can give him a big round of applause. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hansen and Assistant Superintendent Walker. Congratulations. We're very proud of the work you've done and appreciative of, of your dedication all these years. You, for me, are the walking Wikipedia for California Ed Code. It's very fun. So at this time, oh, thank you. At this time, Ms. Frosto, can we please provide the instructions for members of the community to enter the queue to provide public comment on topics that are not already on the agenda, topics they'd like to bring forward. Ms. Frosto? Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for agenda item H. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on agenda item H, public input for all items that are not listed on the agenda, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by using the raise hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item for the public input. And we'll give that just a moment, Mr. Hunt. We have a couple, but so, just to uh, make sure that you heard that message. I'm gonna read slowly and then give you more the opportunity, all right? Public comments will be accepted under, until the specific item of business to be transacted or discussed by the board is considered. Public comments are limited to three minutes prior to the board's consideration of the item. Um, unless there's more people that want to talk on a particular item and it's at the discretion of the chair to form them together under a board policy 9323. Now one, a few chores that are incumbent upon me and I want to share with you the public that are going to be commenting uh, to ensure that you keep with the three minutes um, and that you keep on the subject. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that's on the other. Keep to three ministry and public comment. Um, and uh, there's very little that, that the board can really say back to you because these aren't advertised. So we can ask a clarifying question if need, but that's unusual. And I'll, many times uh, folks calling in will have a question uh, they'd like answered or an input. And it, some give their name and some don't, but if you have a question to let, allow us to get back to you, I'll call on Dr. Hansen perhaps to ask him to do that. Uh, we need to know how to get out of here. So uh, with that brief tutorial, uh, do we, Ms. Frosto, you wanna begin? And we'll, we'll yes. follow your lead. Wonderful. We have one speaker in person. We'll begin with that person, Mr. Jason Hunter. Welcome, Mr. Hunter. I live here in the Wood Streets. Great to be back in these in-person meetings. Can't wait to be attending the next several hundred in person. So I can take this off? No, no, I, I, no don't take that off, but I just want you to speak a little bit. because you're So uh, good evening. Uh, I was going to say, actually, I shouldn't have said my name at all because I was, I was going to say to hide my identity, I'm going to wear this mask on while I speak. Uh, I uh, represent the unrepresented in this district, the general public, and I come with this message in person. Reform is here. Reform is here. Uh, our goal is not over the next couple of years to stop the rot that has infected this district. Sweep out the scoundrels who serve themselves and special interest, those who use the tricks of subterfuge to push an agenda at odds with the mission of this school district and the desires of this community. I can assure you we will be looking under every rock this district and assigning accountability for what I'm sure will be revi revealing findings. Happy retirement, Mr. Hansen. Have fun pushing the new bond measure out at Beaumont, Ms. Kakish, if she's still here. I don't even know if she's left already. Uh, you will not be forgotten. Maybe one day forgiven. First item up will be the bait and switch known as Measure O, a school facility bond measure passed in 2016 where the district picks, pitched fixing all the existing schools to this community in order to fool this community into passing the bond measure. However, according to the district's own bond council, Mr. David Casnocha, the bond measure was written intentionally vague so that the district didn't have to legally live up to the promises it made to this community. We had been tricked into signing a blank check. 
in violation of the spirit and perhaps the letter of the law embodied in our state constitution, Prop 39 passed back in 2000, 2001, which requires a specific project list. And what did the district do with the measure of monies once the voters approved it? Well, the district moved uh, projects, the new schools, the uh, STEM high school and three elementary schools and a King parking lot, not only to the project list the community had been given, but it also moved these projects to the top of the list. I've only got three minutes here, but that's all right. There's gonna be many more meetings in the future where I'll be coming down here and explaining the story of the bait and switch and the rubbish going on uh, at these oversight meetings where there's only the illusion of legitimacy and oversight of those bond monies being given to this public. And the board knows it, you're enabling it, and you better change it quickly. Appreciate it. Ms. Frosto, do we have uh, any other comments, public comment? Yes, we do. We'll move to our speakers from Zoom. Our first one will be caller identified as 2601. We're going to wait for the timer to be shown and then we'll go. Hola, Espanol. Uno momento. Espanol. Communications, if we could move one of our um, interpreters over. Ms. Frosto, we do give more than three minutes for the interpretation of comments. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you to our very dedicated Good. Uno momento, por favor. Gracias. Señora, puede hablar. Gracias. Buenas noches. Llamo hoy para pedirles a ustedes que consideren cinco días por semana de escuela y escuela para los niños mayores. Yo soy madre soltera en el distrito y mis niños están sufriendo. Yo no puedo ayudarles con su escuela. No quiero dejar a mis niños solos, pero no tengo otra op opción. Necesito trabajar para salir adelante. Yo no hablo inglés solo unas cuantas palabras. Mis niños están atrasados en sus clases y sus calificaciones están sufriendo. Les suplico que regresen a cinco días por semana y abran la secundaria. Un día por semana no sirve para nada. Ya hemos sufrido un año y no más ha causado, causado más divisiones entre los ricos y los pobres. Yo no Puedo mandar a mis hijos a escuela privada o contratar a un tutor. Es muy importante para los niños que abran cinco días por semana. Gracias. Did you want to, did you get it all, Lupi? I, I hope so. <laughs> you were doing better than I was. Go ahead, okay. Ms. Aguilar. So, Thank you. Uh, good night. I would like, I'm calling tonight because I would like for you to consider to open the schools five days a week. I, uh, I am a single mother and I have to work. I can't help my children with their schoolwork and their grades are suffering. Uh, to, uh, uh, I, need, uh, I need to work and I do not want to leave my children alone, but that's what I need to do. Please consider opening the schools five days a week for the upper grades. One day does not help us at all. This has been a year, and this has driven and made a bigger gap between the rich and the poor. I do not have the money to have my children uh, with tutors. Uh, so please consider opening the schools five days a week for the upper grades. Thank you. Thank you, caller, and uh, I assure you that, that this district would like to do more. We are restrained and guided by the edicts of the state. And uh, right now, with it, based on the number of cases against 100,000 population, we're allowed, if it, if it maintains, beginning next Tuesday to reopen. But it's for one day a week, pre-K through six. But uh, those are important comments, and uh, we'll make sure they get passed on to our legislators. So uh, do we have any other, Ms. Frosto? Yes, our next speaker is Patricia, I believe, Isham. 
Excuse me. One moment. Okay, you may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. Hello, I'm happy to be part of this discussion this evening and I'm beyond so excited that we're finally opening. I've listened to prior meetings, but decided not to speak at that time because I really felt it wasn't going to change anything due to the fact that the teachers union seemed to be holding us, our kids and the teachers that wanted to teach hostage. I'm a registered nurse uh, by profession and I'm considered essential. I was frightened for many months about being in the hospital setting, my exposure and keeping my family safe also. I work nights and then I would come home and stay awake to help my kids with their online school troubleshooting, et cetera, especially in the beginning. I have one in elementary and two are high school freshmen. The first semester was very difficult and now thank God we are doing much better after much hard work. But schools are also essential to the functioning of our society and that makes teachers essential workers. It was very hard to hear so many teachers exclaiming that they shouldn't be put at risk and that parents just wanted their babysitters back. That frustrated me to no end. You have no idea. I know not all the teachers felt that way and my children's teachers at Lake Matthews are amazing and I know they wanna get back. Teachers will rise to the occasion just like all other public servants did. And although it's a year later, we all show courage and dedication every day to the public, assuming some risk to ourselves and to our families. One day a week, we'll barely be just dipping our toes in and eventually we'll go to two days and then we'll jump all in next year and realize it'll all be okay. But will they be okay educationally? That's my concern. Although my kids are doing well, when the new year school starts, somehow I feel that they'll be behind. The textbooks and the curriculum will not change or accommodate for what happened with COVID. Will these kids be okay? And why, if we knew the schools were gonna be opening, why did we pick our mo modes for next year? Um, is the plan to still offer homeschool and hybrid and in-person? I'm slightly confused as to how that works please consider uh, opening five days so these kids can get used to it and more comfortable. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller, nurse and mom. And I uh, just wanna say we appreciate your courage and dedication. Some of us have had the unfortunate occurrence to, during this time to actually see y'all in action. And I personally thank you and I know my colleagues do. Uh, Dr. Hansen, could you just address quickly uh, the, the caller's question about next year, which is a crystal ball, but the plans to do uh, homeschool, et cetera, the choices that were given? Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Actually, this evening on the board agenda here, with the next 30 minutes, there's going to be a report. It's called the School Choice Report. We, at the board's request, try to offer our parents several different choices. And the decisions we made back at the start of this pandemic were made intentionally that they would long outlast the pandemic to give our parents choices. We've always had a virtual school, we expanded that. We've always had in-person school, and then last year we started for the first time this home study or home school, if you, were, if you will, where the parents are the main teacher. We have 42,000 students in our district. All parents wanna have choices, and so we're gonna continue those choices into next year the homeschool, the 100% virtual, and of course the in-person that we all want to get back to. And you'll have a full report on that probably for the next 30 minutes from uh, Dr. Ryan Lewis, uh, a cabinet member. And, and that report is also, because it's in our agenda, it's also online for these parents and others to look at. Is that correct? It's sir? been posted online since last Friday. That is Thank correct. you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you, caller. Ms. Frosto, our next caller. Yes, Chloe Christensen. Chloe, you will have three minutes and can go ahead and unmute. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kalee Christensen. I am a 10th grader from Martin Luther King High School. 
uh, I'd just like to take this time uh, to bring to the board's attention where students are right now in this return back to school. Uh, so me, along with another MLK student, Trevin Shaw, actually put out a, a petition or rather a statement that basically said that uh, we believed that going back to school uh, would be detrimental to students' mental health and uh, to their grades. And we estimate that we reached around 750 students uh, and of those 750 students, 357 students agreed with what we wrote. Um, just for context, that's 47.6% of all students who saw that petition. Now, we're not naive enough to uh, ask to not go back and think that that's a possibility. Uh, we hear the board and we're so thankful that the board uh, has given us the chance to uh, talk and share our opinions. And so I just want to say that on behalf of this majority of the student population, I think a lot of us are really concerned about our grades. Um, we've been preached to basically our entire lives that grades matter, that we need to go to college. College sets us up for our future. And right now, people like me are really stressed, um, really stressed that we won't be able to get the grade. Um, so I had a chance to speak with Mr. Hunt earlier this morning, and I brought up something that I just like to maybe start thinking about. Now, last year in March, uh, we basically established a grade security, which meant that students' grades when they left in-person instruction was the lowest that they could possibly be. However, we saw that there were some fallbacks to that and that students just stopped doing their work altogether. And that's not ideal. And I agree with the board, we need students learning. We need students to be incorporated back into the in-person environment. So what we're asking right now and what uh, I've posted on my Instagram story and a bunch of people have agreed with me on this that uh, we would ask that you consider giving us grade security and that when we return to in-person instruction that our grades cannot go lower but with some conditions and the conditions being that all students must complete all of their school work and also complete all tests in order to be granted that grade security. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to hear me today, and I wish everyone a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Um, I did just speak with her today with Dr. Lewis, very uh, other with the other young man, is involved and very interesting. And I know Dr. Lewis will be taking your comments on to Dr. Hansen and, and uh, the cabinet uh, to to discuss. Very very insightful. It does show that not one size fits all. Ms. Frosto, do we have a next caller, please? Yes, and I'd also like to take a moment to remind our um, attendees that the queue for this item is closed. So um, the next caller is Trevin Shaw. Trevin, you may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Trevin Shaw. Um, I worked with Chloe um, gathering other students' opinions. Um, like she said, we reached about 750 students and that was in the span of about 48 hours starting on Monday morning. So that was awesome to be able to see that other people agree with us. And just reiterating what Chloe said, the current proposed model for going back to school for high school students um, is one day a week. And a lot of students feel that going back at this point in the school year, two months left with finals and testing and AP tests right around the corner is definitely going to be impactful on our grades and most likely our futures because as we know, grades get us into college and set us up for our success in the future. Um, a lot of teachers have said that they're, they're gonna be testing in that one day that we're back and we want the board to be able to listen to what we're saying and asking that maybe those minutes will be used for instruction rather than simply for testing or mainly for testing. And again, that test or that grade security for the students who have been working hard all year in this um, distance learning format to be able to reintegrate back into the classroom to prepare for next year, but also be given the security of grades. So that way we can help their mental health and allow them to be more comfortable returning to the classroom. Thank you so much for your time and have a good night. Kevin, thank you as well. We appreciate your comments and very interesting. I'm sure Dr. Hansen will, will uh, address them, uh, if not tonight in his presentation. Uh, soon. I know that it's, you bring up some very good comments. So uh, thank you. That is the close of uh, public 
comment and um, for President Hunt, oh. I apologize if I um, created confusion. There are still callers. I just wanted to oh. remind the public that the queue was closed and we wouldn't take any more after the ones that are already in there. I apologize. No, ma'am. We have I'm three. I'm smiling underneath the mask. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Our next caller, 4896. You may go ahead and unmute and you will have three minutes. Caller with the last four numbers of 4896. Sure to reset the clock when they come on. Caller 4896, or do we have you? Ms. Frosto, why don't we go to the next one and see if we can pick up? Or oh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, can you, you hear me? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I just want to echo some of the the sentiments that have um, gone before tonight. Um, I, I appreciate all the hard work that the board has done to get the kids. I'm very excited that they're going back um, to in-person learning. But um, you know, as the the nurse that called and and has been working this entire time, um, I just would like to understand. And in your in your retreat that you did, um, what is the path to? And I understand that there's some restrictions with the state, and our numbers have to get down. But what are the plans that have been talked about? I mean, it's been a year on getting full in person, and how can we ensure that in the fall it will be in person and not a hybrid or distance learning because although one day is certainly better than nothing the kids are still struggling and there is still that gap and i'm worried much like patricia um that you know what is going to be done for these kids that have fallen behind and and struggled and it's not a one size fits all some are um, able to navigate the distance learning. But um, I know from personal experience, I have one third grader and one middle school student that, that that's not the case. So I would really like to understand, um, you know, I know that they had said, out, you know, if the numbers continue to fall, then the middle school and high school would go one day. But what does the, what does the path and the plan look like to full in person? Thank you. Thank you, caller. And uh, Dr. Hansen, I believe in your presentation, y'all will be addressing most of, be able to help with those questions. Thank you, sir. Next, next caller, Ms. Rosta. Yes, our next caller is Henry Michael Apodaca. You may go ahead and unmute, and you have three minutes. Uh, greetings, esteemed members, uh, trustees, and esteemed board members. My name is Henry Michael Apodaca. I am a media archivist that has been contracted with <clears throat> the Riverside Educational Enrichment Foundation to work the archival collections of RUSD that are housed at the warehouse on Washington. As part of my contract, um, I've been tasked with creating an inventory of four pallets um, of archival collections and materials uh, related to the school district, both site specific as well as administrative documents for uh, photography uh, maps blueprints all kinds of materials um, that hold significant evidentiary value i'm here tonight to ask the board to entertain the idea of a potential relocation of these archival materials um, as i found them and where they've been stored uh, has been at the warehouse um, and unfortunately, uh, the quality of the storing isn't up to archival uh, best practice. Since I've been working these collections, I've been working closely with uh, my point person, a Sandra Ramirez with Reef, uh, who uh, orders archival materials for me in which I rehouse these materials uh, from the collection. And I'm running out of space where I'm working and as a stipulation in my contract with Reef, I, I'm to make a recommendation 
on a rehousing. Um, the highest recommendation for that being a climate controlled environment that's both uh, temperature controlled and humidity controlled. And this is really just to ensure the longevity of the inherent decay of everything in this collection. Um, this uh, I find as important. I find myself not just as an advocate contract, or excuse me, as an archivist contracted with Reef, um, but I am going to act as an advocate for this collection. I feel that uh, uh, a climate controlled, humidity controlled space is needed for the longevity uh, that our USD has placed in their archival collections. Um, that is all. I want to thank everyone for your time and energy for listening to what I have to say. And any feedback would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Apodaca. Uh, we will ask Dr. Hansen to, I, I wasn't personally aware of it, done this. And so, uh, and I know for years we've talked about trying to better store the 140 year history of this district. So uh, I have a question from, or a comment from my colleague, Mr. Lee. Yeah, just as a re reminder to the board um, that this this project is uh, fr from the leftover campaign funds from the Measure O uh, campaign that were donated to Reef for this project. So this Thank is part, part of that process. Th Thank you, Vice President. I appreciate that. So they're working with Vince Moses then? Is that, that okay? Very good. Mr. Apataka, we will, we will endeavor. I, I share your concern with the 100 Preserving the 140 year history, I just don't think it's ever been something that a school district thought to have on their their agendas and their budgets for uh, climate control, but that's, it is important. So, uh, Ms. Frosto, uh, would we have the next uh, caller, please? Yes, and this is our last speaker, Hetty Bion. Hetty, you may go ahead and unmute, and you have three minutes. Good evening, Superintendent Hansen, Board President Hunt, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Hetty Bean, and I'm a junior at Martin Luther King High School. I stand before you today as a voice to represent my peers in a time of need. As students, we have recognized that under current health conditions and concerns, it would be unsafe to return to in-person schooling. While we may fall back on the support of the state on our reopening plans, there are many key voices that have been left out on this discussion. This includes key stakeholder groups, such as parents, staff, faculty members, teachers, local Riverside business owners, and many more. Yet above all, students who are directly affected by this decision-making processes of RUSD are constantly left out on the discussion. So we ask you for you to hear our stories today. On March 13th, 2020, the Riverside Unified School District was forced to shut down our schools due to the growing concerns surrounding the pandemic caused by COVID-19. As students, we have endured many hardships during this time as we attempted to balance and adjust to a new way of learning, all while facing the detriment and burden of a global pandemic. With only two months in the school year remaining, not only would a return to in-person schooling fail to account for student family lives who are put at risk, it would also fail to account for the decrease in quality learning time during pivotal moments of the school year, adding more to the students' plates by forcing them to self-teach as students juggle honors and AP classes, the revival of sports, and many extracurricular activities. Not only will this sudden change serve as a mental barrier for students who will have to readjust to being in a classroom setting after over a year, it will also accentuate student stress and anxiety, especially at such a critical time when state testing, AP testing, and finals are nearing. This stress is not only seen in students, but in many teachers as well, who are panicking over lesson plans, as well as how to balance teaching an online and in-person group of students. As such, teachers and students should both be supported and have a say in the decision to return to in-person school. We recognize the time and effort that RUSD has put into the reopening plans and with incorporating student voice into the picture. Yet many students have spoken out, citing potential safety concerns as well as academic concerns during crucial moments in the school year. As we finish the 2020 to 2021 school year, it might be appropriate to consider other methods of returning to school, such as implementing the no failing system that was put into place last spring, giving students the option to replace their lower second semester grades with their first, or even holding off on in-person schooling until the 2021 to 2022 school year in order to alleviate stress placed on both students and teachers and ensure that learning can take place in a stress-free environment. Thank you for your time and consideration and I hope you have a good night. Thank you, caller. We appreciate very much your calls. So now I'm going to uh, move on to the item I, which is board member comments, where each board member is uh, asked if they'd like to give a brief report on their individual activities or announcements or insights. And uh, these are the opinion of the individual board member. And uh, 
We'll go from there. I'm going to call on first our new uh, trustee, uh, uh, Micah White Daly. Daly White, excuse me. Sorry, sir. Oh, I got to just say this first. I uh, to my colleagues, just when I'm thinking about it, uh, when you want to speak, you push. You know, so I can see it. You push your mic button because they turn off our mics and sometimes I miss Mr. Lee. So at the worst, throw something at me, y'all that are back there. But I don't want to ignore you. Uh, that is not my, my job is to make sure. Mike, I've interrupted you, but please start again, sir. Uh, thank you. Once again, I would like to acknowledge and thank President Hunt and team board members for providing me with this opportunity. Uh, I was looking back at the senior committee and I just wanted to tell you guys that I'm a part of that. So I just wanted to, I just want to say that I appreciate the time and effort that is put in order to still give us seniors the recognition that we deserve after 12 years of hard work and perseverance. And uh, I just hope that these implementations that we created will pass on to the next senior class as well. Uh, going to the Cesar Chavez, that's the, that portion, I want to just acknowledge that his legacy is a constant reminder of the universal fight that is between right and wrong. As a student, it is important to know and understand these leaders and understand what they fought for and what it meant to them and how it should mean the same thing to us. On reopening, I understand that I understand your concerns. They make perfect sense. But I've also worked near the front lines and I truly feel that my safety is secured as I transition from virtual to in-person. COVID-19 is so unpredictable, but we can get a hold on it if we are practice the safety guidelines, including distancing at six feet, six or more feet, wearing your mask, washing your hands. All of these guidelines provided by the S by the CDC and credited and other credited health organizations. I'm also part of my high school, Ramona High School's equity team. I'm a fellow member of my high school's equity team. We work together in an attempt to break down any imbalances in school and ensure that every student, no matter where they come from, what their background is, what nationality, what ethnicity, what their sexual orientation is, what they believe, that they all have an equal opportunity to take advantage and maximize their academic life so they can be successful in the future. I believe in hope. That's, that's my message. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Member Daly White, thank you for being the voice of the students. Now I'll go to uh, uh, board member, uh, Trustee Dale Kinnear. Thank you, President Hunt. Uh, it's been a busy, uh, rewarding two weeks as I continue uh, learning by visiting our high schools and elementary schools and middle schools. My visits took me this past two weeks to Ramona, Martin Luther King, Lincoln, the STEM Academy, and culminated, culminated yesterday with a great visit to Project Team, where I heard a spirited discussion about pizza with Fruit Loops as a topping. I saw my first virtual field trip. I heard respectful and committed students in the Navy ROTC program and I was reintroduced to former students of mine who impressed me with their leadership and their teaching skills in the classroom. Although they'll never replace the effectiveness of in-person meetings, it sure is convenient and efficient to attend meetings virtually. DLAC, VAPA, Career Tech, RCTA, Rep Consul, and Neighbors Better Together were all meetings I participated in. However, the most significant event over the past two weeks was Arlington's WASP accreditation visit. I honor the WASP, uh, the Arlington staff and the Arlington student body and community by wearing their masks today. I commend the Arlington staff for taking the self-study process so seriously. To conduct a virtual WASP review is just mind-boggling to me. Great job, Arlington. The most satisfying activity uh, of the last two weeks was reading across America. Thank you to Castleview's Mrs. Clark and her sixth grade class. You made my day better. Finally, I also give kudos to Assistant Superintendent Walker as uh, his selection for the Riverside County Certificate Administrator of the Year. Although many of us, as, uh, as Superintendent Hanson uh, had, were great words to say about Mr. Walker. His wife, who knows him the best, said it so well the other day. Simply, she said, he just loves what he does. 
and Mr. Walker really does love his work. We appreciate you, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Kinnear, thank you for all your dedication, too, and I, I envy you having the time to go to see those things. I look forward to it. And now to our dean of the, on the board, uh, Trustee Kathy Allaby. Thank you, and I'll add my uh, thanks to and congratulations to Mr. Walker. What a wonderful honor and a, a wonderful reflection on all the work that he's done all these years. Um, and so, uh, ditto for all your good uh, things you've said, Mr. Kinnear. Um, today, I received a letter from a parent who said, I don't understand why we're bothering to go back to school for one day a week. Um, and she had a lot of good points. I mean, where there's not very much time left in the school year and what good is one day and so forth and so on. And at the same time today, I received five letters, painful letters from students and parents about what is going on in their lives in terms of depression and alienation and not, not feeling a part of things and not feeling connected to school or people. And I have to say that I err on the side that one day a week is better than nothing. And that one day a week is all we can do right now. That is all we can do right now. But we will work hard to go get more days as things in our county improve health-wise. And they are improving. So I ask parents who are frustrated, I ask students who are frustrated that, that this one day a week is not enough, that it's a start and that we are moving in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction health-wise and school-wise. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alibi, for that insightful. Thank you very much. I go to now the clerk of the board, Dr. Angelo Peru. Thank you, President Hunt. I just want to begin by just expressing my deep appreciation for our students, our employees, and our, our families. Uh, one, just as a community for us driving down uh, the, the, the number of cases of COVID so that our environment can be safer to start beginning getting back to in the classroom. And just for, again, for everybody's resiliency in helping us uh, get to this point and to continue on forward. Uh, I also wanna acknowledge, you know, uh, just a appreciation for our student board member and just his thoughtfulness uh, of his engagement and his voice on behalf of all of our students. Uh, Micah Daly White, thank you so much for um, joining us now on the dais here. Uh, I also want to express my uh, echo for my colleagues, the appreciation of our assistant superintendent Tim Walker for his county administrative recognition. Um, I, I don't remember the exact number when he told me, but I don't think he's taken a day off. And how, how do you know? The, uh, a long time is, is the only metric we can use, but um, to, I think. It's extraordinary to get those kinds of recognitions during the environment of the pandemic and everything we're operating in. It's a real um, uh, representation of just um, of that kind of uh, achievement, even un under normal circumstances. Uh, one piece of good news that I, I think we all can hopefully appreciate is I, I'm pleased to share that one of our uh, Polly, uh, RUSD alums, uh, Polly graduate from 1986. Um, my, a friend of mine, Dr. David Hernandez, he uh, was honored by the Veterans of Foreign Affair, of Foreign Wars of the United States National Firefighter of the Year. He's a lifelong Riverside resident and uh, the VFW, Veterans of Foreign uh, Wars, uh, recognized him for his a quote unquote exceptional record of exemplary and courageous service to the community and the nation. So I think, uh, you know, again, given all of the challenging circumstances we're dealing with, this is a, a great opportunity to feel proud that a lifelong Riversider a school district alum uh, who's uh, a, a first responder is being recognized at a national level. So I hope, um, I, I spoke with our president uh, Tom Hunt, that you know, there's an opportunity for our district to recognize th that as well, and I look forward to coordinating that uh, with Dr. Hanson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peru, for bringing that forward. As I'm sure our archivist uh, spoke would, would attest, there have been some amazing people that have gone through this district. It's high time we start recognizing them more, and this is certainly one we can begin with. And congratulations to the Bears. 
So uh, it's my turn. Uh, let me just say a few things. We've talked about Tim Walker and enough's been said. Uh, I have no idea why you don't give him a day off, David, but th thank you for doing that because he's done a, a stellar job in preparing us to go back to campus and check in everything. Uh, Riverside Press Enterprise. Uh, you heard um, Chloe Christensen call in a little earlier, young lady. Uh, Riverside Press Enterprise, uh, I guess we can see this. Uh, yesterday's paper uh, announced King High wins, they should say Martin Luther King High, uh, wins Riverside County mock trial. And just quickly, and Chloe was the lead prosecutor. I remind you, she was a sophomore. She was the lead prosecutor. She told me today that her goal is to, uh, after she finishes her bachelor's, that to, and she's already working in a law firm, uh, that she will take the bar exam and be the first person to ever be admitted into the, to, uh, to be an attorney without having to go to law school. Good for you, Chloe. I'm, kind of thinking you, you will be able to do that. Let me quickly just say this is the third time that Martin Luther King High School has won the Riverside County mock trial uh, uh, competition. It was in 2018. Um, there are many districts uh, that have been involved. Uh, last year, and I have to mention them too, Poly High School in Riverside won it, and that was for the 19th time. So uh, with our high schools being involved in that, we can be very proud of our young people and how they compete in the county and now uh, Martin Luther King High School mock trial and Chloe and her, her uh, colleagues will be going on to the state finals, which is interesting too. Uh, today's newspaper, uh, and this is again one board member's opinion, today's newspaper had a, uh, an editorial that, that says Newsom sells out students to placate unions. All right, I'm not gonna argue one way or the other how this, these uh, editors in Orange County feel about our governor and all of that and the, the CTA and all of that. But I want to share with you as fellow Riversiders from my heart that uh, this is not the Riverside City Teachers Association and the way that they conduct themselves. They are collaborative uh, in everything in my time on the board, including professional growth. They have been very involved in this. Everything has to be negotiated by law. And the, just to give you an example, how collaborative, the MOU that the district struck with them, not too far after, I think a week or so, after the closure on March 13th last year, was so well received that finally LA Unified at an impasse with their teachers said, oh, what the heck, let's try this, and they used it. So no one size doesn't fit all. These teachers, many of them personal friends and neighbors, and uh, they're very dedicated, as are people like Cindy Mendoza Collins, who works the front office for attendance at Ramona, and all of her colleagues out there. And uh, I want to assure you, this district is under Dr. Hansen's leadership, is working collaboratively. And when you read that, again, uh, used to be growing up, the Press Enterprise owned by the Hayes family, was pretty much centered on our community. Now, times have changed, and they cover the entire region. But that is not Riverside's school teachers, uh, nor their union. And uh, there needs to be a clearer voice across the state. But, uh, but thank you. I want to commend our, our staff and where we're going in tonight's meeting. And we'll move forward now. Pre President, 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 oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, uh, Trustee Lee never had a chance to get board I missed Trustee Lee, didn't I? <laughs> it's OK, Mr. Hunter, forget I was doing so well there. <laughs> I was doing so well. We were just so excited to talk about yeah. Martin King High School. Well, you know what, it, it, that's what it is, and it, I guess it's a habit that presidents sometimes ignore their vice presidents, and I certainly don't want to be among, <laughs> among those national leaders that did. So, sir, Maybe Mr. Lee, I'm listening with open ears. You're just saving the best for last, I think, Mr. Hunt. Oh. Well, um, I, did, I did have a, as we work this new technology as we're back, I did have a question. I'm sure Dr. Hansen will mention it in one of his reports, um, but when we were giving the COVID update, and talking about the return back to school, I just want to cl clarify uh, for folks that are listening that it's just for in-person. If you chose virtual or homeschool, the, those time frames do not, or the schedules do not apply to your students. That is correct, Trustee Lee. Just for the families, we had 60% who chose in-person. The other 40% will continue in the virtual program or the home study program. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thanks, thanks for that clarification. I also wanted to commend uh, Martin Luther King and their mock trial team for their, their victory in the Riverside County mock trial competition. Uh, that is an event 
that I look to every year to attend in person. It's fun to see the talented uh, students who participate in that in all of our campuses. So my hat's off to Martin Luther King and best of luck in state. Um, I also was able to participate in Read Across America this week and it was a highlight um, as it was for Mr. Kinnear and I visited Mr. Caruso's TK kindergarten class at Longfellow Elementary and uh, God bless Mr. Caruso and his ability to navigate a TK kinder class uh, through distance learning. Um, I joined their Google class to just tons of noise coming out of my speakers um, as they were singing Jack Johnson's uh, We Just Want to Be Friends song, uh, which has references of going back to school. So clearly Mr. Caruso was finding a creative way to get his kids excited about school and the things to look forward to when you get back in person, uh, even if it's just one day a week. So that was really fun to hear them sing. And I got to actually hear it twice because Mr. Caruso didn't see that I was on the call. So he said, let's sing it again. So I got to hear that song twice and it was lots of fun. Um, but we read uh, The Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is one of my kids' favorite. Uh, and they all had a, a fun time listening to it. So it was fun that we still got to do it. And I hope that we can do that program in person next year. Um, I also want to commend Mr. Walker and his recognition. I'd say long overdue. He's been doing amazing work uh, I'm sure, as Mr. Hansen said, through all the district he's worked, but since I've known him for the last eight or nine years on the board, uh, and I would even one up Mr. Hunt's comment about Wikipedia, because sometimes Wikipedia is wrong, and I don't think Mr. Walker <laughs> is ever, ever wrong. Uh, so congratulations to Mr. Walker. Uh, and uh, also welcome uh, Mr. Daly White. I'm glad you're here. I know we've, we've got to interact quite a few times, uh, so I'm glad that you're gonna be a fixture on this dais through the end of the school year. Uh, so thank you for your efforts that you've already uh, endeavored with your fellow trustees and your fellow colleagues at Ramona throughout the school district as we plan for uh, what the graduation ceremonies and senior activities will look like for the end of the year. So thank you. Um, last, I just wanted to welcome back our staff and our teachers this week who are at our school sites. Uh, we look forward to welcoming back our students next week. Uh, I think we're ready. Our sites are prepared and we have been. Uh, we've been following the guidance from the CDC and the county health, and I believe that we are prepared, ready, and we can do so safely. Uh, it was shared with me that uh, next week will be like the first day of kindergarten for everybody. So with that in mind, I ask everybody for your grace and your patience as we, wa as we walk through the cobwebs of our school sites, figurative cobwebs, not literal cobwebs, uh, and navigate in-person learning since our district shut down more than a year ago. Uh, I know that we can do this, but it, it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, so we just need parents and, and community members to, to be patient with us and work with us through these challenges. Uh, I'm grateful to everyone in this district, especially our em employees for their contributions thus far to get us back uh, to this return. Uh, and I'm grateful to our, our community, as Dr. Farouk alluded to, for for following those guidelines so these numbers come down to a place where we can at least get our primary kids back to school. Um, I believe that kids learn best in school. I know my kids and their friends learn best in school, so I'm glad that they're gonna be back. Uh, and I know that it's frustrating that it's only one day a week, but we can't get to two days a week until we do one day a week, and we can't get to five days a week until we do two days a week. Um, so I know lots of things have to happen uh, as we progress through the different phases. Um, and that a lot of those restrictions are, are beyond our control uh, on how soon we can get back to where we all wanna be, which is every day. Um, but I look forward to the day that we do do so safely and I'm grateful for all the efforts on behalf of everybody in this room and throughout this district uh, to make next week uh, a reality for our students. So thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee, and look how that worked out. It was a better wrap up than I gave you for certain. And I appreciate that. And, and Friend, I got to tell you, for my generation, Wikipedia is like unbelievable. So I, I come from the eight track generation. So I would say, Mr. Walker, that you are the Encyclopedia Britannica of all of that, but no one at home is going to know what that means. So we'll go from there. So, Ms. Frosto, thank you. We're going to open the queue, if you would, Ms. Frosto, for J1, and I'll let you help the folks uh, understand about that. Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for item J1. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on agenda item J1, an update on the return to in-person plan for the 2020-2021 school year, 
You may now enter the queue by using the raise hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item J1 until that item begins. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the J1 is the Board of Education will be provided with an update on the return in, in, to in-person plan for the 2021 school year. Uh, responsible cabinet member we will hear from is Dr. Ryan Lewis, our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. And uh, we'll now move forward. Dr. Lewis, the microphone is yours, sir. Good evening, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, Board of Trustees. It is my pleasure this evening to bring our return to in-person report with some exciting news and dates for our families. But before I start, uh, Mr. Lee, you sparked a few reminders that I'd like to start with just to remind the audience. So number one, the return to in-person report only does apply to those families that have selected the in-person option. If you have selected the virtual option or you are at Summit View, the home-based option, this report and dates, they do not apply to you. They'll stay in your current settings and your school days will continue. If you selected the in-person report or in-person option, this report is for you. So a few reminders. We have a phased return. That phased return was created by a group of stakeholders that include parents, it included teachers, students, staff members, administrators, community members. That was one of our six action teams. And what they developed was a phased return that started with what we call phase two. And that's what you're gonna hear about this evening, which is one day a week. Again, we have our in-person students in two groups, a group A and a group B that I'll explain later, and they'll return one day a week for a two week period. That's our transition. That's getting back into the routines, that's getting back into the classroom, teachers working with our students. And then we look to move to phase three. And again, you'll hear more in the report, but just as a quick review, phase three is two days a week. So group A will be on campus Monday and Tuesday in person. Wednesday will be a distance learning day. And then group B will be in person Thursday and Friday. So if you're at home and you're wondering, or you may need to look up again what group your student or child is in, you can open up your Aries parent portal. And in there, it will list your children and their associated group. So you can make sure your school's on the correct day. Once we move through phase three, we do have a phase four plan, which is our five day a week return when health conditions allow. And again, that will be following health conditions. And then at last, we have a phase five. And our phase five return, again, is a five day return without restrictions. So that's the model we'll be following as the return. And tonight we're gonna talk about C and free. So if we could put up the slide deck, please. Thank you, next slide. So just as we get ready to talk about phase two, just a, a quick reminder for our families as you gear up for Tuesday return, all of those regular school supplies that you bring are backpacks, you'll have your Chromebook, you'll have textbooks, you'll have your water bottle, all of those things, go ahead and store those in those backpacks like normal. When you arrive at school, you'll go through the screening process. The teacher will work with you on where to store your supplies. It will look different because we will not have students sharing supplies but all the teachers will have that taken care of, but you can get the backpacks ready and get ready to return to school. The next slide we'll talk about the time frame. So right now we are beginning phase two, which is PK through sixth grade, will return one day a week, and that will begin on March 9th. Again, that is group A will be at school on Tuesday, group B will be at school in person on Thursday. We will follow that schedule for two weeks, then we will be off for spring break, and when we return on March 29th, we will return in phase three. In phase three, the difference is now we'll bring back our preschoolers. So you'll notice it's now pre-K through sixth grade, and that is the two day a week program. Monday and Tuesday, group A. Wednesday is a distance learning day where we'll be providing the deep cleaning, getting school ready for the next group. And then Thursday and Friday and a full day, group B will be returning to campus. So now we'll give a schedule overview, just as a quick reminder. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So when we've talked about the groups, this is what it looks like in a, in a pictorial representation. 
on Monday in phase two, all students will be distance learning. That's currently what we're doing now if you're in the first in-person program. On Tuesday, we will have group A returning in person. Group B will have a morning check-in from 8 to 8.40 with our teacher via distance learning. And then they'll be working on independent or asynchronous activities the remainder of the day. On Wednesday, all students will be at home via distance learning, engaging with their teacher. And then on Thursday, group B will return to school in person at 9.15. And group A, again, will have that 40 minute check-in with the teacher in the morning. And then they'll be working independently throughout the rest of the day. And then on Friday, all students again will be back in distance learning. Again, this is phase two. Next slide, please. So for our special day classes in mild to moderate in elementary, they're currently attending Thursday and Friday, two days a week. This will continue. The major difference is they will begin school at 9.15 in the morning on Thursday and Friday, and all that information has been shared with those families and teachers. The next slide, we'll talk about our moderate to severe classes. And as of now, this is the schedule following for phase two, Monday and Tuesday, all students on a shortened schedule, and the same for Thursday and Friday on a shortened schedule. And this is the same thing as we have in our small cohorts that we're providing right now. While we're also in phase two, while we primarily talk about elementary students returning, there are current middle and high school students in moderate and severe classes that have returned in phase two. So just a reminder of the schedule that they're following on our campuses currently. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our students that are in moderate to severe classrooms on our uh, middle school and high school campuses are attending uh, the times that you see on Monday and Tuesday in person, and then they are in distance learning the remainder of the week. And that will continue while we welcome back our elementary students in phase two. Next slide, please. And again, we will follow that schedule for two weeks. When we return from spring break on the 29th, we will move into phase three. And phase three now is that two day a week schedule. So on Monday and Tuesday, group A will be at school all day, full day of instruction, 9.15 to 2.15 on campus if they've selected in person. Group B will have that same check-in with their teacher, setting the expectations for the day, reviewing the work the students will be completing, and then students will be working independently on uh, the assignments that were provided for the rest of the day. Wednesday will remain distance learning. All students are at home checking in with their teacher via their device. And then on Thursday and Friday, now group B will return to school in person while group A has their morning check-in with their teacher and then the rest of the day they are working independently. Again, March 29th. Mild to moderate special day classes now will be attending four days per week when we enter phase three. And this is again as our action team proposed, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, they will be on campus four days per week following our uh, action team recommendations. Then the next slide from moderate to severe special day classes. On the next, there you go, thank you. Again, four days per week. And we'll continue to expand that with Wednesday being our distance learning day. That takes us through elementary phase two and phase three return as scheduled. So I'll pause before I set the stage for secondary and see if there are any questions or anything I can clarify. Well, Lewis, please proceed. I'm sure they will have some after public comment. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, sir. So the secondary school return, you heard Mr. Walker speak to the three metrics that we will need to meet for our secondary return. Two of the three we have already met in our county. The one we are waiting for is the adjusted case rate to get below seven. On the next slide, you'll see a graphic that talks about this. And as we talk, we anticipate that next Tuesday, if our adjusted case rate is below seven, then we will move forward with returning our seventh through 12th graders in phase three as our plan. If for some reason that metric is not hit next Tuesday, then those dates will be adjusted accordingly. On the next slide, the assumption for the purpose of tonight that we, uh, when this was created, it wasn't March 2nd yet, we did not quite hit the number on March 2nd, so we're waiting on March 9th. If we hit those three indicators on March 9th, if you follow down, then our secondary students in grades seven through 12 
will be returning to campus again in a phase three group A, group B model that we spoke of starting on March 29th. Next slide, please. So knowing this is a lot of information, two things are, are planned for you. One, on March 18th, we'll be bringing back the secondary report with secondary schedules for grades seven through 12 and walking you through in detail, similarly to what we did for elementary earlier this evening. To continue to give the community updates and parents, previous slide, please. Thank you. Dr. Perez and her team are leading the work around communicating efforts. Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, I'm hopeful as well that by March 9th, we'll have met that metric of seven or less. Um, however, should we not, how would the schedule change if it's another week? Is that, it, with, I know we have spring break in there, so is that gonna impact at all, or do we still have a chance of coming back after that, or would it push back? Dr. Hanson? So if I can jump in here, Trustee Lee. In our memorandum of understanding with our secondary teachers, it states that on the Tuesday, because that's when they, uh, they officially show the adjusted rate, on the Tuesday that it shows we get eight or below, teachers come back the very next Monday. And so when we hit eight or below, those teachers are gonna come back. If it happens before spring break, great. If it happens during spring break, they're back the next week. When we hit below seven, then the students come back the next Monday. And so if you if you take that timeline, just pull it out every Tuesday, we look at that, that, kick, that kicks it into gear for when the teachers return and when the students return. But students and teachers wouldn't return the same day. The teachers come when it's less than eight, the students come when it's less than seven. So right, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I know there's just a lot of what ifs, but I'm saying what happens if on the if on the ninth we don't hit eight even, and then the next week we hit less than seven. So both numbers are met in the same week. So but the we're on spring break. So the teachers would come back the week before the students. That's according to the MOU currently right now. Uh, how would we contact those students if it's if as Mr. Trustee Lee talked about, if we hit it during spring break or, or and if the kids are on spring break somewhere, we're going to use it. But will they have a week's notice or just uh, that day's notice? Yeah, we have a whole communications plan under the leadership of Dr. Prez. It's all prepared. It will go out just as, uh, just as normal. We'll let the families know exactly what they need to do. And the high school principals, the middle school principals are all very aware of what needs to happen as well. Everybody's prepared. Yes. Thank we you, Dr. Prez. Prepared. Please, Dr. Lewis. Oh, I have a question from our our student board member, uh, Mike Dilly White. Yes, hello. Hello, sir. Um, this is a quick question from one of my fellow senior friends. When we return back to school, will we have three classes a day or the full schedule? Great question. So I'll spend a lot of time on the schedules on the 18th, but just as a quick answer, the same block we are in, the block schedule is the same schedule we will be following for the remainder of the year. So three, three classes a day, Monday one, three, five, Tuesday two, four, six. You're welcome. We could return to the presentation, please. Thank you. So to help with this information, as we've talked about, it is ever changing. And there's a lot that we are working uh, diligently to inform our community, keep our teachers, parents, students in the same communication as it changes under Dr. Perez's leadership. So a few things, number one, community updates. There will be a message system sent home every Monday night with important information for the week. So families, you can expect that message, be looking for it Monday night that will be coming home on a regular schedule. As well as our in-person guide with all of our schedules and procedures and um, safety measures that we're taking and, and health screening procedures, what to expect when you return meal preparation, all of that is the in-person guide that has also been sent to all of our families. If for some reason you need to find them, all of these are listed under the Return to School 2021 on the banner page of our website. And then last, our Return to School videos. These have been sent home to all of our families. In addition, we know we have principals sending them home to their communities. We have teachers sending them home to their students and their families of what to return. So just again, to help students become familiar 
with what to expect when they come back to campus. Next slide, please. So the other part of return to in-person is how we are handing co-curricular activities. So tonight I'd like to provide you an update with visual and performing arts and also athletics. Next slide, please. So number one, under visual and performing arts, the acronym is VAPA. The Riverside County guidance, we have worked closely with Mr. Walker and his team to make sure that we are following those health and safety conditions as set forth by, as, as set forth by public health. So number one, guidance does permit marching band, choir, dance, color guard, and performing arts to begin returning to campus activities. On the top right, that has come with a guidance of cohorts. So if you remember back when we phased back athletics, we phased back into cohorts and then we expanded those cohorts, it's the same model. We'll bring back our visual and performing arts into a cohort of 16 or less, and then we will monitor that and expand as permitted. They are only permitted right now, as of tonight, to be outdoors only. Face coverings are required, as well as social distancing. On the bottom left, we've received a lot of questions regarding band. Unfortunately, at this time, per the county guidance, we are not permitted to play wind or brass instruments. We will continue to monitor this. It has to do with um, the exposure and the aerosol that are associated with those instruments. As this changes, we will definitely bring back information. I would like to thank all of our band directors. They are currently working on another proposal with additional PPEs that we do look forward to exploring down the road. So that will continue to occur. In the bottom right, as a, as another change, choir singing is permitted, and they are permitted to be outdoors with social distancing. This information was sent home this week, and our visual and performing arts activities will begin as soon as next Monday to get students back on, back on campus and participate. The next slide. Again, I will preface all of my comments with as of this evening. This is ever changing and it is, uh, it is ever changing. So athletics, from the last update I had provided, we have had quite a few things change. So I'm gonna try to summarize those for you. So number one, uh, by California Department of Public Health and Riverside County Department of Public Health, in partnership with CIF, which is the governing body of athletics in the state of California, there have been some changes. So number one, we had to meet the metric of 14 or below for our adjusted case rate. When we met that metric, we were able to return to athletic competition. The good news is, as you heard, we hit that metric. So this has already begun to get underway with all the correct procedures now that we are at 11.3. So what that means is on the far left of your screen, all of the sports listed in purple are permitted to be played and they were currently being played under the old guidance. When the metric was changed to 14 or below, what that allowed to happen is brought in the red tier and orange tier sports to be played once we hit a metric of 14. Since that has been hit, what you will see is that spring sports, softball and baseball are permitted to begin, as well as fall, we have uh, sideline cheer, which is currently uh, with Dr. Kaiser being reviewed, as well as the orange tier, where we have football, water polo, lacrosse, and soccer. The only main difference is with football and water polo, Department of Public Health added a nuance and that nuance requires those athletes to be tested and they have to be t tested and provided within 24 hours of that competition and that's something that under uh, Mr. Walker and the rest of the team and working with our assistant principals of athletics they've set up those routines and begin as early as today with our water polo, water polo players. Yes Mr. Hunt. Uh, Trustee Kathy Allaby, thank you. Absolutely. Yes ma'am. Thank you. I I'm just curious how we are going to fit all these different sports on all those these fields and how, I mean, uh, you've got all of them going at once and normally we would have them in different seasons. So I just wondered how it's all going to fit in. I'm smiling under my mask. Uh, Mrs. Alavi, that is, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of our high schools. It's a challenge for our coaches, our parents, our students and our assistant principals of athletics and the administrative teams. To this point, uh, I do have to give them all of the recognition. They are finding a way to do it. They are maximizing some space on our middle school campuses where they have grass areas and they're having uh, different levels practice in different places. And as of, as of now, we are finding a way to manage that with pool time and with 
uh, court time that we are making now on the grass and moving certain sports. Uh, as we continue down this road, it could continue to be a challenge, but we will work with all of our coaches and our parents and our teams, and I'm confident they will find a way to help our athletes. Thank you, Trustee Allen. Oh, we have, I have a, also a question, if you would, from uh, Trustee Dale Kinnear. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Lewis, I'm glad that, uh, that sports are back. Uh, however, I worry about the, the band and arts in general. Uh, you know, sports, have, as you said, they have uh, CIF as a statewide organization communicating with the governor and the legislature at the state level. They have a, a ton of support. And, you know, our arts people, you know, just turn to, to, with our support, turn to local health officials. And, you know, some of it doesn't really fit in, in my brain, although I'm not a health official. Um, you know, here are some questions I have. You know, contact sports are starting with plans to play games. They aren't required to be in small cohorts. Why is VAPA required to be in a small co cohort? And, and I know that's not for us to answer, so I'm not asking for an answer from, uh, from you, Dr. Lewis, but I guess I am interested in what, what the answer is from, uh, from our local health officials. You know, a, a VAPA rehearsal uh, seems safer than football to me. Um, and don't get me wrong, I support football, but VAP, VAPA seems safer. You know, VAPA can be outdoors, social distance, they wear masks, and they, and they use those bell covers that I know very little about, but our band directors uh, talk about them. You know, band directors quote, and you've heard all this, uh, they quote research uh, on reducing transmission by using these bell covers. Uh, shouldn't our local health officials be considering that. And then lastly, I'm wondering if we as a district can uh, facilitate our VAPA leaders, along with maybe VAPA people from other districts in Riverside County, to have an opportunity to talk about their concerns directly with county health officials, just at, like athletic directors and coaches have done with state governors. So I, there's no answer that I'm asking from, uh, from you, but I guess I'd like to see if we can pursue that uh, even more aggressively. Uh, thank you, Trustee Kinnear. The, the one response I would give is I do want to recognize all of our VAPA leaders district-wide. They have done a phenomenal job, as you mentioned, being prepared with all of the different components and the research, and they are currently working on another proposal uh, as a team that we can take back to the county. So I made notes of what you've mentioned, and we will work, we will work through that process to support them as well and implement some of the ideas that we spoke about. Somebody has another question for you, if you would, sir. Yeah, on, uh, on these updates through sports and uh, the, the nuances that are, are now gonna allow uh, sports like football and water polo to progress, uh, but with weekly testing. So there, obviously there's a cost to that testing. I assume that, that that's paid for by our district. And does that, is that budgeted in our um, CARES Act funds or how, how, is that, how does that affect our budget? I would have to defer to Mr. Walker on the nuance because we do have a partner that is helping us with that. And I know there was conversation regarding cost and how to offset. So there was not a cost to the district. Thank you. Okay, if we could put up the final slide, I would appreciate it. One more, please. The summary slide. Thank you. So just as a review, uh, why all of our athletes are back, they are still expected to wear face coverings to the extent possible. That has also involved all uh, coaches, all, everyone on the sideline who is not in the contest and things of that nature. Every athlete, the guidance is now clear. It is two adults. Uh, per athlete that will be allowed to be there and observe. Uh, they are again expected to social distance outside of their stable cohort as a family. And again, wear social, um, wear facial masks, et cetera. Uh, one team per cohort. What that point is, our athletes who are used to playing multiple sports, uh, Mrs. Alavis, you spoke about all at one season, uh, our athletes have to pick one sport. They are only allowed to be in one sport so we don't have cross cohorts. Uh, bottom left, we talked about testing. The top right, we talked about what allowed us to be here with 14 per 100,000. And then in the bottom, uh, bottom, the guidance for indoor activities is still ongoing. Uh, when I said it's as of tonight, 
there is still talk about what is happening with indoor sports and how to proceed forward. So I will bring you updates as they're made available. And that does conclude the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And I know we're going to take some, uh, some public comments. And uh, Dr. Hansen, do you have a question? Yes, sir, Dr. Hansen, please. Yeah, I think I gave some mis misinformation out to Trustee Lee's question. So I'd like to invite our human resource assistant superintendent, uh, Kylie Barr, to the podium to answer your question about if we hit seven during spring break, what happens? And so, Missy Barr, would you please come to the podium? Thank and you, I, Dr. I apologize for the misinformation, Trustee Lee. Sorry, I thought we were on, but we were not. So the metric that I'm going to go in and explain a little bit of what Dr. Henson spoke to, but I'm going to address your question, Julie, and if I don't address it directly, restate it for me so that I can. But the MOU doesn't define when the students return. The MOU re defines when the staff return. The MOU states that it's a metric of a plus one to whatever the governor's metric for return is. So currently the governor's metric for our secondary students is below eight. So that would have our staff, if we hit nine, let's say, our staff, if we're or 8.5 for the sake of it, because we've been hitting 11.3, so all different numbers. So if we hit that metric of a one plus, our staff returns. And then what we've always said is we commit that our staff returns the Monday, the following Monday, and then our students return once we hit the state metric or the governor's metric that has been defined. So it's really based on the metric. And we did that because if the metric changes, we wanted to be able to return staff prior to the students coming. So the MOU doesn't define the kids, it defines the actual when the staff can. So, uh, no, I think that makes sense. Okay. But I think just to give an example, so in the event that we uh, do not hit the number by the next Tuesday, so that would take us into the following, waiting for the following Tuesday, which happens to be spring break. Correct. Right. So if we hit it while we were on spring break, then the teachers would return the following Monday. Correct. So the, the week after spring break. The but 29th. But students would not come back till the following week. That is, that. that is the commitment we so have it would made, push, but it would, could they? Right, so we just push our, our time frame back one week if we don't hit the number before spring break. Correct. Okay, thank you. Carl, thank you, Assistant Superintendent. Would you take a question, please, from Dr. Brewer? Sure. Uh, it's just a very minor clarification. Um, the secondary uh, state metric is, uh, is seven, right? Under seven, not, not under eight, as, as you mentioned before. It is. Seven, so it's anything under, but it can be like seven point, Walker, it can be seven, seven point or less. five, right, right. seven point, it, anything under eight, so seven point oh, five. Oh, it's, seven it's under eight. Seven or less. Hmm? Sorry, okay. excuse me. Okay, I just wanted to make sure there was no confusion. Wait, my mic's on. I would like to remind all the speakers, I, I don't have a problem with it because I do boom, but wearing mask and uh, for the folks at home in particular, even for some of us older ones sitting up here, please uh, broadcast a little more than you might normally at home, all right? And appreciate it. So now we'll, uh, you, are you done, Shamar, if I cut you off? If, nope, as long as my questions, the questions Dr. Hansen, answered. did she properly answer your question and correct your mistake? Yes, all right, Chief. Okay, for that then, uh, I'm gonna go to Ms. Frosto and ask if we have uh, speakers, uh, Public comments coming in on regarding item J1. Ms. Frosto. Yes. And to make note, we the uh, queue is now closed. And we will go ahead and have our in-person speakers first, followed by the Zoom. So our first in-person speaker is Anna Garcia. Thank you. Ms. Garcia, welcome. There you go. This one? No, turn, no. That was my mistake. There we go. Pull down the mic. There oh, you okay. go. It's yours. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I would just like to suggest, almost plead pretty much for the school to push to open um, five days a week for our elementary and follow with middle school and high school. Um, and now even with sports being um, able to do their activities. Sorry, I'm all over the place. <laughs> so I hear a lot about um, 
the CDC, following the CDC guidelines. And I read on the CDC website on school should be the last to close and the first to reopen up as quickly as possible. And, um, and it seems like that hasn't been the case. It seems that everything is opening and everything is going back to as normal as possible, of course, with safety precautions, except our public schools. Um, so uh, for that, I don't, that it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and ev I feel that even one day is, it's not enough. Uh, and then asking the kids to take their Chromebooks to school, it seems like more of a distraction really and an interruption in their week, more than the, a year of interruption of education. Now we're here, go back to school one day, bring your Chromebooks and, and they're little, these are little kids who are, haven't seen their friends in a year and you're sending them back to school and you want them to focus on what? They're excited to see their friends really. Um, so, and then asking the teachers on the days that, let's say, um, for Tuesday, group A goes back to class and then teachers for the first almost hour have to be um, getting the kids at home to start on their work. And then here's the rest of the day, pretty much on your own, unless the teacher, I'm sure will have the ability to check in on them every once in a while. I don't, that's asking the teachers also to do a lot more um, when I don't feel that it's necessary. Again, sports are starting up again. I don't think there's a limit on how many days, and I've been in sports, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been in sports. It takes more than one day of training a week, right? To be good. And if they're allowed to be there more than one day, why can't our kids be in their schools for more than one day? I don't know why it was, or who agreed on the one day. I hear that it was parents and community and stakeholders I know I wasn't asked, and I know a lot of parents who are who are pushing for five days. Um, but I lost my train of thought. Um, it's oh, so sorry. I just lost my train of thought, and my time's up. But um, thank you. Um, it, okay, it's just I don't know if our who chose the one day, right? But. Um, no, it's not coming out. I'm so sorry. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, and that's in the aspects of going back to school. I know that, at least in the school that my kids go to, which is Pachap Elementary, they are at 70% uh, of the community is below poverty level, which means most parents have, um, or most households have two people working. Um, and it's, it's some, for a lot of them, it's out of the question to do the one day. A lot of them are leaving their kids alone every day of the week. Um, and so it seems, it's a struggle, it's a struggle. And I feel that we aren't fighting enough for our kids. I see um, uh, school districts, neighboring school districts who are, who just started this week and they're at four days automatically, I don't know if we didn't ask the county for four days to approve for four days because we were just wanting to be assured that they would give us the green light on just getting back into the school. But our USD is more than prepared, has all the PPE requirements. So I think we're ready and I think for the, we're really behind and for our kids to get back on track, it's the five days that they need. Also, Garcia, and we, oh, go ahead. One last thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard that phase four didn't want to be shared, but phase four includes what we would need in order to get back to five days. As a parent, and I would like to ask what that, those requirements are. My kid's education has pretty much been put on hold for a year, and I would like to be able to make a, a, um, an educated decision on whether I will be enrolling my kids in private school or not next year, which I really hope not because I'm a product of RUSD like many of you are um, since 1995 to 2009 when I graduated. And I would love my kids to have that same opportunity. We would too, Ms. Garcia. Thank, Thank you. you. And we, we empathize. I empathize personally. I met both my wife and I when our girls were in school worked and it would have been tough. Dr. Rue comes from a single parent 
handling everything kind of family, so we understand. I wonder though if, um, those are good questions, probably a lot of the ones being asked out there. So Dr. Hansen, could you just help me with who decided on, for us, who dictates one day a week versus, and our other districts that we know of, public ones going to four days? Go ahead, sir. Well, cur currently the uh, California Department of Public Health is who sits the, sets the criteria. And the biggest criteria here that is the challenge is the social distancing. It's the six feet. And uh, until they remove that criteria, it'll be very difficult for us to get to phase four, where we have all kids back in the classroom. We cannot meet that social distancing. So until they remove that, we need to stay on this hybrid model. And you heard, uh, you heard Dr. Lewis said, we're gonna come back for one day a week for two weeks, and then two days a week for two weeks. Social distancing, group A and B. We can't go any further until the California Department of Public Health removes that. Now you do have neighboring districts that uh, brought their kids back this last week for four days a week, two hours a day. They have a morning session, a deep clean, and then an afternoon session. And that's where they're gonna stay. When we get to uh, our two days a week, full days, all day, you know, our kids will be in seats more than the neighboring district who's four days a week for two hours a day. So every district negotiates with their associations, they work with the school board, they do it a little bit differently. And uh, come March the 29th, we'll be the only district in our county that's pre-K through 12th grade, two days a week. Um, many of my colleagues that I talk to regularly here at Corona Norco, they're still working on a plan to bring back their high school kids. They've not quite figured that plan out yet. And if they do bring them back, they're not gonna do it until that mid-April range. And so we're all very different. We have different needs. We work with our association. And this is a plan we put in place back in the fall, like we talked about. Uh, one thing that Dr. Lewis mentioned, we had parents and students and experts in that. We had like 275 community folks, doctors, experts to help us put this plan together. We feel very good about, about the plan we put together. And so we're gonna open school that way with phase two that you heard right now, move into phase three, and then we have to wait for the California Department of Public Health remove the social distancing before we can bring all of our kids back five days a week. Just a little bit with you and we, you know, what you bring up is very important to the board because we've talked about this uh, with Dr. Hansen and his staff that uh, we need to be able to explain, you know, we've been living like this for 140 years. You went to school like this, your kids, your grandparents. So we've got to explain how this works and it is basically I'll say local control doesn't exist. We're being controlled by everything else and, and even though stores are opening back up and all we're publicly funded so we have to go that way but thank you for your questions and i i uh, and i give credit thank you and uh, miss frosto we have some other speakers thank, thank you, you miss garcia and i think there's people here that could help you if you dr lewis can chat with uh, miss garcia that'd be good miss frosto yes our next speaker is alexander horsepool in person Thank you, Bob. Keeping it safe, right? Hello, sir. P please repeat your name. I didn't quite get it. Come on. Thank you. Yes, sir. It, it, they'll turn it on for you. There you go. Like Pull the mic up so he comes to your little taller. And there we go, young man. Good evening, everyone. My name is AJ Horsepool, and I'm the student body president here at our John W. North High School. Uh, just a quick shout out to Lexi Blair for being our rep to the board. She does an amazing job and everybody at North Trail is just great work. I just have some quick concerns about all these plans that are coming out from the district. I noticed how all these phases don't really attribute or account for us having a graduation in person. I know that our schools have a lot of things set for uh, more of a drive through graduation at the moment because graduation is tentative. But with all these plans coming out and bringing kids back, graduation depends on our case numbers and case rates. and going perfectly, I hope that our numbers continue to go down, but as we bring kids back, we still run that risk of our numbers going up. And as a senior, I would rather just stick out these past, or these next two months online to increase my chances of having in-person gradu graduation, rather than going back into person for a couple days a week, and then the, our numbers going up, and then we are stuck with the drive-through. And honestly, my goal right now is to just finish out, have a good graduation, and go to college. But I just... My goal is to have an in-person graduation. I just hope that phases that come out 
would account for that. Thank you. Thank you, young man. I remember mine, and I'm sure all of us do our, our graduation, and we want to see that happen too, but we'll, we'll see. Thank you very much for coming forward, though, and to keep your voice active. Who's next, Ms. Frosto? Yes, our next speakers are via Zoom. And our first one is caller with the last four digits, 5145. You may go ahead and unmute and you will have three minutes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good evening. I am a parent of a third grader and a teacher for our district. I'm speaking tonight as a concerned parent. Due to my position, I am aware of a little more behind the scenes information pertaining to how our students' school day will play out. And I have to say, I am unsatisfied. At first, when I heard that our students were getting to come back one day a week, I was excited for my daughter. However, after reviewing the schedule a little more closely and hearing about all the procedures during staff meetings, I am now disappointed in what our school district has chosen as an in-person model. I've personally done the math. Our students will be in school for five hours. Subtract recess and lunch, about 50 minutes. Subtract the hour, yes, hour, for hand washing procedures because students will have to wash their hands four times a day. My daughter will only be receiving three hours and 10 minutes of instruction. This is disappointing. Currently in phase one, she receives two and a half hours of live instruction daily. So she's getting just a smidge more by going in person. Also on the day she does not attend, she's only receiving 40 minutes of live instruction and then is then expected to do independent work for the remainder of the day. If you do the math, she's losing out on a total of an hour of live instruction weekly with the switch to phase two and two hours when we switch to phase three. This is disappointing. She should not have to lose out on so much instructional time. I don't think parents realize that their students are actually losing out on time and they need to be aware of that. I've also been told that during the first few weeks back, teachers are not to focus on academics, but on social and emotional and relationship building. So students will not even be receiving academic instruction time. Also, it was stated at the last board meeting and this one that our schools have been ready since November. And I wanna share that that statement's not accurate. AC filters have just barely been installed. Custodians are running around doing last minute things. Safety supplies have not all been delivered, including sanitizing wipes for desks and other surfaces. My daughter's school plans to use baby wipes, which don't contain enough alcohol or other disinfectant ingredients to effectively kill COVID. Schools are still figuring this all out and it's being rushed. I'm working from home while she is in her class. Wednesdays have already been a struggle for us, especially when she is done with class by 8.30 and I'm still teaching till 11 because I'm a virtual program teacher. She usually needs my help and unfortunately I can't help her until I'm done teaching my own class, which has been unfair to her. Now I'm gonna have another day where I can't help her till 2.30. What is my daughter supposed to do for that long length of time that I'm still teaching and unable to help her? And then what happens when we enter phase three? That's three days like that, okay? Somebody else mentioned Corona Norco. They return this week. Half day, half day a.m., half day p.m. It's two and a half hours. I, I verified that with um, my family member. Two and a half hours that each cohort is there. So they they were two hours live. Now they're two and a half hours in person. So they actually increased their minutes, which is the way it should be. I also want to add that parents in our district were not notified of or provided the change of program form between trimesters. I had parents that asked me if I knew if it was available, and I did not. By the time I got a response, the window had closed. I found out even if they had submitted the form, their student may not have been allowed to transfer due to space, which is ridiculous. Corona Norco has been extremely considerate of their family's needs throughout this, allowing them to switch as they need to. They even offered the opportunity to switch their families up until last one, Friday. Four, four, even, five, please wrap up your comments, I appreciate it. Okay, so they even told families that if they were uncomfortable as students were coming back, that they could switch programs as they um, as they needed to. So I, my question is, where's the consideration in our district? What are the priorities for our students? Thank you very much. Thank you, 5145. Ms. Frosta, do we have another, any other callers, please? Speak. Yes, we do. And I'd like to just have a correction. I believe that, okay. Our next caller, I believe is anonymous. You may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. I think you just let me go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, Board President Hunt. It is the next caller is 5145 and may go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Good evening, district leaders and board members. A few years ago, President Hank gave a promotion speech at my daughter's middle school promotion. I would like to summarize a part of what he said. He told the kids about California's fast track tolling versus the regular lane on our freeways. He advised the kids to take advantage of the tolling instead of the regular lane in education and life. I found that to be great advice. I'm glad he shared the advice. During this past school year, countless schools across the country and world have chosen to take the tolling while California chose to stay in the regular lane. Therefore, schools to, to uh, who uh, therefore schools and the kids attending them have passed us by and are way ahead of us. They are ahead in education, social, and emotional areas. The gap is wide and far. My niece, a senior, attends a high school similar in enrollment size to King High School. 80% chose to return in person at the beginning of the year, five days a week. They've had bumps in the road, like having to go online, especially during surges of the virus. But they managed through it all and stayed focused to keep the high school open for in person. Now she will, she will attend her senior prom on May 1st. Only enrolled students can attend, and each will have to have proof of a negative test. It will be outdoors, but they will have a prom. Unfortunately, that won't happen here in our state, but it illustrates how far behind our kids are compared to the rest of the country and world. Another example is my nephews attend an elementary school similar in enrollment size as my kids. They will soon increase to five days a week, regular hours, but well, we are just starting with one day a week modified schedule. Throughout this pandemic, our county numbers and experience and surges have been similar to where my niece and nephews live, yet we have vastly different experiences. They have been in the toll lane while we have been in the regular lane. I thoroughly support the return to in-person plan. I urge you to continue moving forward and as quickly as is reasonable. I urge you to move forward into phase four if we meet the criteria and not to hesitate. The gap in educational and social and emotional is too great not to. No one can adequately know the impact of how slow it has taken to get to this point will be on our kids. But we all know that it will be great because every day there are countless kids around the country and world getting a better educational social and emotional experience in person. Many have been attending school since the beginning of the year. Where there is a will, there's a way. It has been proven by what other schools nationwide and worldwide have done. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. for your, your um, heartfelt uh, input. Ms. Frosta, we have a, another caller. Yes, our next caller is Sandy. Sandy, you have three minutes. Before Sandy begins, how many other callers do we have lined up behind uh, Miss Sandy? After Sandy, there's one. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rochin. Please, two, I'm please sorry. go, Miss. There are two. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So my concern is also with our return to five days a week. Um, from the discussion, it sounds like we are only discussing up until phase three. Does phase four exist? Will we be able to accomplish phase four this school year? Will we even be able to reach phase four by fall? Um, the concern is other districts in California, not in other states, not in other countries, in California have managed to accomplish this. They didn't build additional schools to accomplish this. And I understand RUSD is in the process of building four schools, four new campuses with the Measure O funds that were to repair um, campuses. So we should definitely, you know, be on pace to um, accommodate all these students space wise so that we can socially distance. Um, maybe they need to think outside the box and have some classes outdoors or, you know, come up with portable classrooms, whatever you need to do to accomplish this, because our kids are continuing to fall behind. Some Orange County um, districts are back. Some San Diego County districts are back. A lot of districts up north are back. I know that Riverside County received 76 million in COVID relief funds for our district. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we've had a year to implement all of these um, air filters and 
things that needed to be addressed. I would hope that the district was proactive and took care of that in a timely manner so that there's no further delays um, with things with that regard. I'm aware that we have three months worth of um, PPEs according to the Safe School Reopening website. So that shouldn't be an issue. So I really want clarification as to when will we ever be ready for phase four or five days a week? Because I'm also concerned that with this new schedule going back, our kids are losing instruction time. Now on the days that the other group is in school, my son's only gonna get 40 minutes that day instead of getting the full you know, two and a half hours he was getting. So that's a big concern for me. Um, and then when we go to two days a week, now he's gonna be two days where he's only 40 minutes. There should have been some kind of plan to where maybe like the teacher could be teaching to half the class remotely while half the class is in person if that's the situation. So I definitely think that we need to um, think outside the box here and making this happen. Maybe we need to split our days. Um, I, ju I just think if this is negotiations that are affecting this, then maybe you guys need to sit down at the negotiating table again because our children's futures are at stake here and education is essential like the other mom said. Uh, I know my time is dwindling, so I just wanna add one further comment. Um, from last um, meeting, I told Mr. Hunt that his trash signs were still all over our roadways and your trash sign is still on La Sierra and I see it every day. And I don't know when you plan to remove your campaign signs that you are in violation of county ordinances. Please get those picked up as soon as possible. And I will comment just on that because you've thrown that at me again. I did make sure to go up there even today. I've gone to every corner. There, my signs are not there. Be sure to email me where you see the sign and I'll go pick it up. I can right? tell you now if I'm no, not moving. No, ma'am, I don't want you to tell me corner. now. Your, your time is done. Thank you. We're, we'll move forward. Do we have any other speakers, Ms. Frosto? Hearing none, board, do we have, uh, we've already asked questions. Do we have comments from the board about this the presentation you'd like to ask? Anyone? All right. Board President Hunt, there was one more. Oh, I couldn't sorry. get to I'm the I'm sorry, Ms. Frosto. I thought you had, That's go ahead. Uh, caller 4896, you may go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, um, I, I spoke earlier and I'd had, I'd asked some questions about the past to five days. And um, when they were talking about the, the secondary and high schools coming back, um, the, the student board member asked a really great question as to whether it would be three classes or six classes. And they said that it would be in the block for the rest of the year. So that, you know, said to me that you have no intention of going to five days this school year. And, you know, what does that look like for the fall? Uh, you know, I would, uh, you know, I, I thought the presentation was great. I really appreciate, congratulations, Mr. Walker. That's fantastic. I think you guys are, you know, have put plans together, but, uh, you know, as a parent, I do want to understand the path to five days and now hearing, you know, the other districts, I, that's been my concern all along that our kids are continuing to fall behind. I have nephews in Michigan that have been five days full schedule since uh, September and October of last year. I have another, I have other nephews in Arizona that are five days full time. So, you know, and, and, and in San Juan Capistrano, you know, my coworkers' kids are, are five days in school instruction. And so uh, we are falling behind. That gap is getting larger and it's not fair to our students. So if you could please give us just the information on what it would take and, and what the plans are and the path. And especially, you know, if you have no plans to go back this year, we, we want to know that. And what does the fall look like? Um, and if it's, we need to, you know, sign petitions and get the, the governor or the legislature to lift social distancing. My understanding is with plexiglass and masks, you know, it's masks, you know, and social distancing is better, but when you can't do one, you know, we should look at the CDC guidelines and, and you know, what the other districts and, and states and schools are doing as a best practice to understand, because I think you guys have done a lot of good work and it's a shame that our students are still suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Hansen, you have frequently asked questions, I think, here. 
developing for folks. I mean, it, she's put together, so is the other speaker, some, so maybe we could address those. Would you like to address any right now before we take a break? Okay. So, I'm sorry about that. Uh, board, do we have any questions uh, for Dr. Lewis's uh, presentation tonight? So hearing none, uh, we're going to move to, I'm, I'm going to do two things. One, uh, Ms. Frost, I'm going to ask you to, to bring up the J2Q, and then after that, the board will take a 10-minute break. So go ahead and bring up the J2Q, and let the folks know if they'd like to call in on that, that line so we have them ready. Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for item J2. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on agenda item J2, an update on the program choice selection for the 2021-2022 school year, you may now enter the queue by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using the phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item J2, an update on the program choice selection until that item begins. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frosto. It is now um, 8 16, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
I, you know, that, that would help, Mr. Kinnear, you're right. All right. Ms. Froster, are you with me? Yes, I am. Okay. We're going to now go. The board is re reconvened. Thank you. And um, we have everyone here, right? Okay. So uh, we're now going to go to item J2, which is a, an update on the program choice selection for the 21 22 school year. Dr. Lewis will again be uh, providing this. Um, we've announced for public comment, so we'll hear from the staff first, then take public comment, and then board input and questions. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, President Hunt. I'm actually just going to open this evening and turn it over to Dr. Hansen for the report, but just wanted to set context before we give the report. We were preparing for the 21 22 school year. At the same time, we go through the spring of the 2021 school year. The reason for that is to make sure we have all the accommodations, all of our staffing and everything in place to begin next year. To do that, we took and asked all of our parents for their program choice preference for the 21-22 school year. I hope tonight uh, you are uh, supported and very proud of the results that our staff was able to get from our community and the amount of outreach that we were able to reach out to every family and make sure their voice was heard. So you can look forward to that this evening. But as a quick reminder, we have three programs for next year. We have in-person, which is returning to the brick and mortar campus, uh, as you've heard earlier this evening. We have our virtual program that is 100% virtual. And then we have our Summit View or home-based program, which is like a homeschool program. And we asked all of our families to make their selection based on planning for their student being in that program for the entire 21-22 school year. So this time I'll turn over to Dr. Sosa. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Good evening, Board President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, members of the board and cabinet. Just as Dr. Lewis was saying, in preparation for next school year, we asked all RUSD families to register a choice so that we could do proper planning and staffing. That choice window was February 6th through the 16th of this year. We collected data using our student information system, which is called ARIES. To facilitate this process, our school sites supported our families through a myriad of ways, including making hundreds of phone calls, going on home visits, using social media to help parents navigate those choices and make good decisions for their uh, children. That all resulted in a selection rate of 86%. Perfect, thank you. Next slide. That would not have been possible without all hard work and caring from all of our school leaders, from our family resource center located here at the Riverside Adult School, teachers, office staff, and even fellow parents who we saw that were posting helpful tips on their own social media to help out their um, fellow parents. Thank you so much from the bottom of our heart for all of that work that you did. The remaining RUSD families that didn't have an opportunity or couldn't make a choice during that time have been supported through this process since February 17th. That effort has allowed us to reach 95% of families making selections as of last Friday. Next slide. The figures on the slide represent the initial choices when the selection window closed on February the 17th. When we look at those choices as a whole, we see the following. For our in-person school program, about 78% of families, or just a little bit shy of 25,000, chose the in-person program. For our virtual school, that was about 21% of the selections made, or about 6,500 choices. And for our home-based school program, that was about 1% of the selections, or just under 500. Uh, next slide. We looked at the choices by grade span as well. So when we look at the elementary grades, we see the following. About 77% of families chose the in-person program. 21% of families chose the virtual school. 
and just about 2% of families chose the home-based school, as some of you. You'll notice that these figures are almost identical to the overall figures of the district as a whole. Next slide. Then we looked at the programs, excuse me, then we looked at the selections by families who would be in middle grades next year. For those selections, about 78% of families chose the in-person program. About 21% of families chose the virtual school. And just about 1% of middle grades families chose the home-based program. Those figures, again, are very, very close within percentage rates to the overall selection. Next slide. When we look at the choices by those families in the high school grades, we see the following. About 79% or just south of 10,000 selections were for the in-person school. About 19% were for the virtual school and about 2% were for the home-based program. You'll see again that these figures are very close to the overall school types, with slightly more families choosing the in-person than the other school types. Next slide. Next, our department broke down the selections by our four largest student ethnic groups. These groups represent about 95% of all students in the district. When we looked at the data this way, we see that for the in-person program or the in-person school experience, Families of white and, and Asian students selected a slightly higher rate than families of African American or Hispanic students. For our virtual school, we see just the opposite, that our African American and Hispanic families chose that school experience slightly more often than our Asian and our white families. And for our home-based experience, we see that our white and African American student families selected that experience at a slightly higher rate than our Hispanic families, with no Asian families choosing that experience. Uh, next slide. Further, we looked at the selection data by what we call student program groups. And these program groups represent uh, an, amal an amalgamation or a mixing of all of our uh, student uh, racial and ethnic groups. We see the following. For the in-person program, we had families, uh, we had all families that are in the student groups choose at about the same rate, with families of English learners choosing the in-person school type just a little less than families of Foster Youth or McKinney Bento students. For our virtual program, we see that families of English learners and low-income students selected that school experience at just a slightly higher rate than our other student groups. For our home-based program, we see that our student groups selected that home-based experience about the same rate with our English learners selecting that school type just a little bit less. Uh, next slide, please. We're just finishing up using the selection data for step two, which is indicated in the red box. We've transitioned into step three, which will occur between now and mid-April. There are many things happening during this time period, including school staffing. This period will end at uh, mid-April and then transition into step four, which will take us to the end of our school year and into the beginning of next school year. One thing I'd like to note is that families will have the opportunity to change their program choice selection in early April. This is intended only for families that want to change. So if families are fine with their initial selection, they don't have to do anything. We just wanted to give families the opportunity to make an alternate selection if they'd like. Next slide. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Doctor. Pre President Hunt, if I may, yes, add, I just want to add two pieces. 
because uh, they were mentioned in the comments earlier, and I think you have mentioned them to me also, Mr. Hunt. To what speak up a little bit, Ms. Hill, I sure appreciate you. you sure. Coming. Um, I would just like to address two pieces that have been asked. Um, what would it take for us to return to five days a week for all students Thank next you. year? So we, of course, um, are hopeful that we can do that. But what it would re require is for us to meet the health guidelines for everyone to come back, which is currently one case per 100,000 population. And we will need to have the social distancing requirement removed. We do not have enough physical space to have all students and six feet distance between them. Um, so that's just, I know that's been on, on uh, people's minds about returning next year. I'm sure those uh, clarifications are appreciated out there. Uh, Dr. Sosa, how are you? I, I had a question from uh, 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 Trustee Lee, if you would take it, please. Yes, sir, of course. Yes, Mr. Lee. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I was, sorry, I saw Mr. Mr. Or Dr. Dr. Farouk's slide on, so I got distracted for a second. So there was, there was also some questions asked uh, throughout the last presentation about, um, I mean, there are some references to different states and I won't comment on those, but um, some other counties or other districts that are open um, five days a week. So if you could just comment on the fact that these, these metrics are all uh, are counted by, by county and that every county in the state, if they're public, have to abide by those guidelines. And then, if, so if you comment on that. And then my second question is, well, I'm not advocating for this. What happens if you do not follow the guidelines and, and open uh, or, or, or open with, without those restrictions? Um, yes, the, gu the guidelines that we're follow following are set by, for going to school is by county health. Um, and sometimes they match at the state and county, but uh, the county can be more, not less restrictive than the state. So to say we follow the county means at least the state, maybe more, um, <clears throat> for academics. For sports, we follow CIF guidance along with the county. And then like Mr. Kinnear alluded to, the, the uh, arts um, have some recommending bodies, but they don't have a, a official body like the CIF. Um, and second question was, well, what happens if we don't? Unknown, um, I can imagine there could be some penalties for funding or um, regular funding or CARES Act funding, uh, but I, I haven't heard of any specific penalties being levied or anything like that. So I mean, I'm not aware of any, count, any districts in this state that are open five days a week, full day. I mean, is there any county right now that you're aware of in the, dist in, the, in the state that has less than one, which would permit them to come back? Not known to me, Mr. Lee, and, and on the break, um, our team looked up some of the <laughs> districts that were mentioned before, and um, many of them, a neighboring district, they're going uh, two hours, two and a half hours per day um, with their students. So it's not a full day. And in uh, San Juan Capistrano, it's also two and a half hours a day supplemented by um, like a child care thing or, but it's still two, ha two and a half hours instruction with the teacher. So I don't know of any that are below one in the state just yet. Um, and I don't know of any California districts that are all day, every day. Okay, so I would, I would, just, I would just say that I know there are some parents and some, um, speakers say that were really frustrated. And I, and I get your frustration, I, I sympathize, I empathize with you. I have three students at home myself, and I know how important it is and how, what, you know, that I desire, my wife desires to get our kids back five days a week as soon as we can. Um, but as Mrs. Hill mentioned, and as we have tried to communicate at these meetings, that a lot of these metrics are beyond our control and that the return to school to five days a week we have to meet certain benchmarks unless we're going to be in violation of those rules and potentially put ourselves at great liability and potentially cut cut funding. Um, so you know, I would say, and, and I'm and I'm and I'm happy to work with with some of you too, that the legislature and and the governor, I would I would imagine, are the ones who can help change some of these guidelines. 
um, as things as things continue to improve health wise. So, um, I, I, well, I'm happy to listen to any public comment and about their frustration and suggestions. Um, I would also encourage them to contact their local legislature, lo their local legislator, or their local state senator, um, and maybe write to the governor's office about their desire to get their kids back uh, and some suggestions they have to do so uh, safely. Uh, my last question before I turn it back over to my colleagues was uh, for you, Dr. Sosa, regarding the second option for students. So we'll, we just use traditional communication as we, as we do through school sites and ARIES and uh, Remind and the other, other platforms to let parents know that they have the opportunity uh, to make a change. Uh, yes, we will have a full communication plan uh, coming through the leadership of Dr. Perez. Uh, utilizing many of the same strategies we used last time, which um, we provided schools with a toolkit of items, both in English and in Spanish, to do on their social media, post it on our social media, had uh, calls going out through our system and then asking schools. So really using multiple modalities and ways to get that message out. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. And if I may, President Hunt, um, Ms. V, I'd like to just add something that you actually reminded me of on your last question. We also, as members of the public, so I'm not speaking as a school district official now, we as members of the public have power to help reduce the case rate. So if we use our social distancing, our wash hands, our masks, our not gathering in large gatherings, it's the case rate that drives most of it. Um, so that is within our power as, as members of the public. Superintendent-elect Hill, I, uh, Dr. Farouk, I believe you had a question for these people. Are, questions are popping up now after you two. Yes, uh, thank you, President Hunt. Um, I just want to make two comments and questions. Um, you know, regarding the spacing, because we're because it's been cited that uh, the the social distancing, the six feet, is uh, a, a, an obstacle that we can't address. Okay, sorry about that feedback. That, that we can't address in terms of getting. Um, students back five days a week. I, I just want to acknowledge that for us as a school district, public school district, we don't have the luxury of just putting students in any facility that, that could be just potentially available in the public because of the FIELD Act. Is that correct? Can, can you just elaborate on that just for, so people understand that? Um, I think um, <coughs> Assistant Superintendent San, San Martin would be best to answer that. Yes, uh, Dr. Farouk, forgive me. Uh, students, our students, K through uh, 12 grade students uh, being provided instruction. And as a district, we, would, we are required to provide a field, that field act facility, which means it has to abide by ADA, ADA compliance and DSA. The folks at home, the field act. Okay. Our students as a state agency, any of our students being instructed in any of our, of our facilities need to comply with the field act, which means DSA approved facility. The Division of State Architects, um, since we're a state agency, we are by for the Division of State Architects. Right, and, and so the, the limitation of options for 50 schools to house students to be able to provide the six feet social distancing is, is something that's not feasible to, to do, I'm assuming, because of the field act, uh, the regulations, the standards for where student instruction can be for public school districts, correct? That, that is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, we even, we are asked, well, why can't you just put uh, lease a, uh, a storefront, right. put students there, or use the library, or use a community center? Right. And as a, a state agency or the school district, we. Uh, we are not allowed to do that. Again, it needs to be field that. So our schools are limited um, in terms of classroom space and to meet the six foot requirement, we only have certain space that we have uh, square footages in order to comply with the six foot uh, rule. That's fine. I, I just think these types of questions, uh, they need to be included in the frequently asked questions. Um, a lot of the types of things that came up, they might not just be the, the intuitively because we already have that information. Um, but I think that can help 
uh, clarify to families that we have ex we have considered every possibility we can possibly do to accommodate our students. My next question, um, thank you, Mr. San Martin. Um, my next question is to Mr. Sosa. Uh, you know, I, I'm very curious. I'm, I'm assuming we don't have this information, but what the reasoning that's driving these parent choices is like. What are the main factors? Because Especially, like it's it's understandable in one sense that for this school year, right, uh, this the uncertainty of the uh, 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 from a safety health standpoint, a lot of parents might have just erred on the side of caution. But going into this next school year, knowing that uh, you know they're now saying the president is now saying that a vaccine should be available to every person by the end of May, I believe that even in light of that information, and maybe are we. Make, are we actually providing that context when people are making these choices? What what's still driving people's decisions to, you know, choose so, such a high percentage of virtual? Do you have any insight on that? No, I mean you make an excellent point, Dr. Farouk. As a researcher, I can't really put my finger on one or two things. I mean, it's like many things in uh, educational research. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that that kind of contribute to that. Uh, so I think if I made any comment, it would just kind of be my own opinion and inference. Uh, but that would be something that we could look into doing certain, um, you know, what are called empathy interviews or asking our parent groups just for some anecdotal feedback and begin to uh, broaden out that picture to get a sense of that. The reason I think this question is very important is because there's some stark contrast, right, between different people of different backgrounds. And if, hi hypothetically, their decisions are being made based on incomplete information, right, in terms of, uh, again, vaccine availability and what the, the, the nature of things are going to be, then I think it's it's incumbent on us to make sure that, again, we're citing Center for Disease Control or, legit, again, legitimate sources, but to help educate parents so that they have uh, a higher degree of confidence in potentially returning in person in the fall. I'm just putting that out there. Thank you, Mr. Sosa. Trustee Kinnear first. Yes, Trustee Kinnear. I, I don't have a question, just a, just a, com a comment. 85% response rate is obviously incredibly high, and then reaching 95% is phenomenal. And that only happened uh, because staff worked really hard. That didn't happen on its own. Uh, it, that's an impressive stat. What's more impressive uh, uh, is the fact that parents responded on Aries. Uh, and uh, I, I would have thought it could never happen. I, I really, I really didn't think that we could, we could reach that kind of a number. And and it has so many added benefits for the future, with with parents becoming more comfortable with uh, our student database and looking at the progress of their kids in the classroom, looking at their children's grades in the classroom and their schedules and how they're progressing towards graduation. So. Uh, you know, uh, my hat is off to staff uh, for uh, for what they've done in helping parents uh, use Aries as a system. Yes, thank you. I would agree, and and I um, again, I couldn't reiterate more that it was the hard work of school sites and families, or, excuse me, staff and teachers who went door to door and helped families uh, out and were answering phone calls late at night and were. Uh, Posting on their Facebook page up until midnight of the day when the when it was occurring to make sure all of their families had that support. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Dr. Sosa, I have a question for you or a comment from Trustee Allaby. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think what you're showing us tonight is a snapshot of what February parents felt like. What I'm concerned with is that this is not what June parents are gonna feel like or September parents are gonna feel like. So, so I know we're a school district, we've got a plan staffing, we've got a plan for what's coming. I just worry that a lot of those virtual parents, when they see the numbers come tumbling, which I believe will happen when the vaccines are, full, are more fully implemented, I think the numbers are kind of tumbling, and as those come tumbling and things open up, they're gonna to wanna to change. Now, um, maybe you're not the one to answer this, Dr. Sosa, but are we striving for flexibility here at all? Because I have a feeling that 
they're going to get a good percentage of those virtual parents that might change their mind. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Alvey, it's, it's a great question. Uh, a few challenges and maybe a few possibilities. So number one, we are doing our very best to put the choice windows, you were correct, the February was just to give us a feel, which is why it was so important to hear from every single family to get a true idea of where our parents were in February. We are gonna push that all the way to Dr. Sosa talked about. Uh, we're anticipating somewhere with the 5th or 12th of April to push that to give us a chance to return to in-person so we can demonstrate to our community that all the things that we've talked about in our safety plans, they can talk to their neighbors and they can feel confident that we are bringing students back into an environment where they can be successful and where we can follow the health precautions. That's why we've tried to move that as far as we can. Still understanding that some parents may still not feel comfortable. So what we've put in the FAQ and the parents that we've spoken to, what we've told them is, we are asking them to make a selection to attend a specialty school. The virtual school is, is a specialty school for the 21-22 school year. If that is the learning environment that works for your child, then we encourage you to take advantage of our new specialty school. Be mindful, however, if you're selecting that school, maybe for a different reason. Be mindful of that, because once you select that school and that becomes your new transfer, like all school transfers throughout the year, you do have the ability to say, I would like to remove my transfer. And then, then you would transition back to your school of residence. However, many of our families, the difficulty with this nuance is if they have a transfer to a different school and then they attend the virtual school, that is their new transfer. And that is, it is explained in the FAQ, but I understand it can be a nuance for some families. So, we ask that they understand that because that becomes their new school of transfer. So if you're selecting that option, we're asking families, please be prepared for the 21-22 school year to stay in that option. And then they will have the chance, as we do in all times of the year from November to January, to apply for a transfer the following 22-23 school year to attend a different specialty program if that's their choice. Are you giving them the opportunity before school starts, though, for that transfer window? As of now, that is, that is not the plan. And the rationale is just preparing for the school year and uh, making sure we have correct staffing and students in the correct places. Thank you, Ms. Valvin. Does that include your pick? All right. Um, Dr. Sosa, uh, please continue. Are you wrapping up or let me understand? I think you've heard a lot of a lot of frequently asked questions we do need to clarify with folks and the best way we can do it is short of finding the next best way so please do that dr sosa let's go ahead sir uh, uh, we're we're all finished and if there's okay. any other questions i'd be happy to answer them otherwise well, I, we're, we're going to take some questions now from the folks that are most interested in, in what, what your plans are and that's the public so Ms. frosto do we have uh, callers ready on on this item please Yes, we do. And the queue is now closed for this item, and we have three callers. Three callers. Thank you. Will the first caller proceed? Our first one is anonymous. You may go ahead and unmute, and you will have three minutes. Hello again, board. I just spoke on the previous item as a parent, but now I'm speaking on this item as a teacher. Um, I'm teaching more in the regards to staffing for the virtual program. So I was involuntarily transferred this school year to the virtual program and to be honest, not happy about it. Like most teachers can attest, this school year has been beyond challenging for us. Most of us work 12 hour days trying to make this virtual learning happen for our students. We push aside personal needs and family time for our students. During the normal school year, we would have gladly done some of these things on the side for our students and families, but not to this extreme. And we are not even being compensated in any manner for the extra work we are having to put in. And I just want to point out that I know Newsom and Legislator just passed a $2 billion framework where schools that reopen by April 1st receive incentives for doing so. So maybe with that incentive money that comes in, 
because you guys are reopening, maybe that's something you guys can pass on to your teachers. I think we all deserve it for the hard work that we've done this year. I also know that there's a lot of parents out there that I've heard that say they feel that us teachers aren't doing enough or that we don't wanna go back to school. I wanna point out that it's not up to us teachers or our union. We don't have a say to go back. That, so please drop that. It's up to the state. It's not up to us. It's been up to the state this whole time. I do wanna go back like many teachers do. We got into teaching to teach actual students, not computerized images. Also, I wanna add on that vaccines also have nothing to do with us going back. So again, please drop that. Yes, some teachers would prefer to be vaccinated before they go back, but I don't think that would stop them from coming back. I am extremely concerned about next school year. I see that you know in this slide presentation that 21% of our families chose the virtual program next year. I do not wanna teach a virtual program next year, especially in considering I teach lower grade special education which teaching virtually is not anywhere close to as effective as in-person instruction. I can't help some of my students meet their goals in this virtual setting, and it breaks my heart. I know I'm not the only teacher who was involuntarily transferred this year and does not want to go to the virtual program next year. However, I just found out that because the district has stipulated on paper that we get to return to our home schools next year, that this involuntary transfer of ours doesn't actually count as a transfer. So per our contract, the district can still involuntarily transfer us back to the virtual program next year if they need more teachers. What it, it looks like they just might. I also want to add that there's a lot of teachers out there that's, that are concerned about the seniority for this transfer to the virtual program for next year. There's teachers that have been in our district for eight plus years, and they are saying that it needs to be a district-wide decision on seniority, not a site-by-site, -site, because if you do it site-by-site, -site, then you're sending teachers that have been there, been here for eight years you're sending those teachers to the virtual program versus you know, teachers that have only been teaching two or three. So it needs to be looked at seniority wise across the district. And they also pointed out that if they do the involuntary transfer like they did this year, then a lot of the teachers that were involuntarily transferred this year have no hope of returning back to our brick and mortar school like we were told we would in August. And that's not fair. This is not why we got into teaching. And also from my understanding, if we're involuntarily transferred next year, it's for good. As in, there's no spot for us at our home sites. It's a permanent transfer. Again, please this is not fair. Comments, a lot of teachers teacher, I appreciate what you're saying, but please wrap up your comments. All right. A lot of teachers move to the areas that they teach in, or they specifically apply for a transfer to certain types of schools. And now you're taking this away from them. Okay. Please Thank reconsider you. the virtual program or how you choose to staff it. All right. Thank you very much, teacher. We appreciate your comments. I'm going to ask that everyone following, though, to stay to the issue. I appreciate the comments that were about transfers and et cetera, but they don't apply to the issue that was presented tonight to the public. So um, the next two, the next speakers, I'm gonna insist you do that uh, for the consideration of the rules and the community. Next speaker, please, Ms. Frosto, with that nice opening. Yes, our next speaker is Sandy. Sandy, you may go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Yes, I wanted to speak because I felt that a lot of the board members and the staff were addressing comments about not being aware of what districts we were referring to. Um, Governor Newsom has created a safe schools reopening website where you can clearly see which districts are open for in person, which comments districts are hybrid. Comments pertaining to item J2. Are you speaking to J2? This is not open public I am comments. addressing the comments that you left, and I also have comments regarding J2. Please, so, please, please, um, please since other people were allowed to speak J2. over their time. Please confine your comments to J2, Miss. I appreciate it. We, You can send in the information of the schools we didn't understand, the districts. It's very kind of you. Please confine your comments oh, now to J2. Let's I'm again. sure you feel that my comments are kind. I think it was very clear you needed the break because of my comments. I think at this point, you know, most of us parents feel that the board and the teachers keep indicating that this is uh, the government's control. All right, Miss, you're district not staying with J2 you and, didn't, and the comments you on J2. I will cut you off in 15 seconds unless you get back to J2. That was the rule. We knew it. So please go forward, Miss Sandy. All right, that's it. Let's go to the next speaker, please. Please stay on the item that is on the agenda that the public is, is paying attention to. Next speaker. Next speaker is Patricia Isham. Patricia, you may go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Hi, thank you for letting me speak again. And now I'm so afraid that 
I'm not speaking to J2. This isn't something I do all the time. Uh, so I'll ask before I speak, are you gonna be speaking about masks at some point or can I just make a quick statement and, and then be done? No, ma'am, we, we thank you for that and your understanding. Uh, no, ma'am, we're not gonna be speaking on that. That would have been something you would have offered under public comment because it is not on the agenda tonight. So curriculum is not included in the presentations tonight. Is that correct, Dr. Hansen? So I apologize for that. Uh, we do want your participation, but you need to be speaking, as the rules say, to this item. And we're welcome to take your emails and calls, et cetera, though, and do our best to have them answered. I take it by your silence, you're not gonna go forward on J2, so that ends uh, public comment. And we will now move on to uh, item K, which is district group reports. We have three reports tonight from uh, a president of our Riverside City Teachers Association and from uh, a president of the Riverside Association of School Managers, RASM, and also from Ms. Jessica Seals, who is our president of the District African American Parent Advisory Committee. We try to limit these to five minutes, um, and so we'll move forward with uh, inviting uh, Ms. Laura Bowling, who's the president of the Riverside City Teachers Association. This will be done through Zoom. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and esteemed board members. I'm gonna take this time this evening to express some gratitude. This has been a very difficult and challenging 12 months. Our educators and our district have come leaps and bounds from March 13th, 2020. I'm extremely proud of all the hard work that has been done to get students back in the classrooms where they belong. The shift that hasn't been easy, but our teachers have risen to the, the occasion. From the first grade teacher who managed to teach little ones how to read through a computer to the chemistry teacher conducting experiments without students able to be in the lab or the music and theater teachers who somehow coordinate a performance despite their class not being physically there. Special education staff have spent hours in training to learn how to effectively use virtual platforms to assess their students. For some special education staff, there are no virtual assess assessments such as the adaptive PE teachers and those who work with visually impaired students. These dedicated professionals work to create protocols to safely ass assess these students. Counselors, psychologists, and speech language pathologists have been serving students at all three district programs and have had to troubleshoot providing services and support in a virtual environment while maintaining student privacy and their professional guidelines. Nurses have had to create their skill set to include how to effectively do their jobs and keep the school entire population healthy and safe during this pandemic. Every certificated employee from the librarians to the teachers on special assignment and all those I failed to mention tonight have had to radically change how they did their job and they've done so admirably. Special education teachers in the moderate, severe, and elementary mild moderate programs were the first to go back to in-person instruction and, had, and have been doing a magnificent job of not only meeting their students' educational needs, but also keeping them safe and healthy. Virtual teaching takes a tremendous amount of preparation. Teaching staff routinely spend 10 to 12 hours and weekends planning, for prepping, grading, and creating assignments for their Google Classroom helping families learn the technology and build connections with students and parents during the first several months of, di of distance learning. Soon our in-person general education students will return to school sites as well as our RCT members will be asked to adapt again, this time to a hybrid setting. Teaching separate cohorts and teaching while making sure health and safety guidelines are followed for the protection of their students. As we begin the next pivot into in-person instruction, it is my goal and pledge to continue to ensure the health and safety of all educators. Thank you for your dedication and resilience during this most difficult time. Have a good evening and thank you for your time. Thank you, President Bowling, and, and thank you to all of your colleagues out there. We're, we're glad we're working with such fine folks. We now go to uh, Mr. Michael Gall. Mike, again, is the president of the Riverside Association of School Managers and uh, is one of our, our assistant principals here at RUSD as well. Michael? 
Good evening, President Hunt, members of the board, members of cabinet, and Dr. Hansen. Plus a special welcome to you, Mr. Daly White, as I know your Ramona family is proud to have you representing them, as is the remainder of the district's TK-12 student population. Thank you again for the opportunity to share some of the recent activities and the upcoming events of the Riverside Association of School Managers. As I mentioned in my January report, I was hopeful to have some updates on the status of our RASA managers of the year in the AXA regional considerations. I'm pleased to report that three of our RASA manager recipients also won at the regional level in their respective categories, and they will be representing our district, as well as AXA Region 19 in the state level review process. Josh Reyna will be representing the confidential manager of the year category. David Marshall will be representing the human resources manager of the year category. And Cindy Hartshorn will represent in the special education manager of the year. We wish them all the best in the next level of the AXA review process. Each of them is so deserving based on their leadership contributions to both RASM and RUSD. In addition to our managers of the year awardees with AXA Region 19, one of our submissions for the Every Student Succeeding Award was selected by the Region 19 board members. Kiki Cobb, who is a junior at Ramona High School was selected as this year's recipient and she will be awarded a $1,000 scholarship later this spring and will be also featured as part of the state AXA leadership meeting later this fall. Kiki will represent both RASM and RUSD very well as she is, has a very compelling story and she's actually the sixth consecutive RUSD winner as we have had a student selected each year from 2016 through 2021, further demonstrating the commitment of our teachers our staffs and our school sites and helping students to overcome obstacles and prepare themselves for academic success. Again, congratulations to John, David, Cindy, and Kiki. Tomorrow is the final day of our RASM membership to vote in new members of our executive board. It's an exciting race as we have some extraordinary managers from RUSD interested in joining the leadership ranks of RASM. All the promotional races are close and whoever wins in these respective positions will certainly add some new strength, creativity and insights to an already talented group. As president elect, Dr. Dan Sosa takes over in June. He will certainly have a phenomenal group to help guide him and our association over the next two years. Coming up later this month, as we approach spring break, RASM has a special event planned for its members as well as our pool of RUSD managers and confidentials. More details about our virtual social events and our little special thank you gift will be going out via email next week. Also opening next week, RASM will be sending out information about its annual student scholarship effort, where six student applicants will be awarded a $500 academic scholarship in support of their continued education. Announcement of these selected student winners will be featured in our RASM May newsletter and formal recognition will be part of our spring celebration event, whether held virtually or in person if allowed. Also featured as part of this celebration will be our again 2021 RASM Managers of the Year and our 2021 Managers and Confidential Retirees. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not spend a few moments addressing the exciting news of our first wave of RUSD students returning to campuses in the coming days ahead. As it's been nearly a full year since we embraced the realities of distance learning under COVID, the prospect of seeing students enter our gates, walk our hallways, and embark on traditional brick and mortar instruction with their teachers is exciting. Though I know there are still concerns being unechoed, echoed, and felt amongst our stakeholder group, there is no doubt our students will benefit from the physical stimulus and social emotional support from their teachers, the school site support staff, and school leaders. Acclimation for everyone will take some time as we model, we navigate and enforce social distancing and our site plan protocols. But I commend our associations, the RUSD school board, RUSD district leadership, our divisional teams and school site management and their staffs for developing a comprehensive and safe return to schools plan with proper directives and the necessary equipment to ensure safety, health and welfare of our students our teachers and our staffs. As we begin to transition to phase three, a couple of things, key things to remember at all levels of our organization is to embrace empathy and to impart grace. We've come so far in the past 12 months and we still have further to go, 
but working together, we can navigate the challenges before us and continue to provide the best for our students each and every day. And that will be our extraordinary story. Thank you again for the opportunity to share some of these highlights and recent activities. And I look forward to seeing you all again in May as I get a little retrospective with it being my final report to the school board as president. Hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, President Gall, and we appreciate your service. I know that, and uh, congratulations to those who you recognized as uh, managers of the year. And also, thank you, I know, from the entire board and district for RASM does for scholarships for young people. And we hope that all of those items can be sent to uh, Dr. Perez so they can be on our website. Uh, next, we have a report. It will actually be a video, a recorded video that provided to us by Ms. Jessica Shields. Ms. Shields is the president of our district's district African American Parent Advisory Committee, and like many in our community, volunteers your time to advance this district. So uh, now I'll ask the staff to, to forward with uh, Ms. Shields' presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Hunt, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Hansen, and the RUSD community. I'm so happy to report out on behalf of the District African American Parent Advisory Council. Um, coming up at our March 9th meeting, we will be hosting our virtual talent show, showcasing youth talent from across the district. Recognition and prizes will be awarded at the end of that program. Also at, March, at the March 9th meeting, we will be sharing our LCAP recommendations that align with our DAPAC goals and outcomes in order to fulfill the organization's mission, which states, we believe that black children should receive educational and extended opportunities that promote learning, growth, and success. We believe that schools should provide these opportunities in a positive and nurturing environment where black children feel empowered and included. As a DAPAC board, we researched other districts with similar percentages of black students within a large to medium sized city and looked at targeted systems that they had in place to support their black student population. What we found was that districts like Berkeley USD, San Francisco USD, LA USD, and even right here next door in San Bernardino City USD, they have a dedicated department and monies that are specifically targeted to support black student achievement. There are goals, objectives, and accountability, and personnel that is directly responsible for ensuring that the black student population's unique needs are being met. These districts have a director along with program specialists and teachers on assignment who support at the school site level ensuring that culturally responsive strategies are being used to reach students as well. RUSD has a few components like BSU and the Heritage Program, but our parents would like more. We would also like to see the Heritage Program start at the elementary school level instead of starting at 10th grade because there is great benefit in honoring our heritage early on in the de developmental years. Nevertheless, more targeted support is needed, just like the data indicates and suggests. Now, imagine having a department such as this that could really provide targeted support for our Black students by managing the various programs like Heritage and BSU, overseeing student achievement outcomes, providing continual uh, progress monitoring, developing Black parent li uh, literacy workshops, and working to increase Black student enrollment into higher level classes and programs like AVID, AP, IB, and others. Imagine having heritage contacts based on Black student population enrollment where there is a ratio of 1 to 100, whereas there is one heritage contact per 100 students um, where appropriate money or monetary allocations based on need is in place, aka equity. So this department could also help develop more community and business partnerships through the Heritage Program to provide more leadership opportunities that specifically target the Black student population. And by also ensuring that there is deliberate inclusion of Black students when making these types of student-related decisions. You know, the district's leadership and many of us in the community 
are doing a book study with shattering inequities. And one aspect of the book says that we need to peel back the wallpaper and be honest about the data, no sugarcoating. This is a great opportunity, as the author says, to look for trouble and then seek solutions using an equity lens in order to really affect change. DayPack is asking that our educational leaders step out and make bold decisions that are needed in order to do the equity work and do it right. RUSD's historical data trends have shown the same patterns of failures decade after decade for our black student population. Again, I say the time is now. Let's be the change that we want to see and let's change the narrative for our disenfranchised groups of students. No more gaps. Let's create a constellation of stars where we all can shine. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Shields, for that insightful and uh, I know heartfelt vision you've given us. So uh, at this time, and thank you for your volunteerism, uh, this time, uh, Ms. Frosto, I want you to go ahead and uh, uh, open the uh, queue for items L1 and 2, and then I'll wait for that. Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for agenda items L1 and L2, Board of Education Subcommittee Reports. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to comment on items L1 and L2, Board of Education Subcommittee Reports, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by raising using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda items L1 and L2. Thank you. Agenda items L1 and L2 are, are reports from the subcommittees, uh, or the committees of the, of the Board of Trustees. I will be giving the first one as, on, uh, as a member of the Board's uh, Finance, Governance and Finance Committee. Uh, traditionally, the Board's Finance Committee is uh, comprised of the President and Vice President. So Mr. Lee and I were in attendance, and this was provided to us on February 23rd by the staff. A very interesting, let me go over it quickly though. Um, the, uh, the staff, uh, our consultant on enrollment projections. Uh, is a power school and they they are the ones we've used to help us understand what the uh, what our enrollment will look like in, in years to come. Mr. Wharton was there. He shared the methodology of how power school projects enrollments base various factors that include housing development, family size, birth rates, etc. Uh, every year new information is collected and forecast out for five years in projections. Um, the three scenarios are used and the one that the district has always preferred is very conservative, but this conservative is moderate. The very conservative model aligned very well with staff numbers that will reflect a decrease in enrollment in the 21-22 school year of approximately 349 students. The conservative and moderate models depict growth in 21-22 in the belief that things will go back as they were prior to COVID. That's, that's a, Enrollment projections will be presented to the Board of Education at a future meeting. I will add that he also, we are, uh, we are not alone in, in declining Riverside Unified. Most districts in this county are in decline. Uh, Beaumont is not because a lot of folks are moving there, but uh, the combinations he shared with us of affordable housing, the lower birth rates, and of course the COVID have turned everything upside down on its ear. But 349 students is, is still a consideration. The next was, and we'll hear this later, uh, the audit findings for 2019-20, and uh, there was no impact on funding. At tonight's meeting, staff will be presenting those audit findings for the, and they're on our agenda. The second interim report showed an improved financial position over the first interim report back in December. Again, at tonight's meeting, that will be presented. Uh, and then the future meeting, a very, uh, I think, upbeat, the financial stability plan update. Staff provided a detailed presentation on the Financial F Stability Plan Committee Report. They reviewed the interest-based problem solving, IPBS, um, process used during the seven meetings they held starting back in June of 2020. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for leading that. They have reviewed current budget projections and options recommended by the committee. The full report, as I said, will be brought to the Board of Education 
at a future meeting that Dr. Hansen and Mr. Lee and I will be working on agendizing. Uh, Mr. Lee, is there anything you'd like to add to, to that report, sir? No, sir. I think we're going to hear more in the next in the action items, too, so we'll get into de right. depth on some of those reports that we heard at that meeting. Uh, to our listening public, I know that we, uh, those calling in, we said item L1 and L2. I'm going to go ahead and go to two, and then we'll, we'll take your comments. Two is the, uh, the, the operations uh, subcommittee. The operations committee oversees facilities and the building and the M, uh, M O and, and Measure O. So for that, our chair is, is Trustee Kathy Alavi. Ms. Alavi, would you provide us an update of the meeting that was held on February 25, 2021? Thank you. I'm going to go through this rather quickly because we're getting very late. And I will say that every item on our operations board agenda is going to come before the full board. So you can look forward to having all of this. If you have any questions, uh, if I, ha I go too fast, please ask me. Um, we reviewed a, a community facility, a facilities district, another CFD, which is coming forward. It's up near King. And it, like many of the last few months, uh, we've had many CFDs come through. We felt there was nothing objectionable about this one. We reviewed four new murals at schools throughout the district, and they're all beautiful. They're all paid for with a combination of funds from the community, PTAs, and so forth, and sometimes supplemented by principal's funds. But they're all beautiful and will do a lot to enhance these schools. Uh, we reviewed an idea from Polytechnic High School to put a giant bear statue on the campus. And we liked the idea of a bear statue, but we made some suggestions. That money to pay for the bear statue is all coming from donations. Um, we talked about the turf replacement at two of our high school uh, football stadiums, both very much needed. Um, we knew that when we put artificial turf into these stadiums that we were going to be needing to replace it on uh, a regular basis. So it's now been almost 13 years, uh, in one case, 12 years in another, that we need to do this for Ramona and King. It's not a cheap item, but it is one that uh, Mr. And Hunt and I felt we needed to maybe push forward, and that will be coming forward to you as well. We took a look at the design teams that have been put into place for both the Casablanca School and the North High School projects. We met the, the, uh, the architects and um, the builders and just in general talked about the process for how those design teams are going to gather knowledge. And finally, we took a look at our list of architects uh, that we have compiled. Um, Staff went ahead and um, scored them on a rubric, and we took a look at that rubric, and we decided that we would uh, make a suggestion of where to cut that uh, list down to make it a little bit smaller. It started at 16. I think that the cut mark we thought was about nine, and that will all be coming forward to you. Do you have any questions for me? Because I know I went through this very fast. Thank you, and uh, I'll just add on that that the turf, we're, we're concerned about, uh, it is a safety, health and safety matter. Uh, the turf at King is as hard as that floor over there because thankfully the, the district's been using that, uh, that field a lot. And uh, so we've asked uh, Assistant uh, Superintendent Sergio San Martin to help us with finding funding sources that we might be able to uh, even if we have to borrow for and pay back. So but he'll go into more detail about that. Mr. Kinnear, you have a, you have a question or comment? I have a, I have a comment, uh, President Hunt. You know, I was told recently that the replacement of HVAC units uh, is going to come out of a Norse Measure O uh, scope of, of work. Those are obviously uh, very major expenses and, and uh, is going to, to impact uh, what the what can be done on the North Campus. I hope that topic can go to the uh, board subcommittee very soon. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. We'll, we'll look into that and ask it to be. I think you've been asked to be on that committee, so I, I'm sure you can agendize it. Ms. Frosto, we're now going to uh, allow you, if you would, to uh, open the queue for public comment items M1 through 59. This is the consent calendar very voluminous tonight. So go ahead and do that and then we'll move forward, Ms. Frosto. 
Yes, and just to note, there were no public comments for L1 or L2. So we'll go ahead and open the queue for items M1 through M59. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to comment on consent calendar items M1 through M59, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for consent calendar items M1 through M59. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask my uh, colleagues, is there any item that you would like to be pulled from the uh, consent calendar to be discussed? Mrs. Allaby. Yes, I'd like items 28 and 40 to be pulled, please. Did you say 40, Ms. Allaby? Thank you. 28 and 40 will be pulled separately. Anyone else, any others? President Hunt, staff would like to pull item um, M9. M9. All right. Thank you, sir. So we're pulling M28 and M40 and M9. With that, do I have a motion to approve the, the rest of the uh, consent items other than those three? Dr. Farouk, thank you for that. Motion Second. And seconded by, by Mr. Lee. I will now take a, a roll call on those and I'll start with uh, our student board member is also a student, so he had to go home uh, to, to study. But I will start with uh, Mr. Kinnear. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Allaby. Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. Dr. Farouk? Yes. And the board president votes yes. Thank you. Those pass. Let's move now to uh, items uh, 28 and 40, which Mrs. Uh, Trustee Allaby has pulled. Mrs. Allaby. And oh, I'll just let me read for the public. I'm sorry, uh, Mrs. Allaby, one second. Let me read what those are. I apologize. Twenty-eight is Jefferson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Twenty-eight is the uh, notice of completion for the bid at Jefferson Elementary audition, uh, addition and alterations, and then forty, Mrs. Allaby. High Grove. High Grove. All right. Please proceed, Mrs. Allaby. Um, re remember at our last uh, meeting, I suggested when we were coming to the end of a project, uh, we should really should show the public what we have accomplished. And I hope going forward we should have before and after pictures. But I hope uh, if Mr. San Martin could please uh, just kind of briefly touch on these two projects because they are coming to a close. Thank you, Ms. Alvin. <clears throat> if I can have, uh, I have a couple of slides I want to share. If uh, I can have communications bring it up. Thank you. So these items, um, Item number M28 and M40, these are notice of completions. And we are happy and excited to report that projects like Jefferson Elementary, like you have here, uh, started in, in, in on May, 20, May 2019 when we bid the project. And this is a project that is in groups A. This project consists of modernization and new construction. Here on this slide here, you have an aerial and a before picture on the area that received the brand new two-story uh, building. Next slide. You can see there on this slide the, the brand new uh, building. And this, this uh, building consists of six classrooms. And this is a, a kindergarten wing, which includes uh, brand new play equipment, synthetic turf, uh, a whole new area. And this this gave us the ability to replace aging portables that were housing our students there at one point. Uh, this brand new building is now is a permanent building, which complies with the uh, Department of Education's size right sizing for kindergarten classrooms, which in, which includes also restrooms within the classrooms. You can see a, a photo here of the the restroom, the brand new classrooms, and areas that are dedicated for kindergarten students. The school also included modernization throughout the campus, which uh, consisted of uh, uh, new roofing, um, replacement of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems and infrastructure, data, fire alarm systems, uh, technology, and, uh, and parking uh, and access points throughout the, the campus. Next slide. This next school is High Grove, and High Grove dates back to 1888. The site was also, the school was um, rebuilt back in 1958 also. 
So we're excited again to show you just the, uh, an update on the completion of this project. This project also started back in May 2019, part of group, uh, Project Groups A. This is a before um, after picture of the area that uh, received a brand new 12 classroom building. Next slide. Here you can see the, the finish uh, buildings and the finished areas. You have on um, the top of the slide, the area that received a brand new drop off pickup area and parking and it shows also the brand new uh, two story building. Below that you see the interior of that area which is the kindergarten classroom wing and turf area and playground and equipment. The school also received uh, parking upgrades, as I mentioned, a modernization of existing buildings, which included new roofing, mechanical systems, electrical services of the not only the classroom wings, but the, the campus itself, plumbing, data, fire alarm systems, a new service yard, electrical upgrades, as I mentioned, and exterior painting of uh, the existing classrooms. This, this gives us the ability to, and will give us the ability in the future to replace aging portables that exist at at uh, currently at High Grove. And again, this two-story building uh, includes 12 classrooms, 12 brand new classrooms for the campus. And that concludes my, up my update. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I think we should all be really proud of these two projects. Th Thank you, Mrs. Alavi, for bringing that forward. It's very good of you, and I think it's important. So would you now move, Mrs. Alibi, I, I assume, to, to the passes of number 28, number 40, which is notice of completion at Jefferson and at High Grove. You want to do that apart Th from number nine? Okay. No, 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 number nine is separate. So just it would be the, the two that you have pulled. So well, it, then it, I move for approval of items 28 and 40. Thank you. Do I have a second to Trustee Alibi's motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I'll take a roll call now. Mrs. Alibi. Yes. Mr. Kinnear? Yes. Dr. Farouk? Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. And Hunt votes yes as well. Thank you. We'll now go to M9, which is the uh, audit uh, for the Building Fund of Measure O Financial Performance Audit for 2019-20. Dr. Hansen, you, you pulled this. Uh, please help us understand. Thank you, President. And thank you, members of the board. I'd like to actually invite uh, our Chief Business Officer, Pamela Zahn, to talk about this audit and then uh, correction that was made and was updated this morning. Thank you. We found after the audit report had been posted and sent to the board that there was one sentence that was included that talked about the bond um, oversight committee and that comment was not intended for our district. It was in inadvertently um, cut and paste and, and put into our report. And so the auditor did correct that and we have the corrected board agenda item supporting document to the board and also posted on the website. As far as conversation um, about the report, if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. Dr. Farouk has a question for you, Mrs. Uh, Zahn. I'll, I'll motion to approve. Oh, okay. Do we have any questions for other than, otherwise? Otherwise, thank you, Dr. Hanson and Mrs. Zahn for bringing that forward. Uh, I have a motion to uh, uh, approve item N9 board, as uh, one. corrected. Second. Board and President Hunt, I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have a public comment. Oh, I apologize uh, on that. Um, then, then I will retract that. And uh, thank you, Ms. Frosto. Would you please move forward with the public comment? They have three minutes. It is on item M9. Thank you. John Q. Public, you have three minutes. And you, are, you may go ahead and unmute if we could just wait for the timer for one moment. There we go. Thank you. Hi there, uh, John Q. Public, uh, beaming in here. It's great. You can uh, attend the, the meeting uh, live, and you can uh, and you can go home and from the comfort of your own home in your pajamas, you can make another public comment. I love this technology. This is fantastic. So, the um, the problem with this audit is it's it's supposed to be a financial and performance audit, but it's not. It's a financial audit, sure not sure a particularly good one, but I don't see much in here, if anything, maybe one sentence in a whole uh, lot of paper here that has anything to do with performance. And secondly, um, 
you know, basically, are you is the district spending uh, money according to how the voters requested it, and, and are they doing it under the state law, Prop 39, and the, the the California Education Code? And of course, it would be hard to make those statements or those without having independent legal counsel. My guess is there's no money in the budget for this auditor to hire their own independent legal counsel. So whose legal counsel do they rely on? My guess is it's the districts. <laughs> it's David Casnocha and company, which leads me to believe that once again, the district is dealing in providing the illusion of oversight. Okay. There's, there's not legitimate oversight going on here. And I don't even think this, this, uh, this, this audit may comply with the law with a, with a very strict letter of the law, but it certainly doesn't comply with the spirit of the law to get into, you know, telling, giving any assurances to the public that the money's being spent appropriately or, or as per um, measure, measure O said on the ballot um, with their own legal opinion attached to it versus the district's legal opinion. So I have a lot of problems with this, this, this audit, I think. Uh, I don't know who determines the scope. My guess is probably staff determines the scope for the audit of their activities, okay? <laughs> Which is a huge conflict of interest. And that's why we need independence on the Measure O oversight team uh, committee. We don't have that. We have kind of a friends and family thing going on over there right now and, and people who don't really even really want to do oversight um, we'll get into that another day, but, uh, I do think that that committee at some point in time has to uh, be more, more involved with the scope of the audit, how the audit is, you know, getting updates on it as it goes through time and performing something or getting something that is, is, this is mush. This is kind of, I read the whole thing. It's, it doesn't say anything. It's kind of garbage, quite frankly. It's, it, I don't, it's not worth the paper. It's written or barely worth the paper it's written on. I just, I don't think, what does it actually say? Has anybody actually read this thing? It doesn't say anything. So anyway, I just think it could be much better and we should uh, work on that with through our oversight committee. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Public. Uh, I think it's an important statement. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and read what this motion would be that Dr. Farouk has uh, made. Now to look for a second in a moment. The audit was conducted to comply with the legislative bills which have modified the requirements for citizen bond oversight committees for Proposition 39 bonds, which Measure O was. In particular, the audit was conducted in accordance with the generally accepted government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States, meaning that a qualified accounting firm must perform this function. The auditors concluded the results of their test indicated that in all significant respects, the district has properly accounted for the expenditures held in the building fund general obligation bonds election 2016, and that such expenditures were made for authorized bond projects. Mrs. Zahn, I assume that you, the short time you've been with us, you know, you've had time to review this audit report and find that correct to, this, to the uh, motion that is being offered. Yes, it is correct. Um, I believe though, in most cases, it's difficult for people to understand some of the um, methods that are used for the expenditures on this. And so overall, they're looking at the review to make sure that they're appropriate within the bond um, wording as far as what the money was supposed to spend on, and they have verified that that is correct. Thank you for that stipulation, too. That is an important question that's been asked there. And I know Mr. Public is, is very astute on these, so. I have a motion uh, from uh, Trustee Farouk to move forward item M9. Do I have a second? Second is there. Thank you, Ms. Alibi. I didn't, I think you got it. So Mrs. Alibi has made a second, so I have a motion to approve M9, and I will call for the vote. Dr. Farouk. Yes. Mrs. Alibi. Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. Mr. Kinnear? Yes. And Trustee Hunt also votes yes. Thank you. That, that moves forward. That completes our uh, consent item. Let me move forward to that. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hansen, for bringing that forward to us and making that correction. Um, which, which school district did that come from that they left that in? It was a different district? Okay. All right. Well, a lot of things going on these days. All right. So I've taken that. Um, just one moment. All right, now we're going to go into our, our action items. Ms. Ms. Frosto, would you like to uh, open the queue for these items? M N as in Nancy, one. Yes, thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for agenda item N1 for the annual financial report and audit for the year ending June 30th, 2020. 
If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on item N1 for the annual financial report and audit for the year ending June 30th, 2020, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item N1. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frosto. So we will be talking, N1, as I mentioned, is the annual financial report and audit. Indeed, as we've been talking about, June 30th, 2020, uh, Pamela Zahn, our interim business chief business officer, will uh, be making this presentation along with Aaron Power, director of business services. Ms. Power, welcome. Good evening, uh, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. Um, our 2019-20 audit report was conducted by Jeanette L. Garcia and Associates, and Mr. Garcia is joining and participating in the board meeting via Zoom. So if you do have any questions for her at the end, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, there was one audit finding that I'd like to discuss with you, and it is regarding attendance reporting. So per ed code, every high school student must have a minimum of 240 instructional minutes per day as an average over two days. And um, in 1920, as the audit was conducted, it was discovered that several students with less than six classes on their schedule did not receive the minimum during finals week. Um, so the auditor brought it to our attention and we were able to correct the attendance reports and submit them to the state in the corrected uh, fashion. And so there were no impacts to our funding at all. We were also able to um, improve our processes around bell schedule validation. And so we have ensured that in the future, all um, bell schedules will be validated for students with less than six classes. That's, that concludes my presentation on the audit report. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, there may be. Uh, I would like, uh, Ms. Hill, our chief academic officer, could you just explain that last part? Why would these young people have less than six during finals? Is that, is it, if I can have that slide back up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hunt. The students have less than six classes regularly during the year. Mm -hmm. um, so they might have already fulfilled their graduation requirements, taken extra classes, summer school classes. And the uh, concern is when those students who have fewer than six classes during finals week, when the schedules are shortened, they didn't have enough instructional minutes um, during the day. So it was only students who had less than six classes and only during finals week. All right, so this is more of an attendance concern, not an yes. academic loss right. or, okay. Right. Thank you. Do I have any questions for my fellow trustees uh, for Ms. Power? All right, well, hearing none, thank you, Ms. Power, for your, your work and your dedication and this presentation. So do I have a motion to approve in one? Oh, Mrs. Allaby, you had a question? So moved. Oh, so moved. Thank you, Mrs. Allaby. Do I have a second Board to President Trustee Allaby's Motion Board President, and I apologize, you, but we just need to acknowledge now, uh, public comment. You weren't quick enough for me there. Uh, so I'll now take the roll. Dr. Farouk? Yes. How do you vote? Mrs. Allaby? Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. Mr. Kinnear? Yes. And the Hunt votes yes as well. Thank you for that and appreciate your work, Dr. Hansen and, the, and Mrs. Zahn. And Ms. Power, we know you've been double duty in it lately, so I appreciate it. I think you have the next item up. Well, I should say I didn't take any public comment, did I? Did I have any? There was not public anyway. comment, Mr. Hunt. Thank you. I think I don't have Ms. Frosto either. Can you hear me? First, did I have any comments on N1 before I took that vote? I shouldn't have. Apparently. There were none. Okay. We're going to move on to N2. N Should we open Would, up the queue, Mr. Hunt? Sir? Should we open up the queue for N2? I believe she did, didn't she? Okay. Let's no, go ahead I and open the queue. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I appreciate that help very much. Thank awesome. you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can now. Thank you. 
We will open the queue to provide public comment for agenda item N2, approval of the 2020-2021 second interim report and adopt a positive certification. You may now enter the queue by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item N2, the second interim report and adoption of a positive certification. Thank you. Ms. Frosto, I, did I have anyone for M1 that I, N1 that I overlooked? Any speakers? No, you did not. Right. Sorry, I tried to um, call in but or speak, but the technology was not working. Sorry about that. Well, it's, it's that time of year. So uh, please go forward, Ms. Powers, on N2, which I, is the, uh, the second interim report, very important, and, and to have a adopt a positive certification is to request the night of staff. Please proceed. Okay, we do have a presentation for this. So the second interim report goes through the uh, January 31st time period. And as you mentioned, we do ask that you adopt a positive certification our rep on our report, which indicates that we can meet our financial obligations this year as well as the next two years. Next slide. In this report, we will um, look at where we're at at second interim as compared to first interim. And if you recall, first interim went through October 31st. So this is an update to our multi-year assumptions. Um, most notably, the change in the cost of living allowance um, is significant. In 21-22, it went from 0% to 3.84%. And then in the following year, it went from 0% to 1.28%. And that 1.28% is actually a conservative projection based on school services of California. Um, the Department of Finance actually put out a projection for that year of 2.98%, but we wanted to be conservative in our projections of revenue. Um, so we used the school services projection. Also notable, on this slide is the unduplicated pupil percentage for the single year. In the current year, at the first interim, we were at 69.6%, and we are now at 72.2%, which is a great increase in that. And that's mostly because we were allowed to um, do an alternative verification of income form. Um, but you'll see in the other years, we left it at 69.6 because we don't know if we'll have the opportunity to verify income and those alternative means in the future. Next slide. For questions. Uh, Ms. Powers, yeah, just as a quick question on, on that, because I do think that is really significant because it translates to, to quite a bit of dollars for the district um, with that increase in the unduplicated count. So I mean, are there opportunities, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Hansen, um, are there opportunities for us to work with um, capital advisors to encourage the, the state to allow us to continue those more creative efforts to get, I would argue, a more accurate count of our undupl unduplicated students? Is that something that's been discussed yet? We could certainly research that working with okay. Kevin Gordon capital advisors. Yeah. I do know that we've had a campaign this year that has brought that up. You see the overall number for the next several years is 69%. We think that that's more more realistic, but as far as looking for the continued waivers, like we're giving this year, that's something we can research just as well. So can you just give us an idea in dollars what that 3% or 2 point something percent increase means to the district? That increased our income by $2 million this year. I think it's important. It's a, I mean, it's a lot, quite a bit of um, income um, that we can use to support students, especially as we come back and try to mitigate some learning loss. So I, mean, I think it would be worth some efforts to work with our, our partners up in Sacramento to allow us to continue those those efforts to get a true count of our, our student population that meets the unduplicated requirements. Dr. Farouk, you had a question for Ms. Power. Yes, thank you, President. If we could go back one slide. I, I know that our district, as others, um, are going through declining enrollment due to a variety of factors, but. The drop between in the ADA between the 21-22 school year to 22-23, it, it seems to me a, an unusually high 
drop off, right, from 39,081 to 37,465. Can you provide more context on that? Yes, the, the funded ADA um, for the current year is based on last year, 1920. And it is also, wow, it is also based, <laughs> it's also based on 1920 for next year. Um, so when you look at the following year, 22, 23, that's when we will actually feel the decline because this year we're afforded the opportunity to use last year's ADA. And then that since last year's ADA is this year's ADA, it's also next year's ADA. Does that make sense? Thank you for explaining that. Thank you. A question from Trustee Kathy Allaby, please. Yes, I, I wanted to ask you about the big jump uh, in 2223 for Spears and Cruz. Is that on a schedule, and that's the natural next jump that makes it uh, pop up like that? That is, that is on a schedule. That is on a schedule. Is it every two years? No, it's projected every year that way. Oh, the reason why I ask is it's... Um, like for instance, next year for mm -hmm. SERS is not really going up much. Yeah, so this year in the governor's budget proposal, um, he is supplementing the SERS and PERS so that the rates could be reduced. Okay. But that yeah. expires, at least right now, for 22, 23, so then you'll see the rates jump way back up in that Got year. Got it, thank you very much. Director Power, please proceed. Okay, if we can bring the presentation back up. And then go to the next slide, please. Okay, so then um, in this presentation, we'll go over everything in total um, for unrestricted and restricted, and then we will go to unrestricted and then restricted. So in total- Would, would you mind, just for our audience, just, just if you would be, maybe for an old board member too, just to give a definition of restricted and unrestricted, please. Okay, so um, unrestricted is dollars that we receive from the state that we can use for purposes that we deem necessary. And restricted dollars are grants, categorical programs, um, thing, dollars that we have to use for specific purposes. And they both uh, make up the general fund. And so when we're looking at the total, that is the total general fund. Okay. Thank you, Director Power. Okay, so um, at the first interim, we had projected $571 million, and now we're at 573, and like I said before, that's as a result of the increase in the unduplicated percentage. Next slide, please. This is the unrestricted, uh, which again is the $2 million increase um, from in LCFF sources due to the unduplicated pupil percentage. Next slide. On the restricted side, which again is grants and categorical programs, um, the income stayed very much the same from first interim to second interim. There was a small decrease in our title uh, program categorical awards, and so that was reflected in the budget. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a chart to show you that most of our income comes from LCFF sources, 71%. Next slide. And then we get into our total expenditures. And you can see we, we at first interim, our total was going to be 581.7 million. And at second interim, we're estimating 580.4. I'll get into the differences on the next slide. On the unrestricted side, um, you can see the total is very close um, from first interim to second interim. The change was we added uh, some budget as a carryover adjustment. And then you'll see a decrease on the next slide on the restricted side of expenditures. Um, from 162.1 million to 160.8, that was because uh, we looked at the budget for lottery, which is for um, instructional materials. And 
decided that we needed to spend the funds, most of the funds next year instead of this year. So we took them out of the budget, one and a half million, and are, we we're gonna carry it over to spend next year. Sorry, take a sip of water real quick. Sorry about that. Can you go back one slide? I just wanted to also point out that um, you'll see a, a, an increase in salaries and benefits from first interim to second interim. I'm sorry, can we go back one slide, please? So if you see the, the increase in salaries from um, first interim to second interim, you see the same decrease in books and supplies. And that's because funds were transferred from the supplies category to salaries, mostly in the COVID relief dollars. Okay, next slide. And this is just a pie chart to show our total um, expenditures by category. Next slide. This is a recap of our COVID-19 relief dollars that we received this year. Um, we showed this at the first interim. This is as of January 31st, as I mentioned. Our allocation was 42.1 million and um, we spent or encumbered by January 31st, 36.3. Three, and we have projected to spend the rest of it, $5.7 million. Next slide. Do you have a question? Thank you, if I may have the mic. Thank you. Um, just back to this, we, we, have, we were given 42 or 41 million? 42 this year, but we received about one and a half or 1.9 last year. Okay. So overall it's 44. And what are we, I think, in my discussion with Dr. Hansen, just to make sure he was right, uh, we're scheduled though to, for another 30 million or so. Is that correct? Or yes, and I'll go over that. Okay, okay. And thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a slide to show you kind of what we've spent our dollars on in broad categories. So we have 17 million dollars in teachers, learning supports, and instructional materials. So we hired 50. Um, over 50 FTEs and staff members to support the program choices and for um, credit recovery. Um, we also provided the tutoring supports through paper and provided instructional supplies to our students at home. Um, in the safety and protective equipment category, we've spent five million and that's um, you know our masks, our PPE, our barriers, all of that kind of stuff. And then we've also spent $5 million to continue to provide meals to our students through nutrition services, $12 million on facilitating distance learning, which would be for such things as our devices and our hotspots, and then $3 million for health and wellness. Uh, we've hired six nurses, um, health supplies, trauma-informed uh, training for our educators. Next slide. And this just shows you a visual of some of the um, items we've purchased. Next slide, please. And here's where we talk about what's on the horizon. Um, it's been up in the air a, a lot, as you, I'm sure you know. But on the federal side, we have the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, which is sort of like CARES 2, so it's ESSER 2 and GEAR 2. For ESSER, our allocation is projected to be 32.6 million, and we did include that in the multi-year projection. Um, for GEAR 2, that is not included yet, but the state is receiving 341 million, um, of which 180-ish million has to be spent on non-public schools. And so about 150 million will be left for K-12. And then on the state side, we have the Safe Schools for All grants, which I think turned into the in-person instruction grants. And our allocation should be about 13 million for that. It's not listed up there because at the time of this report, um, I didn't know that. And also um, we, we didn't know the amount. 
and then the expanded learning time and academic intervention grant, it should be about 29 million. And we will also receive $1,000 per homeless um, student. So that will be almost a million dollars for us. But a lot of it wasn't included, like I said, because we didn't know what we would get. But we will include it in the budget um, that you will adopt in June. Next slide. So here we'll go over the um, fund balance. We started with 77.7 .7 million and we are projected to end with 70.6 million in those categories, which I'll go over. Next slide. So on the, in the non-spendable category, we have 291,000. And then in the restricted category, we have 16.4 million. You can see lottery there, 3.6. That's where we put the 1.5 that I talked about earlier. Next slide, please. In committed, we have um, 29.9 million, which is 23.9 in contingency reserves and 5.9 in our LCAP and textbook set aside. And then we have assigned 852,000 and unassigned 23.2, which is our reserve for economic uncertainties. Um, that is 4% per board policy. Uh, we're required by the state to have 2% for a district our size. Next slide, please. And this is a look at our other funds. Um, notable here, we have the building fund, Measure O, where we started with 185, and we're projecting that we'll end with 78 million. And then also the retiree benefit fund, Irrevocable Trust, um, that's where we have our other post-employment benefits for retirees. We put the funds in the trust. Um, they, we started with 23.5 million and we have 27 million now. Next slide. And here's where we get into our multi-year projections. Um, so we, this is in total. At the first interim, we were projecting to end with 67.5 million, and now we're projected to end with 70.6. And then by the end of 22-23, we project that we'll have $71 million in the fund balance. Next slide. On the unrestricted side, this is just showing you again how we went up $2 million, and then at the end of 22-23, we project that we'll have $66.4 million, which is a healthy reserve. Next slide. And then on the restricted side, uh, we're spending down those dollars on purpose, and we are projected to end 22-23 with 4.6 million. Next slide. And here's our cash flow. So these, this is actually our cash in big numbers <laughs> um, from July through December. So we started the year with 62.5 million and we ended December with 92.2. Next slide. And then we started experiencing the deferrals from the state and that's where we are now. So um, as we've discussed before, the state is deferring most of our revenue from February to June. All of February, or some of February, most of March, April, May, all of June will be deferred to next year. So that is the situation we would be in um, if we didn't take action by May, we would be in a negative cash situation. But we did take action. So if you can go to the next slide, please. You'll see that um, at the end of this month, we will uh, obtain the proceeds from the TRAN, which is a tax and revenue anticipation note that we entered into with the countywide uh, pool. And we will therefore be able to meet all of our financial obligations um, that are required. 
I believe that concludes my presentation. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I have some questions from the board, but I would like to see, do we have any uh, public comments, uh, Ms. Frosto? Thank you. Yes, we do. We uh, could go ahead and go to the timer. All right, let's go with those first members of the board. We want the public to have their input, and then we can at least craft your questions around that. Please, please Ms. Frost, the first caller. Thank you. Our first call, our caller is John Q. Public. You may go ahead and unmute, and you have three minutes. So I'm looking through this budget here, and um, there's a lot of money in the budget for uh, the new schools. There's a a lot of unrestricted money. I mean, there's 14 million alone, alone in developer fees and uh, CFDs and stuff like that. I, I'm sure there's a way to cobble together money to probably pay for Casablanca, maybe the East Side School. I don't know about the uh, Spring Mountain Ranch and, and uh, the STEM School, but um, to get those done without using Measure O monies, um, which as you know, we've said many times is a bait and switch and really that money needs to go to the existing schools um, like it was promised to this community. So the, the money is there. Um, and so it's just a way of making it work. Uh, I'm, I'm, now that I've seen that, I, I'm, I'm, it's very clear to me that money could be uh, switched around to make that happen. So uh, secondly, I look at the measure O expenditures and I see $110 million um, of expenditures going out when you don't have an independent citizens bond oversight committee. You have a dependent one. You have one that is absolutely coerced, manipulated, and controlled by staff uh, with the in, in implied, uh, enabled by the, by the board, quite frankly. It's cool. Uh, and they, the board knows the significant problems that are over there. They've done nothing to address it. But the, you know, the, the issue is it's $110 million. That's a lot of money, man. A lot of money being expended, expended. It's not really being looked over. Let me tell you, uh, looked at properly. I, the board, the, excuse me, the committee in its own bylaws, there's a rule in the bylaws of that oversight committee. It's just for the community to understand how illegitimate the entire oversight process is at our USD. They have a, a rule in the bylaws that um, they can only meet once a quarter. <laughs> so it can be four times a year, once every three months. Meanwhile, there's $110 million Mr. going Public, out the door. Uh, please stay with, with the financial report and not get off on MNO um, on the old committee. Please stay with the financial report as presented. I appreciate Sure, it. I'm talking about Measure O as mentioned on that on, on that report. $110 million, right? It's a lot of money. It's an expenditure. You know, we want to make sure it's being spent correctly, right? That's, That's correct. You know, so anyway. I just think uh, I, I won't talk any more about that, but the uh, um, I would like to know, could somebody just ask this question to the public? What is the unfunded pension liability of the district, both at PERS and, and CalSTRS? I'd like to know that. That I may, I'm sure it's been answered many times before, but I've never been on a, a presentation where it's been done. So if you could please uh, somebody ask that question, it is a significant part of the budget going forward. It, you know, that's the stuff where it may not be the two, three year, four, five year projection, but it does Eventually, that bill does need to be paid. So uh, the community should know what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Public. Um, and we'll go to the next caller. That concludes the comments for this item. All right. Ms. Power, can you answer that question now? But I, I know we've worked hard to make sure that it, that our pension fund is correct. Can, can you answer the gentleman's question? I believe it's a, around $40 million, but I would want to check and okay. make sure that that's correct. Maybe we'll have that for next meeting. We can do that and answer. I'm going to go to my board members. We had to, first of all, was Trustee Lee and followed by Trustee Allaby. Trustee Lee. Um, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Power, for that presentation. Um, question on that. I know we did take action and worked with other districts in the county to make sure we didn't run out of cash to pay our employees for the hard work that they're doing. Um, when were those bonds issued? And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it was before, and maybe it doesn't even affect. I know there was a lot of a volatility in the bond market the last couple of weeks, um, and if that caused any any difference in, in what we would discuss when we originally would sell the bonds. No, I no, I believe it was done this month because it's closing this month. Okay. And so. So prior to some of the volatility we've seen in the mm -hmm. market. Right. Yes. So no increased expenses or anything like that. Okay. No. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Powers. Trustee Allaby, please. Mr. Lee Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. I didn't realize. Oh, she didn't. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you before. Well, Mrs. Allaby, I apologize. Um, Dr. Farouk or Mr. Kinnear, before I ask a question, do you have a question? Dr. Farouk. No? Go ahead. Okay. The president's supposed to go last in the first round. So let me ask you on the, just as we line this up and we, even though that's not why this district did it, as the caller said earlier, talked about Governor Newsom is offering an incentive of $2 billion for schools to come back and open, reopen open, uh, before April 1. How would this money, uh, do you understand now, have you, uh, do we understand what this money would be targeted for in this opening? And the other question is, if they're deferring funds now, can we expect that money to be deferred as well? Um, what the money can be used for is the same purposes. Uh, well, the, the ESSER 2 and the GEAR 2 can be used for the same purposes that it was used for this year, which is mitigating learning loss, um, protecting the health and safety of our students and our staff, and, and those same sort of things. Um, the expanded learning time grants are more targeted for actually expanding learning time or providing interventions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. All right. With that, uh, Dr. Farouk, I have, you have a question or a... Yeah, just a quick question. Um, yes. Can these COVID funds or these governor funds, and I think you kind of alluded to it just now, but for extended learning, it, it, so not just about uh, learning loss mitigation now, but potentially summer learning, that, those kinds of efforts, that it can be included for, to help mitigating those costs as well? Yes. Okay. What I read today was um, about kind of rethinking the instructional model and really pushing the boundaries of what we can do with the time that we have using those dollars. Thank you. All right. Well, with uh, commending the staff and the history of this district for submitting a positive certification uh, pursuant to the education code, do I have a motion to approve, uh, Mr. Lee? Trustee is going to make a motion to approve. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Do I have a second to Trustee Lee's uh, motion to approve Thanks. this? Mrs. Allaby, thank you. All right, I'll, I'll take roll now for that. Uh, Mrs. Allaby, how do you vote? Yes. Yes, thank you. Mr. Kinnear. Yes. Dr. Farouk. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Mr. Hunt also votes to approve. That motion moves forward. Thank you. Ms. Frosto, I think we'd like to open the, uh, the uh, queue for item N3, ANSI 3. Thank you. We will open the queue to provide public comment for agenda item N3, consideration of candidates for the 2021 California School Boards Association CSBA Delegate Assembly Election for Subregion 18A. You may now enter the queue by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item N3. All right, well, uh, what I'll do, I'll just talk about this first. As you know, everyone uh, knows, we, as, as Ms. Frost has said, Riverside Unified is a longtime member of the California School Boards Association, CSBA. We are part of subregion 18A uh, and in, in several of our neighboring districts in that, all the way down to Temecula, out to the Coachella. Uh, each district uh, can appoint uh, different uh, other members, uh, their board members to serve as their representatives to CSBA. Uh, larger districts such as Riverside, Corona, Norco, uh, are allowed two representatives, smaller districts uh, have one. We have before us a, a list of names that uh, are, we're to vote for six, there are seven here. So while I'm pausing, Ms. Frosto, do you have uh, any public comment on these items, on this item? Thank, thank you, President Hunt. We do not have any uh, public comment for this item. All right, so I, I would ask the board, uh, Dr. Farouk and I are your representatives to CSBA at this time. Um, these are all just like you, all of you, the very dedicated people to give this extra time. I think you'll see that four of them are listed as uh, incumbents. And uh, I want to also mention that David Sanchez, Beaumont Unified, uh, since I have been your representative and thank you for the honor the last 13 years, David has been very involved and I would ask for your consideration of him as well. But I will go to my board now any questions they may have or comments on this particular item. 
President, uh, just to help you through this, we have a slide. If we could oh, have a slide you, of sir. all the names. Thank you. Please post it. Thank um, you, sir. By the team. Thank you. That's very kind. Next slide. All right, there we are. So, Mr. Garcia, we know is uh, a lot with Bob over there and uh, Rupa. Uh, Gary Reller, you'll recognize. He's our principal at Gage uh, Middle School. He's also, of course, lives in Roma Land. He's on their elementary school district and some others. Do I, uh, I would simply adv advise that you would consider um, that uh, it would be, I, I am glad to see as a longtime member of the Region 18 that Temecula Valley is also interested in getting back involved. It is baffling to me sometimes how Riverside has always been and other districts have always been involved and, we, and our neighboring district on the other side of town isn't, but I'm glad to see that Temecula has come back in. So with that, do I have uh, an interest for a motion on picking six names here or what would you like me to do? Mrs. Allaby. I would make the motion that we, Robert Garcia, Sandy Hinkson, Gerald Reller, David Sanchez, J.C. Smith, and Tom Ms. Allaby, I, I, my ears weren't quite as good, so I'm gonna go back and make sure I said you. Your, your motion would be to approve in advance Robert Garcia. Robert Garcia, Sandy Hinkson, Ger Gerald Reller, David Sanchez, Jason Smith, and Chris Tomasian, I think. Um, I'm basing that on basically just reading their bios and getting a sense of them. I, if someone else has another thought, no. I'm willing to entertain. So on, on your motion, uh, so I have this right, uh, the myriad of Valley Unified School District would, would not be included. Did I get that right? No, it would. It was Palm oh, the Palm Springs. Okay, I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, I have a motion. Do I have a second to that motion? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll second and defer to my colleague. Okay, we have a second. Uh, any comments to, to this uh, motion and, and the slate? All right, hearing Board none. Board President. Then. Oh, we do have a public comment for oh, this I, item. Oh, you do have public comment. All right. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead. Public. I apologize. No. Just one so moment. Okay. The caller is P John Q. Public. You may now go ahead and unmute, and you will have three minutes. Hi there. Good evening again. John Q. Public here. The uh, I wanted to give a big pat on the back, uh, a rousing, I would give him a rousing ovation, quite frankly, to board president Tom Hunt, uh, because uh, I believe it was this organization um, where Mr. Hunt stuck his neck out, neck out and did something that probably wasn't easy to do and uh, uh, found fraud within this organization by a uh, uh, school board member over in Corona Norco, uh, William Newberry. I don't know how that turned out. I know he was charged with two counts of grand theft and one count each of embezzlement of public funds and misappropriation of funds by the uh, DA. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, because this is this is the organization, yep. you know, good on you, Mr. Hunt. You did a good no, th thing th for the public you, and we Mr. appreciate Pollock, it. That's that was actually, and I'm going to stick to my rule about the agenda. That was actually Riverside County School Boards Association, and that is for guessing. But this is for the California School Boards Association, and they want to be sure. Oh, I'm sorry. That we don't mix those two together. No, that's all right. And I thank you for calling in and, and of your interest. But do you have any more comment, though, on the California School Board? No, that would be it. Sorry about that. No. Sorry for the mix up. There's so many of these things, sometimes you get confused. I know how all you right. feel, Mr. Take public. Care. Thank you, sir. So, uh, with any, any more public comment, uh, Ms. Frosto? No, there's not. Okay, then I'm going to move forward with the uh, uh, motion by Trustee Allaby, seconded by Dr. Farouk, to approve the slate that would, I'll put it this way, the only one that would be uh, is uh, Madonna Garrell of Palm Springs Unified School District. So, is that correct, Mrs. Allaby? Do I have it right? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. So, Trustee Allaby? Yes. Yes. Trustee Kinnear? Yes. Trustee Farouk? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And Trustee Hunt votes uh, yes as well. Thank you. That will move forward. Dr. Hansen, you'll advance that to uh, Wendy Jonathan and the CSBA. All right. Well, that concludes our meeting tonight. I'm going to ask first, though, for um, agenda items for future meetings, if you have any. Um, and if you 
If you don't have them tonight, follow the uh, example of our, our, our colleague, Trustee Kinnear, who uh, pays attention to the bylaws and sent a request to Dr. Hansen, which he shares with the president at the meetings, and we have some items to be agenda, agendized. Uh, I do want, for the folks I had to cut off, uh, the, the, the parent that was going to ask about the math, uh, and I apologize for that, but we want to keep with the rules. So uh, please do send, you can send me an email at, at uh, I'm on the website, or Dr. Hansen, and we will get back to you on, on that, your math and other questions. We do appreciate it. The next meeting of, of the Board of Education is scheduled for Thursday, March 18th. It'll be a workshop as well as a board meeting. The meeting will be called to order at 4 p.m. We will meet here and then we'll go into closed session and reconvene at 5.30. Tonight, the board will close in recognition, and it's only one small part, but just want to thank everyone that's been working so hard to bring all this together, to bring next Tuesday together, a beginning to the, uh, to a return, a beginning perhaps to the end of what's going to be going on in our lives. So we want to honor and recognize RUSD's 375 employees at Nutritional Services. We closed the schools, we voted to close them on the 13th of March, it was a Friday, on the 16th, they were ready, along with many of our classified staff to deliver meals at, at all the, the sites. They've done that year round. To date, Dr. Hansen, I believe that they have prepared and distributed 5.8 million meals. So who said restaurants are closed in California? But uh, we, on behalf of the entire board and this district, we so much appreciate and commend those fine people at Nutritional Services. Uh, you know, we were talking about Mr. Chavez earlier today and, and this meeting. Uh, food workers uh, from the field to the supermarket that bring things so we can put them on our table have been very heavily affected by the COVID and, and infections and deaths and all sorts of things. So these people have worked very hard and uh, been very collaborative. I thank uh, Mays Kakish and Dr. Hansen's leadership there. And Dr. Hansen, I just lost the name of the, young, the, the lady that, uh, is that a C? The director, Adelaide. Yes. yes. We'll say her name fully so we can commend her. And we want to commend her and the entire staff and thank you all for that. We are adjourned. And I lost the bet with Mr. Lee and end at 920. So. It was 20 bucks a minute, right? 20 bucks a minute. That's right. <laughs>